if every single member of every single team in Swiss broadcasted and streamed their games, I don't think they revives Overwatch esports. I think the casual viewer Andy is like Vince, the viewer Andy is not watching. Like he doesn't know. You, you know, what I think the biggest win so far in OWCS is is the streaming teams like Overwatch and now Schmungus. The fact that Schmungus made top sixteen is unbelievably huge for OWCS. Like this is one of the biggest Ws we've had in a while because that's actually going to bring some real eyeballs. I don't know how many people, but like ML7s are one of the large, he's like top three, top five Overwatch streamers like current, currently, right? So like these guys have sizable audience. If Emol made it, this would be the same story. You speculated that the reason that um, Osh got cut out of OWCS was a budgetary reason due to flights. And the more I've investigated this topic, the more I think you're hundred percent dead on. Like based I on mean, everything I know, that's actually the real reason Osh got cut out. If so you is, have to we, pay your flights difference to attend the Asia land that you're eligible to compete in, then if it has to be budgetary, right? Like they must be so. Because here's, here's, yeah. here's, here's the thing. I I also found it behind the scenes. You guys want to start the leaks? Here we go. I also found it behind the scenes that. I think we last week in the Gumba episode, we said that, okay, we actually fundamentally agree with what you're saying, but we felt like the forecasters or the broadcaster, or whatever, we felt like they, the best people didn't get the jobs. That's what we felt. But I suspect that if I asked you that question, it's going to be a fast no comment. So maybe let's ask this. Fast like, what comment? No comment. I can answer. I don't know. I can answer that question for you. Go on then. Go on. Is, did the best talent get picked? Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode Yucky. 19 of... Uh... Sorry, I just wanted to. I wanted to set the record straight. Masters <laughs> under Yaki, Masters under Yaki, ever and uncoachables. I just wanted. I just wanted to take the title right off rip. All good. Right. Well, this is this is why we were originally against having members of the establishment on the podcast for this level of uh, interference and I don't know what the word is. I was going to say, a bad what establishment are we? I'm not even part of. I've been Confury. fired, so I'm like really confused about that. Comment, Wait, but. yeah, I was, I was thinking this the other day. Like, actually, Avril is like in the middle of the establishment. You know, <laughs> I feel like you're still not like with us in the working class yet. But I think that, like, when I go on your stream, you are starting to like give some anti-establishment positions, which is why we invited you on top. But the platform. real, the real strat is to play both sides because you benefit from both. So you know. Yeah, That's I think you're like a get. you're like a Robert Kennedy in a lot of ways. You know, it's like you have deep establishment roots. You've clearly been a member of the establishment at some point, but at the same time, you're like a conspiracy theorist, far right nut job. At the end of the day, just I do like, like UFOs. Kennedy. I do enjoy UFO conspiracy. So you know, that that's going for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm vexed. I was going to say oh. unfortunately, but I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to rub off the wrong people. No, no, I, I'm vexed. Vexed and happy. Vexed and happy. Vexed and happy. happy. There you go. Like, yeah. RFK, this is the maybe. best thirty second intro to our yeah. show. Ever. That's the title. That's the title. Uncoachables episode. What are you on? Twenty. Uncoachables for twelve. Yeah. Avril, vexed and happy. Thumbs up. Yeah. That's the title right there. That's the title right there. The vaccine on uncoachables. <laughs> Is I've, I've never gone. refused. I've never. Just in case someone was, I'm like, I've never refused a vaccine. So we're all good. We're, we're thumbs up right here. Yeah. Look at him. See, You're... that's his established <laughs> roots. He like shits himself at the thought of it. Just, just, just so you know, I did take it. I just did. Well, you, well, you, what you don't understand, Max, Max knows this, but we, there's, a, there's a secret U.S. military spy base in the middle of Australia called Pine Gap. I've been researching this on my streams lately, so they listen to everything. They're listening to this conversation right now. So you know, you got to, you got to. Gotta say yes to the big man. You know what I'm saying? Yes. yes. Well, of course they're listening. I've, everyone's a quiz head, so I would be really surprised if they aren't listening. I think as well, normally it takes us, what, like probably like an hour or two before we start getting political or something, or Chris needs to bring up Russia or something like that. So this is actually, <laughs> we've speedrun Yaki, we've speedrun political. I guess maybe, Did you, should um, we just go on? I was going to ask Chris whether he had any comment on the um, the aid convoy in Gaza getting blown up by Israel, just, you know, given we're not a political podcast. <laughs> I actually did not see that. Let's move on from it then. We don't even need the uninformed, uninformed opinion. Yeah. Well, I can figure out an opinion on the side. <laughs> I don't need any facts. We should, we should let X finish the reaction. intro. I, I cut off his intro and I feel like an intro never got done, so... This is bad the intro. Now. Really bad. This Let's is get good. back on track. Let's get back on track here. All right. Awesome. We can go we can go straight into the first topic. So we want to talk about the Swiss stage. As <laughs> any of any of our visual viewers will have seen, Chris is actually quite Swiss pilled. He's got a Swiss bedsheet, a Swiss yeah. pillow, a Swiss cup. And Chris is probably even more Swiss pilled than usual 
Because he's team one Swiss. Top seed coming in. Were you expecting it, Chris? You know, I was starting to think we should just do away with group stages, with the playoffs, and just have the Swiss and just call it a fucking day, you know? Um, that would be the like the super ODCS format. I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, obviously we, I, I'm not going to fucking sit here and say that we're the best team in the world because we won Swiss stage because there is like an element of Mickey Mouse to it. Um, but I think, yeah, we, last stage was a little bit of a wake up call for us in terms of like the difference between our officials and scrims. So I think we fixed like our comp structure a little bit, like the way that we wanted to call, like the heroes we were playing, just like kind of our mindset. Uh, and I think it, I think we're playing, you know, our official level was much higher this weekend than it had been in, in the last month. So that was a step towards getting. And the most important thing, let's not forget, is not only are we back in the big three, there is a new member of the big four. EXO out. Team Abheek has made it into the big four. So congratulations to Team Abheek for making it into the big four. Yeah, don't believe this guy's lies, by the way. He wants to present himself as this working class member, you know, like look at the Swiss stage and how wonderful it is. It's a little bit Mickey Mouse, he says. These are the lowest stakes games in the universe, essentially pre-tournament and his team won first to twos. I'm a London lover. You know, I'm I'm so London-pilled, it, it hurts, you know? But this guy touting his 11-0 Swiss stage like it means anything, that's the biggest load of bullshit we've all ever heard in our entire lives. Because, like, it's pre-tournament first to two matches with next to zero stakes. So, you know, when UV said in match chat they weren't trying, he meant it. No, no I think I understand what you're saying, but I also think you're right. I think teams try in this, obviously. I also think in Europe, first seed is especially valuable because... No offense to Team Abheek, of course, but in the big three, if you, if, if you get yourself first seed, you can like the what happened to us last time was we had to go through ends to get to TM, so you had that like more difficult bracket, and then obviously you had to play EXO and lose if you were like us. Um, but if you get the first seed, you can kind of let like, ENTS and TM like dogfight it out, and then we meet them in like the, the winners' final. Is this just because two corner. plays three? Yes, exactly. So actually, okay, like in right. Europe, because there's a big three, first seed is actually kind of like low key, high key. Yeah. But in North America, because there's only one team at the top, it doesn't matter. Is that, is that what you're well, saying? Well, I'm glad you said that because I strongly disagree with the sentiment that you're putting out right now. I think it's very <laughs> clear to me that the two strongest teams in Overwatch right now are Toronto and Timeless with <laughs> the single greatest coach in the world, Timeless. Up. No, they not just stand on payload. They play every hero. They, they change rosters. I've never seen Overwatch play. The way that Timeless coached their team to be full held on Parisio against Toronto, I've never seen anything like that. The way they were dying down, they were going to, this is the mind of a coach who just gets it. He just understands Overwatch. And Dan says, I've got my coach of the air award. I burned it last night because I realized it was fucking Mickey Mouse because pathology, he deserved it all along. This guy, in my opinion, is the five-time coach back to back to back to back. After watching this dominant performance through Swiss stage, beating, just about beating fucking Unter in his group of players and beating these Koreans on 4,000 ping with some of the most non-stand on Carti. I was just wrong. I was wrong Chris, about everything I've said about Tamis. I watched that performance that fucking bad. Chris, if you, if you, do you reckon if you ask Capitology uh, why they run Sim, would he tell you because Sim lets you TP? Do you think that would be a, a, a viable answer? I, I think he probably the thing is if 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 I spoke to Captology about Sim, it would it wouldn't work. Like I couldn't understand what he was like going for. Like, his plane of existence, his IQ for the game, I, I like I'm an uninformed guy from a different region. You're like the pro Captology, I mean, he likes to tell us we're uninformed, but he doesn't actually tell us anything we're uninformed about. He just kind of like subtly drops at that uninformed. You know, he doesn't like disprove any of it. But I think it's not because he is chatting shit or because he has an ego. In my opinion, it's because he knows I wouldn't get it. Like, I wouldn't understand the way. Me and Gumba, we would have no fucking clue at how timeless players overwatch because it's just just a step of the head, a step ahead. So I've recorded all of their POVs. I'm showing it to the team tonight. We are copying their comps, scroll their comp structure, everything. But go to the main tweet, scroll down to Rocket's reply real quick. I just thought it was a bit funny. The main the main tweet, yeah. Where's Rocket's reply? The aura one. The corny but the aura. Aura. <laughs> <laughs> we, might be, we might be on the wrong tweet. Yeah, it's, it's, on, the, it's on the most recent tweet. Oh, we're, we're on our tweet. On the actual, uh, yeah. No, no just on Capitology's, just, uh, Capitology's uh, tweet. Commander X. Fire the producer. <laughs> <laughs> there he is running. 
And it's, no, uh, not this one. This one's no. good. That's it. <laughs> you know what? Like, it was, it's, I it's, promise you were all lucky. We are, we are lucky. I felt it's lucky. I don't know it's how this you one. It's this one. This whole time, I actually thought Commander X was the producer. I, I only realized it was a different producer, like today. Easy, I pull, pull <laughs> the curtain back. Yeah. Then he got aura. <laughs> There we go. I'm back. <laughs> we can edit that out in post. You know, we can jump to the part where we showed the tweet that was, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it really gives me. Have you guys ever seen like uh, in Counter Strike? Sometimes Brazilian fans will have their players criticized or something and have a go back or have their fans criticized. And they'll always say things like, Oh, you're not from Brazil. You won't understand. Every time, like, do you not think it's a bit unreasonable? Some of the Brazilian fans spat on some of the opposition players. No, you wouldn't understand. Brazilian fans are passionate. You just get it, man. You're not from Brazil, so you wouldn't understand. And that's what I'm starting to feel with Timeless. Like, if you're not from Timeless, if you've not been in Timeless, you just wouldn't understand. And I think, unfortunately, I just don't understand. So, no comment. I very much hope that that tweet is a joke, you know? Like, I, I don't know capitology, so it's really hard to tell. But I do really hope that that tweet is a joke because I feel like any coach that believes that, like, maybe this is just an indictment on me, right? Like, maybe I just, like, am so low in belief in myself and my own capacity to insight change that, like, I'm just I'm just underselling the role of coaches overall. But I do feel like any one coach that feels like they could have just been tossed in the Overwatch League and turned it all around, you know? Like, you just give this guy a roster and holy fuck, everyone is quaking in their boots. Like, I feel like it must be a joke, right? And I feel like it's an, it's an insult to your own players when you say stuff like this, which is why I really do hope that it's a joke. Because it's like, if I were to fucking tweet, like when Atlanta came second, you know, if I were to tweet with a straight face about like how that was me, you know, it's like, I fucking did that. It's like, I wasn't even in the server. I was spectating the game. All coaches are just spectating <laughs> the game, you know? It's like, I'm not trying to say the coaches don't work hard and don't have an impact on the outcome of games, but it's like, you're not even fucking playing the game. So like, seriously, if you think that your impact was that great, that you could have like completely turned it around and had Overwatch League rosters pissing their pants at your presence, your, your coaching presence in the server. It's like, I think that I was one of the higher impact coaches in the league, relatively speaking, because team, team, like I made my teams really fucking toxic and rude. And it was really good for like getting in people's heads and shit like that. But if Capitology, the strategic genius is the one fucking turning it around the timeless T. I feel like it's it's just disrespectful to your play. Can we get a tea, Kev? Just just a quick tea for the yeah, thumbnail. Sure, mate. Do I have to do I have to do it like this or do it all together? Do it all together. Ah, Where, where's your one? Ah, ah, no, the producer can chop it up one by one. <laughs> okay, now it's gonna look weird. Yeah. Did, you, did you lose the max? Did you lose the timeless? Of course, we we, we always. Oh, we get get wrecked, idiot! Yeah, no, again. I mean that's the thing. Capitology is perma gapping me because we're all we're yeah. always losing the timeless. You know, I think we've already lost the timeless three times. Like we're 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 making tracks. Losing to them is just timeless for you, yeah. mate. I do think it is. Um, it's genuinely. So you're saying like, you're saying your your contribute your contribution to your teams. You just make them toxic. That's what you do as a coach. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think my, my contributions are, are numerous. Um, but you know, that's definitely a contributing factor. The uh, <laughs> the, the making people toxic. But I, that hasn't happened so much on Luminosity. You know, we've just got such a nice little group of individuals that it's like it's really hard to make them toxic. You know, like I can't imagine Squid saying something mean about anyone. It's like it's a real weakness of his. I might argue. Unless anyone talks over the old track or something, then maybe it might get a little bit heated. Uh, but that's not Squid getting heated, you know? Like that's uh, that's Landon's territory. <laughs> He's in the background. <laughs> we interrupt this podcast to bring you an important message. You might be looking at your screen thinking, these are the three wealthiest people I've ever seen. But that would actually be completely untrue. In fact, we're in need of financial support. If you enjoy the podcast, you want to support us, you can do it at Patreon. And you get a lot of good perks on Patreon. You now actually get the episode a day early. So if you're interested in being ahead of the news, getting all our takes for everyone else, or even interested in cancelling us, if you want to cancel us, if you want to take us down, the important thing when cancelling someone is you've got to be the first person to cancel. No one cares about the second person to blow the whistle. You need to be the first person to blow the whistle. So if you want to cancel us, subscribe to the Patreon, get that early access, get yourself on Reddit, get that headline, get the glory, get us cancelled. One of the other big perks you get as well is you get access to the Q&A. I think we've all had some pretty good questions so far. But I thought I'd open up to you guys and see if you could ask one question to the other hosts, what would it be? I'd probably ask you, X, for a skincare routine. Like the shine on the top of your head there, <laughs> mate. Like, like there must be some secret technology that you're using on it. It's actually just good genetics. Ah. Some people just get it all. Yeah. <laughs> Minus the hair, I suppose. 
And yeah, I, I don't know. I probably wouldn't ask much for either of you. Don't don't really care for your personal lives, to be honest. You know, it's more of like a one thing for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just my day job. Yeah. All right, man. <laughs> Support us on the Patreon, guys. Thank you. Is there, do we have any hypotheses then to what we're missing? Because capitology won't inform us. I, I, I think it's, I understand what he's saying. Because I think I remember chopper. in London when we would win, when we would like win games and all we would, like the establishment would just talk about how shit the other team played. And it was like, for a while we felt like we had like a chip on our shoulder that like the talking heads of the Overwatch wouldn't give us the credit. And I suspect that like, that's, probably where it comes from you know like actually because to be fair like tennis has done pretty well like they're obviously out competing m80 who have like an actual budget and korean super players and obviously they're on ping and there's like a few things tennis are doing well but tennis roster is also pretty good like i think their dps trio was really fucking good right like and i don't think that was necessarily like a surprise i think most people in power rankings had timeless probably third going into the tournament and they're overperforming because they're finishing second but the question obviously will be once m80 fly those like Korean players over then if Timeless stay there. But I don't think like this is like a indictment on Timeless. Like maybe they feel like their level is like as high as like the European teams. But I don't know. My feeling respectfully is that Toronto continue to shit on them. And whenever we see Toronto versus the European teams, at least in scrims, is it looks like Toronto would have like a hard time like guaranteed winning Europe. I think that they are the same level as like the the big three in Europe. I mean, this is the thing where it's like we I see Capitology doing the, you know, oh, you weren't watching, you're not paying attention thing. But it's like I genuinely feel like when I watch North American scrims and then I watch European scrims, like just watching the X Coast streams, like the level of play genuinely just looks higher from the top down in these scrims, you know? Like you you watch a Toronto scrim and you think, shit, like Toronto V top of EU, like this is this is a really high level scrim, you know? People are doing like really high level stuff all the time. It's fast. People are using the whole map perma. Like it's really insanely like high level overwatch but then when you watch like the the more cummy tiers of na not not saying that timeless is come low you know they're, they're top two na right now but overall I, I do feel like you know the, the level is like visibly lower and you know to to say that it's not and to say that the people passing this judgment are just fucking clueless is like you know come on be, be so serious right now i don't think anyone thinks timeless is bad you know like the results speak for themselves like they're actually like at the top of na but I think most of the argument that is made here is that, you know, even if they are at the top of NA, NA doesn't look that good. Like Toronto doesn't look like it's better than top three EU. And that really says something. But she also mentioned like, you know, pe people won't give you the credit for winning. And then you got Max on this podcast right now. It's just like, ah, Switch doesn't matter, by the way. Yeah, Twisted Minds, UB, they didn't try. So, you know, just first place, get wrecked, idiot. It doesn't really count. And also, it's funny, the way you won, oh, the community's going to love this because the community's going to feel so justified. They're watching your games. The Switch like, hey, there it goes. London's playing Ryan, guys. Now they're suddenly winning. We're the smart ones here. See, all London need to do was start playing Ryan. If they come first to the Swiss, why is Christopher such an idiot? Why does he keep trying to make Hardy play, play Winston and shit? See, the community's going to love it now. So all you have to do is play Ryan, Chris. Did you know that? Fucking, you triggered me. Because we only fucking played Ryan for half of one map. You know that, right? We fucking... <laughs> also, fundamentally, Max is right. I, this win in the Swiss stage doesn't mean shit. Like, I'm not fucking out here, like, capitology sucking my own dick because we fucking finished, like, top one. <laughs> like, we played against a Get rid of the pillows. Get rid of the pillows. <laughs> <laughs> we fucking Thanks, played against fine. a TM who had roster changes the day before and we had like we fucking beat like a best of two against ends like i think i think we played better in the swiss stage than we played the, the previous tournament i think that looks fucking clear i'm more confident in our team now than i was this time last month but i don't cheese ends with ryan you, you didn't deserve to win we agree yeah yeah you played ryan for like the entire <laughs> series and that's how london's come out on top <laughs> just difficult <laughs> 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 I, I think answer to one if you played yeah. honestly answer to one so that's all that matters the other thing about this swiss stage is that like the stakes are genuinely so much lower you know you can be like oh we played um we played better in this swiss stage than we did in the playoffs the match that we lost and it's like yeah that's that's actually expected you know if people are accusing your team of choking they're probably not going to choke in swiss when it doesn't matter they're going to yeah. choke in playoffs <laughs> in the elimination bracket when it does right so I think that, you know, it really is difficult to read into the results of a Swiss round because it's like when the pressure is really on, that's when you see which team is truly the best. And it's not Swiss stage. Like there's shorter matches, no fucking pressure, limited prep time right after roster changes. There's like a million reasons why Swiss is Mickey Mouse Kappa, you know? It might be fun for, a, you know, some of the viewers to watch these games, get little previews of the main event. 
But from a competitive standpoint, it really doesn't matter all that much at all. Right. So would I, you I, rather play Swiss or just get an auto seed in the top eight? Swiss for sure. I, I actually think- You'd still rather play the Swiss. Fuck you. I think Fuck eight- you. In, Okay, <laughs> the games don't matter as much. Everything I said is like relatively true, like relatively true, you know? Relatively um, true. Yeah, but yeah. like <laughs> still getting relative. like match time against the other teams. Like we like we can't at least pretend like uh, TM didn't try, but they fucking tried, you know? Like they were fucking coming, like they were trying to win. Like teams are like map drafting, like teams are figuring out like swaps. Like teams were trying to win, obviously. It doesn't matter. There wasn't as much pressure on everything you're saying is true, but it's still good to get like experience playing against these teams. Like it's still fun. And the weekend itself, I think, is enjoyable. I really, like I, like I said last time, you know, I really enjoy watching all of the streams from different people's POVs, seeing like who's got like good matches, like like potential upsets, like seeing where everything goes, like maybe a little bit of shit talk. So I think the Swiss is, is, is fine. I think it's, it's, it's really, really fine for one weekend of like the month long calendar. I think, you know, you say it's fine, like for one week of the month long calendar, but just overall, it's like, yeah, it just eats up a lot of time for not a whole lot of anything valuable, you know? It's like we just played through the Swiss bracket as um you could boot up Capitology's Twitter actually I think he, he encapsulated it very well but you know we just played through a bunch of Swiss games like uh, as you know Luminosity slash Maryville we went nine and two we lost one two to the top two teams you know we had one two losses to both uh, Timeless and to Toronto Defiant and we seeded seventh like. How does that work, you know? And I mean, obviously, the, yeah. the way that it works is because our strength of opponent oh, earlier in the bracket, we versed a bunch of really cummy teams, you know? But at the end of the day, the only teams we actually lost to were the top two. So one would assume that we're going to rank rather highly, you know? We had two close losses, but at the end of the day, we've got a bunch of people. Like, I think one of the teams, I think the third seeded team is actual fucking randoms, like complete cancer randoms and then you know fuck my chunga's life seated higher than us and fuck my chunga's life definitely didn't have matches that were that difficult oh, it looks like we're in eu right now but yeah Who, who's on vice Who, who's on vice we shit on we pink, got, you know we got like, sloth hinged scare never mind yeah yeah so it would it would hurt the seeding is a bit weird, right? Because you had the same thing as us, Max, because we played EXO in round three. And my understanding of like the second Swiss stage, maybe I just don't understand, maybe similar to EXO, I don't read the rules as much as I should. But my understanding was that because we had like, both teams had a high seed from the previous tournament that they would like take a while before you got the games. But I guess it just must be like full random who you play, right? Like, is there any actual like seeding in the way that it, like, do you just play against someone with the same record? It doesn't, there is no seeding. They said like, that there was seeding. They, they because, said that there was seeding in this. But how long, because there's seeding for the first game, right? Which presumably would avoid like any sort of SSG running into Ents in game one. But does it, what happens to the seeding after round one? Is it still seeded? Yeah, but presumably by like round three, the fact that like the third and the fourth, like two of the big four played each other in round three, presumably that like there were still enough teams to avoid that happening if it was fully seeded. But then I guess if it was fully seeded, you would kind of know who your opponent was each time. And then I think it's I, I only, there must be an element of RNG, right? Like a big I think it's element. only for the first round. And then after the first round, it starts to take over that like Bush old score system or Bush whatever. Because no yeah. then the seeding doesn't make any difference, really, does it? It, it saves you from one mm -hmm. round of 11 potential rounds. Yeah. yeah. So the fact, because I think one thing I found streaming it as well, I didn't, I only streamed the Sunday. By the time the Sunday came around, I'd missed all the good games in EU. Like they'd all happened Saturday on Saturday. Was like the re like, Saturday yeah. was a good day. And yeah. I will say in, in absolute hatred of the Swiss system and the way that they're operating it right now, there's like real continuity between tournaments happening right now, where if you play in the first tournament, you're massively incentivized to stay as a roster and play through the remainder of the tournament, you know, because you need high levels of circuit points to add up to inevitably qualify for the events later in the year. So they really want people to stay as the same roster. If they're going to have a system like that where you should stay as the same roster so you can all keep your points and qualify through, there should be continuity between tournaments to keep you seeding and to keep people qualified. So I think if people were top eight in the first tournament, they shouldn't have to play through Swiss again in the second one. And the, the big problem here is that the top eight is always going to qualify through Swiss, almost no matter what, you know, because they're good enough that they're just going to win those games. But where it gets a little bit more murky is like nine through 16. Because those are the teams where really it depends on whether they procced one of those top eight teams or not, one of those really unbeatable teams, relatively speaking. So the people that are in nine through 16, they're the ones that are actually thinking like, oh, so many different people could have been in that nine to 16 band and gotten through to groups, but they don't get to because of the RNG of Swiss. If you eliminated the top eight teams from that and auto qualified them through, 
and then made them play nine or 11 rounds of Swiss without top eight included, you would actually get a better representation of who belongs in nine through 16 for the group stage. But instead we get an inequitable system where you qualify through groups based on luck if you're not in like the absolute top band. You hear that, Chris? Inequitable. I mean, this is a typical talking point from someone in the elite. What they'll do is they'll turn the working class <laughs> against each other. But the reality is what Max is saying is because I'm part of the elite, I don't have to, I don't have to get my hands dirty with you working class scum. Whereas what the Swiss system is about is every year, fucking month, you get back in there and you prove it. Your position in the hierarchy doesn't matter, you know? And I think fundamentally what you're saying is like, it's reasonable because I think you're right, especially about like the, if you take the top A out, you'll probably get like a fairer thing, but also like it's super fucking boring if no one's in it, you know? I, I mean, I still maintain, I don't know if I'm as, like last time I was like, this is like the best Overwatch, this is more fun than any Overwatch <laughs> yeah. League broadcast. I might be, I might have slightly lessened my stance there. <laughs> it's like better I do some. actually really enjoy, I really enjoyed watching all the streams and when, when there was like a dogfight, especially because like one thing I will say is teams who stream it, I know it's hard, Please stream at least your officials with comms. It makes us so much fucking better. It's like it's actually like so enjoyable watching like teams. And then if you have to do what like Sauna did, where he mutes the mic after they lost because he's about to fucking rip into his Lucio or whoever it is, you know, <laughs> then that's fine. But actually, like I think generally speaking, like with comms was good. But I quite enjoyed going through all of the games and seeing oh shit, like oh Peps have taken a map off Ents. Let's watch this. Whatever. I still maintain from like from me as a, like a, an example of the, the the working class of like the the common people. This is. Far more enjoyable than the group mm. stages. Like I if will you say, say to me, Swiss playoffs and then cut the group stages into one. Give me two plus. I think it's actually a really fine form uh, format. I will say, here's another tell that you're a member of the elite who's so out of touch that he thinks he's working class. You know, you're talking about how you you loved watching these games, jumping between, seeing what Peps is doing. What the, nobody cares about Peps. Nobody cares about these teams. You're in the minority if you care about these top teams POV streams. There's teams that actually had viewers for these games. It's teams like Overwatched. You know, it's the streamer teams that actually have fans. You know, the viewership for an Overwatch game. Uh, an overwashed game would have 10 x the viewership of anything for peps or anything you're talking about. So if you're in the 10 percenters right now, do you really think you're the working class or are you the elite here? You know, I reckon you're the elite who just wants to see the pro teams play. You're only talking about what's happening to the good games, but what's happening to the games that people actually want to watch with Custer and Aspen on them. But I mean, they can still play in the Swiss, right? Yeah, like, but they, I'm saying they would be in the Swiss either way because they're not top eight. Yeah, but you're trying to fucking take out the Swiss. You're trying to cut it. I'm not trying to remove Swiss. I'm trying to. I'm trying to keep Swiss for the people that belong in Swiss. You know? No, 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 no. Because also when Schmungus play us next week, that's also really exciting to see against the fucking Schmungus versus the big dogs. So even Schmungus. Yeah, but but you you probably should have been. You probably should have been auto qualify the groups anyway. I I see it both ways, but like as far as I think the Swiss is more interesting with like the big teams having to replay Swiss, but at the same time. The coverage and the amount of attention given to Swiss overall is so poor that I just don't know that people are interested. I think it's interesting for like people involved. Like I, I'm sure Chris, for you jumping between the streams and seeing Peps take a map off ants is probably quite interesting. But like, forget about even Overwatch. That the that's that's all of like the streamers' own views. That's Jay's own views. Applies own views that would have watched them play anyway. Whatever they're playing, ranked or whatever. There's just so little interest from the community. I feel in Swiss because it's too hard to follow. No one knows where to watch people. I mean, as, as fun as it is to maybe look at a player stream to watch a game, that's not like the ideal way to watch a professional competitive Overwatch game. Um, and so most people aren't like, they're not invested in it. They're not, they're not actually looking at that. Most people who actually watch Overwatch esports, they're not looking for funny Astro stream to watch the SSG games through at least through a POV. I mean, I, I co-streamed your games. I actually watched the Saturday games and I watched through his stream and it's just like, man, as much as like, it's great to see you guys play against all the opponents you did, that was such as nothing wrong with Funny Asher. This is just unfortunately the way it is. A suboptimal way to view the game, in my opinion. My whole chat was like, yeah, this is hard. Like watching a Lucio POV to trying to figure out what the fuck's going on in this game is like so difficult. So it's just like it's poorly promoted. No one really cares about Swiss. So I just think like the whole notion of like it's more interesting with the big teams in there, it's like it's true, but it's also overrated. Most fans don't care, I think. Thank you, Kevin. I think as well. I, I will I will Sorry, but I'll push back a little bit because, like, 
Astro's viewership goes up like three or four times X when we're playing the game. So I, I do think there is like an interest in watching POV. I'm not saying there's no interest. Actually. Yeah. Um, there will be some yeah. interest for sure. But yeah. And like, I, like I've said, like my stance on this is like to give people like what you're saying is maybe true for the majority of people that they would prefer to watch it on the overhead. But I think there is like a certain section of like Overwatch fans that would prefer to watch it like via POVs and like giving comms and inside teams and watching them pop off and flame each other. I think is like an extra avenue to watch it. I don't know. I feel like the Swiss stage is like, it's so separate to everything else. It's like kind of like the fun weekend. And then we get into like the more serious stuff down the line that I know I'm so fucking Swiss. If, if there was, if there was better that, coverage you know? or better promotion, if Overwatch Esports did something, if, if the, one of the three staff members that work for Blizzard did something, I know there's not a lot of people, unfortunately, said like, hey, here's here's a list of streams. I don't know, maybe that'd be too much. But like, I don't know, there's just no... If you're a fan and you're semi-interested, I feel like you have no clue how to watch Swiss. I mean, it sounds obvious to us. Yeah, just go to Funny Astro's stream, but believe me, it's not... These, we're talking about people who don't know what Liquipedia is. They If they, if, if they mm. go to the Overwatch Esports website and it's not listed there, they're not watching anything. So... Yeah, it was, I think they were missing. Really... No, you guys. Yeah. There's missing games as well. Like when I did, I did a bit of North America on Sunday as well, and we watched Timeless v Toronto. And obviously, Timeless, Timeless blew Titan. everyone out of the water with how full health they got on Parisio. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> the end of that, the end of that round, it was fuck my Chungus <laughs> life versus Citrus Nation, and Citrus Nation take the first map once again. Seeker is having his life ruined by Citrus Nation, and I'm like. Seeker stream, hit the Seeker stream. He's not on. Someone from Citrus Nation will be streaming, right? Literally no one to watch this game. So it's this absolute dogfight and no one's there. And I think no one from M80 streamed either, any of their games, at least on the Sunday. Fucking NA, them. dude. Mickey Mouse region. They don't even fucking care about the product. They just want it to die and then complain that no one watches it. Well, fucking well done. Oh, well, well, hang on, hang on. Is it is it up to them to to like make the product happen? Or is it up to like, I don't know, maybe the blizzards of the world? I don't I don't think it's M80's job. If I'm going to be honest, yeah. See, this is a classic. That. This is a classic establishment tactic. You know, a um, a bourgeois tactic. No, no, Chris, you're the problem here. Where they oh, try okay. and put the responsibility <laughs> on the working class for something that they should be providing. You know, so where the tournament organizer, you know, the big rich people, they should be providing a broadcast so that people have something to watch. But instead, they put that responsibility on the working class. You know, they're already breaking their backs playing a video game for fun. Max, they can't, <laughs> they can't afford money. it, actually. Um, <laughs> it's funny because because Face and Blizzard can't afford it is the, is the thing. I know, I know, so I know, that's... I know, because it's a fucked industry. You know it's what? a fucked industry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know what? The problem with you two is, okay, you're like a guy who's ha he's got a girlfriend and this girlfriend has cheated on you fucking eight times and you still are in this situation where you're saying, ah, well, she shouldn't cheat on me for the ninth time. You're less like fucked up. Okay, in an ideal world, Blizzard are gonna fucking fucking put an arena tour on for the Swiss stage. <laughs> but live in the fucking real world, guys. This is not happening. This is not where we are. We, the working men, we need to take a revolution. We need to seize the means of production of the fucking <laughs> of Overwatch broadcast. This is what we need to do. <laughs> Everything you're saying is true, but it's clearly fucking unrealistic. These fucking establishment people, they don't care about us. If we want people to care about Overwatch, we got to do it ourselves, guys. I think it's unrealistic both ways. It's unrealistic both Chris. ways, though. I agree with Chris. Chris like, right, do you trust Blizzard? I don't trust Blizzard, yeah. right? <sighs> yeah, so, the, so, I mean, what does that mean? So the responsibility is on the teams to carry the eSport now. That also sounds like yes. shit. Like, I don't know. Yes, it is. Until people get interested again, you know? There's I mean, no they can still do. Can I be real? How like, can, it's, how can you no, guys no matter. Okay, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say this. If you want to talk about, you want to get real talk here. It's M80 and every org. You, you name every org that is. It's fucking every org, every team, every single team that plays Swiss. If every single member of every single team is Swiss, broadcasted and streamed their games. I don't think that revives Overwatch esports. I think the casual viewer Andy is like Vince. The viewer Andy is not fucking watching. Like he doesn't know. Unless it's streamed on Overwatch Esports, YouTube, or Twitch, he ain't fucking watching. When you're not getting to the viewership we used to be, even if all the teams fucking streamed. At the end of the day, the one thing that's going to make that happen is major investment again from like either Blizzard or Face It or, or further out, maybe from a particular country that everyone likes. Um, I don't know. Like it's just, it's you're not wrong, but I just like I think the pathway that you're going through is just like it's, it's allowing ever it's allowing the actual people that should be doing it to cop out. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We'll just let SSG uh, and M80 do all the work. 
Hell yeah. But like, I, I think this idea that if Blizzard fucking invested in the Swiss stage, that it, it would not have the Swiss any stage, just the esport influence. overall. Just not, the not product no, needs to no, be no, specific no, no, no. to the Swiss stage. No, 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 no. The investment from Blizzard, A, Blizzard have to make it a business. So if it's fucking, if they're pissing money away, it's unreasonable to expect them to piss money away. I All think. esports is a piss of money away. Yeah. It's just other, okay. other businesses justify making the money back in other ways. But Riot I lose think, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars probably every year on the esports. It's just how it, esports loses money. That's just a fact of life. Every but, esport loses money. But this idea somewhere that if like Blizzard invested more money into it, we revive Overwatch. I think it's like completely fucking backwards. We need to actually like find a way to like, we have to do something different to Overwatch esports to get people invested. We have to give them like players, like personalities. Like we need like, what we need is like someone like fucking Jinxy from SSG represent, you know? Like he revived Rainbow Six because he was such a good personality and streamer. And he got people into competitive, you know? We need that. There is no amount of fucking Blizzard broadcasts where they put the establishment on the same fucking show. And people are like, oh, I'm going to watch it again. There's literally no, like, you could give Blizzard 10 more billion fucking dollars. They do not get viewership back for Overwatch if we do the same thing again. We actually have to do something differently. We have to get people to engage in the product in a different way. And the only way to do that, in my opinion, is actually to get people interested in, like, players, in, sure. like, the like the stories, like, the personalities and the drama. Because the, the top-down Overwatch, okay, maybe you say it's better, but it's still fundamentally, like, a fucking crippled product, which no one it, can ever with a right mind watch over other esports. It's not a zero-sum game. It's both. The answer is actually both. You need, ideally, in an ideal world, you have both, right? Yeah. The developer yeah. slash TO invests, then I'll just, like, I'm not trying to shit on the current team because I know they've got limited staff, limited budget. They're just trying to make it work. But, like, you know, ideally, you, you have you have a developer that, like, really cares. Maybe I'm talking about Team 4 here. And then you have everything that you just talked about, and you put those two things together, then, bam, everything's good. That's what, yeah. what it actually is. It's like you're not gonna you're not gonna get back to big viewership. You're not gonna get a single new viewer into the game by driving traffic to Funny Astro Stream to watch a POV of a match. You know the reality is you need a mixture, right? You're gonna need someone that's funny. You know you need your Jinxie. We don't have a Jinxie anymore. We had XQC. He's gone. We we killed him years ago. But you know you need a big figure that people actually want to watch within the game. And then you also need an attractive, well-spoken Jake at the front of it all to drag viewers in. You know, you need normies to watch the game and to be attracted to the product in a way that is accessible. Pro streams and whatnot, they're not accessible to anyone. You know, it's fun. But at the end of the day, if you watch the chat, anyone in these chat rooms, they are people that have an above average understanding of the game. Even if they're the biggest fucking clients in the entire universe, they still have an above average understanding of the game because they're watching a pro's POV stream, you know? Compared to the average person that's in the play Overwatch or the Overwatch esports chat, it's like, it's, it's night and day, right? And that's the majority of the viewership at the end of the day. It's people that you probably wouldn't even regard as a human, Chris. You, you know what I think the biggest win so far in OWCS is, is the streaming teams like Overwatch and now Schmungus. The fact that Schmungus made top 16 is unbelievably huge for OWCS. Like, this is one of the biggest Ws we've had in a while because that's actually going to bring some real eyeballs. I don't know how many people, but like, ML7's a, one of the large, he's like top three, top five Overwatch streamers like currently, right? So like these guys have sizable audience. If Emong made it, this would be the same story. You know, it'd be nice if, you know, it'd be nice if every single one of the top Overwatch streamers had a team in OWCS and made it. But the fact that they even want to play in the first place, like, you know, the Jays and the Emongs, et cetera, of the world, that the, the their audience is ideally the audience that needs to be like tapped into for Overwatch esports because that's the kind of audience we'd always missed out on. Those guys never interact with Overwatch League and they had good reasons not to because it was on YouTube. They couldn't co stream it even if they wanted to because they're on Twitch, et cetera. There were so many limitations, blah, blah, blah. They like the new system. They've vocally said they like the OWC system better because they can actually interact with it. Great. And now we can actually maybe tap into their audience because they want to be engaged. And if they're having a good time, if they're qualifying, if they're having fun in the Swiss, that's probably a good thing. So, like Max said, Swiss for them, really fucking good. And I want them into the Swiss. They, that's who it should be for. And, um, you know, get more of those kind of guys in OWCS if you actually want to increase viewership down the line. I will say, just just to Chris's point of what he wants, Facer could do a lot more to integrate the viewability of Swiss overall. You know, like, I, I don't know about the exact technical details of this, but during a Swiss tournament, there could be like a stream dashboard page, you know? Yeah. Where you see the ongoing yeah. games, you link your Twitch account, to your face it account and then if Good you're idea. live on if you're live on twitch during the matches if you're playing in one of these tournaments the presumption is that you know you're playing in it and you're streaming it so you know they could have a dashboard where you can watch the live games and i think there's there's already some sort of scraper tool for this so there, there must be some sort of data here because there's a, there's a website i think it's on yeah, yeah press Q. Press Q. Live, yeah where you can see this stuff but i didn't even know about press Q. Live until the other day my manager linked it to me 
to show me the ongoing matches, you know? Like, this is so inaccessible. How, like, how the fuck is a normal person supposed to find this? And all through, this like, information- I've got it through Twitch chat. Like, it's just like exactly. a word of mouth thing just being spread among people who are already in these channels or already in these circles anyway. Exactly. So it, sh it should be way easier to watch even something like Swiss. I'm not saying that making it more, you know, more accessible to watch would save the game or anything like that. But the fact that you can't even find streams of the matches is a big problem, you know? Yeah. The yeah. tournament organizer side, for low cost, they could resolve that, you know? They could just make it easier to find the streams. They could promote it more through the website, you know? They could just they could make it easier. But instead, you have to go to pressq.live, a website that I didn't even know I just, existed until three days you, ago. You need, to, you need to tap into like the most casual guy because like the actual competitive audience is we, we know what those numbers look like. You know, whatever Al was in the last couple of years, that's the most hardcore of the hardcore esports audience because they're the ones that stuck through the YouTube years, et cetera. You want to tap into the guys that like, you know, uh, the, you want to tap into the Overwatch play base, ideally, you know, the, the real casual guys that would want to get in. So the barrier to entry has to be super fucking low. And also, at the end of the day, I think it's it comes down to Blizzard actually promoting that to that audience because they have access to promote to that audience way more than anyone else does. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I still look at Blizzard as like the, the main person, the main entity that needs to do the most work. And unfortunately, no amount of like Toronto players streaming their POVs is just going to make the difference compared to what Blizzard could do with one press of a button. Yep. We're doomed. Actually, I think you guys are pretty pretty reasonable actually i think a, a stream like i think i don't think the official broadcast for swiss stage is that important but if we had like a stream tracker for everyone's povs i think that's actually that would really, yeah. really 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 help like for everyone and it would encourage everyone to stream it i think too yeah. Yeah. so it would be a win-win and i'm not saying we need a swiss broadcast like an official swiss swiss broadcast or anything but like you know there's there's, there's a number of things that that can be done um i also just don't think the swiss is ultimately that important to be to be honest with you but yeah there's more that could be done even even so yeah, I think ultimately, like in terms of like the format and the structure, I feel like it's for groups that ends up being more of a drag than any of the Swiss. Because I think when I look at like a lot of other esports, there's always a series of online qualifiers that are always just kind of like broadcast, but their, their viewership's nowhere, nowhere comparable to the main event, right? Which is yeah. fine. But then it just builds to that a lot quicker. I think what we're going to go into now is like another two weeks of groups. And if I look at some of these groups, I'm like, well, it's just going to be the same story again, right? We're going to get two weeks. And some of these teams are just going to completely cruise through it. We're going to get probably get a patch change in the middle to like make everything a bit wacky for a while. But how many good games that are actually going to be in this Swiss? Maybe SSG XO. Maybe there'll be a couple of other close games. You know what? But like, that's not a lot. You know the sad thing about this, and this is the thing: is like a normal esport would broadcast every single group game, every single playoff game, and that that'd be normal, right? We we don't do half of that shit, but. This is the thing that we're going to miss out on. I just said the biggest win, win that we've got recently is that Schmungus made the top 16. Guess what? They're probably not going to get broadcasters because unfortunately, as a, as a streamer team who made it 16th, they're probably going to get 0-2 and knocked out, which means they're not going to get on the main broadcast at all. So we're going to actually miss out on the biggest win by not capitalizing it, by not giving the viewers the opportunity. Like ML7 and SK's viewers, they're not going to be able to watch their team play on the official fucking broadcast because they're not going to be on the official broadcast because the games aren't going to be fucking broadcasted. That's a huge problem. The problem there is just that our product is so hyper budget that they can't justify additional broadcast days, right? Like it's it's just crazy to the extent that yes, like they it's, can't it's it's unbelievably work. hyper budget. It's it's like disgustingly I mean, hyper even budget. Even the right? even the element of how we have a rolling schedule that has to be a budgetary decision, right? Like to cut down on the number of hours that people are working. No, for the day, I surely. no, I don't think that's a budgetary decision. I just think that's like you. There's a couple. I know you don't like it, but <clears> the thing is, you lose viewers. When you just have like an hour break, it's like see you in an hour when an A comes up, you just what, what are you gonna do? End the stream but play like a timer for an hour? Yeah, I guess. The other thing so. is the other thing is is like, yeah, it's also time for the, the people involved in the production. You're talking about all the people staff there. Like I think adding an extra hour is probably not gonna kill them in terms of like the day rate. I, I think it's all within the same day rate. But like when you're talking about doing two regions, I know someone like Zoe is doing like a ten hour day already, doing it back to back with a rolling schedule. So you're you're putting you're making people like who actually are doing both reach at the same time like all the production stuff and the host and the analyst that you're making them do like way fucking more work um and it's worse for the viewers so yeah yeah i mean i i get what you're saying but i i also think that like massive schedule shifts throughout the day are like really really awkward it does suffer you know? na it makes like it when, makes it makes na have to get up earlier than they should do it's and they, not you just know, a, it's not just a get up earlier thing though you know like this isn't this isn't an esport that's paying tier one wages, you know. Like the teams that are participating in these tournaments, it's like people have so many other commitments. You know, I'm not talking about my team. I'm talking about competitors too. You know, like it's I a mixture of it's people that are working, it's people that are going to school. Like 
it's a vast minority of people that are full-time in the game at this point, but the scheduling is very much in a, in a, a situation where it's like you're expecting everyone to be so available all the time. Okay, so it's this like is the budget. When Luminosity, when Luminosity played a team, our, our run through groups was so fucking easy because we had a rolling schedule and the enemy team's tracer player just wasn't available for the match because the mm. rolling schedule made the match so much earlier than the scheduled time. So we got to roll groups like an absolute joke so because they just didn't have their tracer. This is, this is what I can tell you. It, it, okay, in an ideal world, the NNE broadcast wouldn't even be the same broadcast. Those two would be separate. Like you look at the big esports, I'm still I'm still holding on to the fantasy of us being a big esport. I guess it was just not a big esport, it was just a small esport. But in like in let's call it a real esport, NNE would be separate. You'd have LE, LCS, LEC, right? You'd have you have mm -hmm. VCT, EMEA, VCT, NA. They'd be two completely separate products with their own broadcast doing their own fucking thing. Here, yeah. to make it cheaper, we're gonna roll into the same product. It's gonna be EMEA plus NA back to back. It's the it's the one broadcast which will roll it together. To be fair, it's what it's what Apex Legends does as well. So even even Apex is doing this as well for probably budgetary reasons. So if you want to talk about budget, that is a that is one of the budgetary things coming through for yeah. sure. That's fair. Then enough. you can you can also then make if we've got such strict budget, why do we want two weeks of groups? Because then we're spending like half of a monthly budget on groups. I know it's not going to exactly. I agree. Work, like, I, I'd rather I'd rather, I mean, like, I'd like rather a, do two weeks of playoffs. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's the 100% the, the format change should be one week of groups, two weeks of playoffs, and then broadcast everything on playoffs. I think it's like such a no-brainer that I'm surprised that we haven't, haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I thought that would have fixed it for OWCS too, you know, but apparently like, because it's I think all if you did, I think in. if you did, if you only did one week of groups, uh, how many games did you miss? I think you'd, you'd miss a fuck ton of games, right? I think that that's the worry. It looks like, oh, they're not, they're doing groups and we're, we're broadcasting fucking almost none of it. So I think the compromise they made, this is just me speculating, I don't actually know. The compromise they made based on speculation is that You'll you'll miss some of the games in groups, some of the games in playoffs, and you'll catch like I don't know seventy percent of both, rather than you catch one hundred percent of playoffs and then like thirty percent of groups, because that thirty percent of groups versus the seventy percent looks really fucking bad. That's probably where the decision came from. If I had to guess, but like yeah. ideally, you you cover like I said, as I said, I, in a, an ideal world where we didn't have ass budget, you'd cover one hundred percent of both groups and playoffs. Like that should be that should be what we're actually doing, but we we can't. So it yeah. sucks. It's just not, it's not fitting of the premier tier one tournament of the year that like, you know, you have these no, massive well, the joke. The podcast. joke is, the joke is this is worse than contenders from last year. Yes. yes. Contenders, contenders didn't fucking miss matches. Cont I mean, this okay, is, I don't, I don't this know. This is, fact, over, this is like, open div into trials, into contenders every month. That's what this tournament compare, actually is. Compare, you know? compare, real, real talk, compare OWCS to contenders 2019 and tell me what the better product is. You had three international <laughs> tournaments in contenders 2019, close, by the way. Close. Three international yeah. tournaments. You want to know how many teams made it internationally in 2019 for contenders? For Gauntlet, I'm, it was more than eight. More than eight. I think it was like <laughs> I think it was like ten or some shit. Contenders Gauntlet. We even sent Max. I'll look at it right. Way. Fuck. Um. I mean, yeah. We, <laughs> we had like pack, pack showdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Max went to pack yeah. showdown. So oh the number of God, teams that went to Gauntlet 2019 in Korea was. <laughs> 10 teams, so two more than we have now in 2024. And th that was just for contenders, by the way. This is not even Overwatch League. This is just fucking contenders. Contenders in 2019. Like, I don't know I don't know the exact numbers of both, but like, contenders 2019 looks like it had more budget than OWCS in 2024 does as well. Here's a more fun thing to do. Com start comparing prize pools if you really want to be sad. Yeah, no, mm. don't need that. We can just what? add that big mystery Saudi prize pool in the middle of the year and feel good about ourselves again, you know? Like, uh, forget forget about what Blizzard's giving us. Just look at the big one in the middle that we don't know about yet. I think I was hearing as well, Nat, obviously they're doing the Asia LAN in a couple of weeks, and yep. WDG are paying for seven player slash star for each team for, like, flights and accommodation. Oh, seven, really? Seven, but Blizzard... I thought it was six. Well, oh. No, that's Blizzard for the major. Blizzard for the major is still six, but WDG <laughs> have stretched up to seven for Asia Land. Yeah. Well, there's, 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 no, 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 hang on, hang on. There's an asterisk it's, there. It's, it's, it's cheaper. It's, hold on, hold on. It's, no, no. It is cheaper, but still, yeah. No, no, no. no. It's a, there's an asterisk there. You, it's seven, but here's the crazy part. If you're an import, and you, so you are not a domestic player in any of the Asia regions, if you're an import, you still have to pay your own flights. The difference between, like, I think, I think, I'm just going to throw it. I think it's something, something like the difference between if you go from Singapore to Korea, if your co flight costs more than that, you have to pay the difference. So every single <laughs> Australian like import Adam. has to it's pay like the difference. Adam stuff. Yeah, Are Adam, Ank, yes, I'm fucking serious. They have to pay the difference <laughs> in that. Um, they can't even, they can't even, they don't even get a free trip to land. Uh, so, like, so, um, and that's by the way, I think Max, I'm, I, I, I'm, 
try not to change topics here, but this needs to be brought up, Max. I think you were right. You speculated that the reason that um, OS got cut out of OWCS was a budgetary reason due to flights. And the more I've investigated this topic, the more I think you're 100% dead on. Like, based I on mean, everything I know, that's actually the real reason OS got cut out. If so you is, have we- to pay your flights difference to attend the Asia land that you're eligible to compete in, then if it has to be budgetary, right? Like, they must be so... Because here's, here's, yeah. here's, here's the thing. I, I also found it behind the scenes. You guys want to start the leaks? Here we go. I also found it behind the scenes that ESL Australia were happy to continue doing Contenders Australia or something equivalent. Mac is, by the way, the only sponsor we had basically globally for anything because Overwatch didn't have any sponsors. Contenders didn't have any sponsors except Contenders Australia, which had Mac because McDonald's Australia going strong since 2018, like five years worth of fucking sponsorship, by the way, paid for everything I'm in that entire that. region. I am too. Um, <laughs> they paid for me. That's that's fucking for sure. I got a fucking, I got, I got money out of that. Anyway, the point is, this is important. Mac is, Mac is, we're happy to come on for another year in 2024. They Wait, we, we could have we had gave away Maccas. We gave away that sponsorship. We, they we could have by saying, our region. By saying no, by saying no we to Oz, the world. We, we gave away we gave away a sponsor that was willing to come on again. We gave away ESL. And I think the reason for this, if I had to speculate again, so some of this I know, some of this I'm speculating on, but it's educated speculation. The educated speculation is is that you have basically a regional thing where I think, you know, obviously you got face it who have um EMEA plus NA and WDG have all of Asia, right? So you have a situation where ESL Australia still face it. You can't just like that's WDG's turf. You know what I'm saying? So if you got if 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 you're gonna run oh. an OWCS thing in Australia, that has to be WDG. ESL can't just come like, oh, we'll do Australia for you. That's no, no, that's WDG's territory now because it's Asia. And if WDG doesn't have the budget, and they say no, we can't support Australia. And Australia gets fucked. That's all it comes down to. ESL so what they do is they ESL Mac is, nowhere. <laughs> ESL and Mac is even if they have the willingness, the capability, and the money to do Australia, they can't even do it. Because it's not their region anymore. Now it's WDG's region. And if WDG don't have the money, then Asia, then Australia just get fucked, which is actually isn't, what happened. Isn't that insane, though? That because we're in WDG's region, but we're too expensive for them to support, they say, oh, we just you're, not, we a, just you're not a region at all. In fact, just simply you're, such, you're such not a region that you're an import now. Even though <laughs> we're, we're encapsulating your region for competition, we don't want to financially support you. So you have to pay for your own fucking flights and you're not, on your own. It's not WDG being cheap. They're actually, I think, done a better job with their budget. I don't know the difference between WDG and Face's budget, but WDG, for, to their credit, I think they've done actually a good job outside the Australia thing, but they just ran out of money. Like they ran out of money to support Australia because they are running seven days a week's worth of broadcast. They broadcast absolutely fucking every game. Okay, they're broadcast beat, except for. They're like, broadcast in heaps, but they've got hex and well, they've well, got hex on, and a bunch on, of well, well, from the English broadcast. So well, we'll get to, hang on, hang on. We'll get to quality of broadcast later because I think that's going to be a hot topic. But they're at least showing the fucking games. If you want to watch a mute, <laughs> you've got you, you've got a point you there. I'll like, pay that. I'll pay you, that. If you want to watch a mute, you can you can come and fucking watch my co stream instead. You can watch X <laughs> Eco Streams Korea. You can watch us. It doesn't matter. The point is there's something to watch. There are actual you. games being broadcasted, unlike NA and EU, which don't just, just don't fucking broadcast games okay and the only reason korea even missed out on broadcasting some games is because they had a scheduling conflict where they had to do the pacific finals and you can't miss out on pacific because we had to watch a little adam win obviously so you had to watch the pacific finals and so korea had to like miss out on first round and so the only reason they missed out they would have broadcasted but there was a scheduling conflict and then even then you know the replay codes are there and blah 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 etc so they had a legitimate reason for actually not broadcasting because of a scheduling conflict was in any it's just like sorry no money can't do it that's WDG, fair WDG That's also fair don't enough. have money, but I feel like maybe they've spent their money better because they have three regions versus face it's two regions, and WDG somehow managed to broadcast seven days a week. I think it's a question, you know, at this point, it's like, do you want quality or quantity? You know, it's like you can get a North American broadcast with the premier names of Overwatch on it, or you can get a seven day long, almost 24 7 stream of people working their hearts out, working a lot of hours. Unfortunately, the people working those hours, a hex with a so, green screen cutting off half of his haircut and 9K struggling to speak English. Let's, let's, so let's, it really let's, is a quality. Hang on, hang on, no, no. You, you say quality. No, no, no. I think you're wrong there. I think quality even WDG wins. Why? Because they have an actual land studio. They run and that shit three days a week on the land studio. The they fonts, also yeah, I was going to say, how much for the also fonts? Have, they probably paid <laughs> too much money for that. They they also have three different languages. They have Japanese, English, and Korean that they're all paying for. So three languages, not just English. Their face is only doing English. And they're still missing our games, by the way. So unless Uber's charging them a million dollars a year, I don't know what the fuck they spend their budget on. Um, yeah. But like, yeah, Korea's some Korea's like they have they have land, they have studio. 
I face it, they can only afford to do studio for players. They can't even afford to do studio for groups. Okay, fine. Maybe they ran out of my. Uh, first, I don't know, WDG, maybe WDG just own the fucking, st they own the cinema. They have a deal with Dehan Cinema. I don't know, maybe they get to use it for free. I don't know the exact logistics of it. But like, they have fans coming in who also pay tickets, pay money for the tickets. So like, they're doing something where I feel like the quality of the bar is high because they get to have actual LAN matches, for fuck's sake, with three languages being broadcast. It's seven days a week, by the way. Sorry, the LANs are not seven days a week, but the seven days a week with the broadcast three, which are on LAN. That's pretty fucking high quality. Yeah, no, I, I joke about it because I was just looking for an opportunity to make fun of Hex and his funny green screen. But at the end of the day, you, you are right that like the quality of the WG broad, WDG broadcast is actually like broadly speaking a lot higher in that, you know, there's studio, Much there's, higher. Event. there's a lot more moving part. There's a lot more moving parts in the APAC broadcast is, is the impression that I get, you know? If the, if the worst thing and, they have is a bad green screen and a bad font, I'll fucking take that compared to what NAD hey, is doing. Font. Hey, that's, that's not a bad fucking good, that's, man. That's, that's a, a level font. font you're talking it's about. Not, you haven't even seen the land you font yet, dude. We need to that back right now when we see that third font. Fuck. Yeah. Okay, now that, that's fair Bunch enough. Nixle fans. We would have loved to see you on the APAC broadcast though, you know? Like I'm sure that your day rate was a little higher than Hex's or something like that. But there's still room for improvement even in the APAC broadcast. You know, you've got to concede that, right? There's a room to, for improvement in all and all and everything. Do you you could just say that about all of Overwatch Esports and maybe all of Esports, but specifically Overwatch Esports, the room for improvement is like fucking sky high. Do you, do you so, guys see you know. today they announced Custer to the NA broadcast? You know, for the last broadcast, they did Necro plus Lemon Kiwi as the guest cast. But this time around, they've done Jaws and Jaws and Custer, you know, like a little bit of an mm -hmm. appeal to tradition, perhaps. Yeah. Um, Uncoachable saving the day okay, again. I don't, I don't think you personally got the job for Custer in this situation, but maybe the general reception to the first first round of casts has contributed to the yeah. change. This is this is why this is why Overwatch didn't qualify, by the way, because Custer's like I got a cast, boy. <laughs> so I'm, to I'm, gonna to, I'm gonna have to throw this game because I got an extra job. This, so <laughs> we, we, we can't make it. Five of this actually. <laughs> guy just starts Ajaxing out of this fucking world the second they get close to qualifying. It's like, oh, I fell off the I fell into the lava on Kings Row again. Whoopsie! I don't know how did that, guys. What's my bad? <laughs> Anyway, good that he's back. One of the Australians has been unkilled and just, you know, I'll just remain dead for now. Thank God. <laughs> so do we want to talk a bit more about the broadcast itself? Here we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Are we about to do like a broadcast shit talk segment? Let me grab a drink. Hang on. So I, I guess maybe like a decent place to start then, Avril, is what's your opinion of the broadcast so far? I guess in terms of quality compared to what it was like before and what you expected and hoped for uh macro wise it's they're doing the best this is a cop out they're doing the best they can given the budgetary limitations but then again maybe that's not the best answer because you could argue they're actually still not doing the best they can given the budgetary limitations but they're doing they're doing what's probably easy what's probably like straightforward based on the budget um, and I know you guys have made comments before. I have to try and remember what Gumba said versus what you guys said versus like what you agreed on, maybe what you disagreed on. I don't think you disagreed on much, but um, I, we all co sign I, everything Gumba says. Don't every worry. last word of it, yeah. yeah <laughs> even the stuff he says off broadcast in DM supplies, absolutely. And every, everything else, even the stuff we have to leave um, out. <laughs> yeah, even the stuff that you have to leave on the cutting room floor, like fuck, we can't let this one go live. Thank God it's just a recorded podcast. I have to cut that one out. Um, generally speaking. I, I think it's more just everyone's doing what is the most straightforward path of least resistance rather than like this. I don't think there's any malice attributed to anything. Like um, I'll talk in a second about like my details of why I got cut and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there was no, there's no real juice. There. There's no malice behind that. So no one's like trying to fuck anyone over. No one's like, you know, fuck these guys. We're not going to hire them because we'd hate them. Um, it's just like, this is what's easy. We're obviously going to take people that have worked on the product before. So I know some of you guys talked about like, why didn't they take a risk on new people? It's like, brother, there's only like, there's only th three desk members, one of which is a host, two analysts on that desk, and then four casters. I don't think there's space to take on new people when you got like good people like Custer who are still left out. He might be back on for a little bit to cover for somebody leaving because we know that Zoe and um and, and uber have other other you know think they have other commitments on vct and valorant right which is why it, and other things that the, this is card game that uber did as well so you know mitch mitch did a he, he did a a fab tcg thing card game tournament that was casting instead of the finals of owcs which i'm not trying to make a judgment call there like 
I'm not saying that was the right or wrong call to make, but it's just, you know, I'm just saying that people have other commitments to make. And I don't know if he got paid more from that event or maybe that was just booked in super early. He couldn't like back out of it. But the point is, is like people are going to miss out. So Custer will come in, but he's at, at this t time speaking, I don't think he's still like a permanent member or anything like that. So, you know, I don't think there's any room to take a risk on like new people when guys like Custer got left on the cutting room floor, right? There's, there's other casters that never even made it back in. Like, you know, you can't argue for room for new people when we've decreased the casting like the casting pool from like it was 10 people and they were watching broadcast like four now i guess 10 is more global that was apac included but in a there would have been at least six and you cut out two that's now four and they cut out a member of the disc as well danny only comes in to like cover for Zoe now so yeah Dumbledore's i mean danny. yeah i know he does yeah <laughs> Dom is on his anti-Korean arc at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's pushed that even onto the broadcast, I see. So yeah, the macro answer is like they're doing they're doing what they can with the path of least resistance. And I don't think there's a lot of malice attributed to any decisions made. So basically we just wish that they had more money, is what I'm hearing. Well, there's two questions to be asked. It's like, you know, where's the money? Which is like a hard question. And there's a better question is like, so even with the budgetary limitations, could they have made, made better decisions for the broadcast? I'm not even just talking about talent here. Could they have made better decisions for the broadcast overall? Like that's probably the better question to ask, right? So, yeah. Let me, let me ask you this then, because I think we last week in the Gumba episode, we said that, okay, we actually fundamentally agree with what you're saying, but we felt like the forecasters or the broadcast or whatever, we felt like they, the best people didn't get the jobs. That's what we felt. But I suspect that if I asked you that question, it's going to be a fat no comment. So maybe let's ask this. Fast like, what comment? No comment. I can answer. I don't know. I can answer that question for you. Go on, Go on. Is, Did the best talent get picked for, for the forecasters and free analysts? All right. So here's my cop out. What's the best talent though? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> he's, like, he's got, he's hopped like, off but, one fence onto a different fence. I love fences, dude. <laughs> like, okay. If we're talking about like, who the community, this is me dancing around the fact that all the casters and all my colleagues, I'm like friends with everybody, you know, we were, we were all pretty close. I, th I still think we're all pretty close. And like, uh, there's, there's an interesting thing where like, it's, it's tough to speak critically without it sounding like some sort of personal attack, attack. even yeah. though, even though it should, even though like you should be able to have an objective conversation. I, this I actually agreed with you guys saying like, you know, everyone in the community on, on in the esports sphere probably is open to criticism the the production and talent are generally pretty protected um and i and i think i'm not asking for people to be criticized so I, if this is like a very tricky conversation it's not like i'm asking oh hey community go and criticize talent now but it's like it's the i do think that like you know everyone should be open to criticism um i think the the difference between players coaches and talent ends up being you have one side of the fence where it's very objective everyone knows based on whether you win or lose um and your performance in the game if you're a player whether you're good or not that's probably like a little too rudimentary con considering that like coaches have like a bit of an unknown job because no one actually sees so people just judge coaches on win or loss but at least a win or loss is still more objective than do i like this person's casting or not which just feels like a super fucking subjective thing which is why when i said like how do we define best talent best casting etc a large portion of that is a pretty subjective conversation. Some of it will be objective. For example, can you speak the English? On, uh, can you speak English properly or not? Is it, can you speak the language of broadcasting properly or not? Which I'm sure is uh, is a cue for Max to jump in at some point about the Asia broadcast. Um, and then you know, do you do you generally have a do you have a pleasant voice? Can are you presentable? Like there's some things that are objective, but I think a lot of things in casting is pretty subjective. So it ends up being like pretty tough to answer. Like did they get the best talent on? I think based on what the community think, it's probably not because the community have probably have a tier list of who they think is good or not. But then, you know, that's the vocal portion of the community. That's everyone on Reddit, which accounts for, I don't know how many of the viewers. So we don't know what the majority of viewers think. That would be impossible to quantify. And I don't know. I don't know that they think anything. They, they probably don't really give a shit about the broadcast, if I'm honest. So. Yeah, I mean, like in pure like layman's terms, you know, I see like a uh, you know like your lemon kiwis and your necros, they get like a lot of hate from the um you know the Reddit fan base. Basically, you know, they say, "Ah, oh, this is a miss, this is a miss." And like from my perspective, I, I obviously you know I'm a, I'm a pro coach. I want the information conveyed to be like as accurate as possible. You know, it's like I don't want them to be saying the wrong thing about what's happening on the broadcast. But I think about it and like 
even, you know, like, like my old man, when he would watch our games, he would tell me like, oh yeah, no, that one's my favorite. Talking about the casters, you know, it's like, I think it was Necro. I think he's talking about Necro. He's saying like, yeah, yeah she's my favorite. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, sure. You know, like from someone that has absolutely no fucking clue, like that's, that, that's their favorite caster. So like, you know, big ops, right? Like maybe we aren't the perfect representation of what the, uh, the average or, you know, perhaps less experienced viewer actually likes. We don't know what they like either. Like, it's so hard to quantify. Like, I can't say either way. And and it would be disingenuous for anyone to be like, well, you know, you don't know what the broadcast is actually who they're trying to target. It's like, well, I don't think that the broadcast also knows either. Because if the, you'd have to do like a mass survey to really get their opinions, I don't, it'd be, it'd be interesting. I don't know who the average guy who watches a broadcast actually thinks is good. Um, what, the only feedback we get is from like the, the more hardcore audience, whether that's staff actually working in it or people on Reddit or Twitter who are among the hardcore. If you're willing to comment on this kind of stuff, you're probably a hardcore viewer. And the hardcore yeah. viewers definitely lean towards the, the type of commentary that you guys prefer. True. So that's what we can say. That's what we can definitely do say. You, do you think that, especially like in as we enter into like the new year of Overwatch, do you think that like the tone of the broadcast is too safe and a little bit too boring to the point where it negatively affected like do you think that like the overwatch culture is just like so unbelievably risk-free especially if we compare it to maybe like other games like csgo was the example where people were like swearing on the desk and stuff do you think that there is an element if you were in charge you would think that i have a theory somewhere that actually like the the core demographic of esports players is one that's missed when we just do like not uncoachable style humor you know maybe you can't do uncoachable style humor on the official yeah. broadcast because we might push that limit like a tiny bit but do you think that there is like an element of like we need to have more shit talk swearing edginess on the broadcast to appeal to like the on the talent like the core no just like just the overall theme of the broadcast everything like i feel like we can dial it up a little bit where it's a little bit like less safe okay. a little bit less pg let's let's here's the thing is we Again, again, I don't know about the, the overall community, but just from the vocal people in the community, they can't handle Gator tweeting right now. If Gator tweets, the community blows up. Their, their minds explode. Like, our, our Overwatch competitive community, for some reason, is so sensitive to any type of shit talking from anybody. I don't know that they can handle anything. Like, I don't think this play is entirely true. Maybe like, not. It's it's a subset. Maybe it's a subset. Maybe I'm just seeing the loud voices because I know, know there's like in Valorant. In Valorant, diet. Baby Bay is on the broadcast. Back when Gladiators were actually capable of winning games, I remember I did the pre-selection show and I did it like we picked Houston or something, and I was just shit talking Jake and shit talking Houston for the entire segment. You know, like they let me go on broadcast and explain our rationalization for why I was picking Houston, and I was just trashing on Houston, like actually hard taking the piss. And like it was received super well, you know, like a community that's supposed to be like really anti shit talk and stuff like that. I just went on main broadcast and hard talk shit about how Houston were useless and couldn't win a game and how the only wins that they had were versus absolute but, rubbish. Were they on broadcast at the same time? Did you guys have a back and forth? Yeah, yeah. It was it was like me and so, Jake. So, going so at this it. is this is the thing. I think if I think people doing it on the official broadcast is one thing, but like if you were to do it on a tweet, people would probably be like, maybe, maybe you specifically is a bad example. Because like people think you're know, you're the funny Australian guy, mustache, like fucking, you know, mullet, whatever. But the, like, like the like protective facial like, hair that gets like, you over the like, line. Like. But like, I think on tw I think on I think on Twitter, like you here's here's what Banter needs to have. Banter needs to be two way. And a lot of what happens in Overwatch esports as well is is a play or shit talk, and the other the other side just doesn't. Like, can you imagine what happens if okay, Twisted Minds is not the best example because I think a lot of people just don't like them anyway. But let's say like UB shit talks Gumber and Gumber says nothing. That just makes you look like an asshole. But because Gumber and UB shit talk each other and they both have haters, it's like whatever. It's just banter now. I think like you need both sides interacting. And that's why in COD, like all the players shit talk each other all the time. They're like actually swearing at each other and like yelling at each other and stuff. And so that's that's funny and that's like because everyone's engaged in it. Um we I don't know. It's it's a it's a thing where in the Overwatch community we're like the community is super protective of everyone to start with. And then on top of that, you're very one sided shit talking and the other side almost never shit talks. And some of that is due to the fact that I mean, you're like it was overall it was like sixty percent Korean, and so I mean, what do you what do you do? The, are the Western players going to shit talk the Korean players in English and not be responded to due to language barriers? Are the Western That's players we going to shit talk? The, I mean, it's it's still possible. Players? It's still possible, but you need to invite it from like a publisher and from a broadcast perspective. You know, like Blizzard are way that. too safe for that. That's what I mean. But it's like you That's know, I got the chance to do that pre-selection show, and then you know, 
basically for the remainder of the year, like, you know, we, we still had like good results going forward, but it's like, they, they just don't give you that many opportunities to do it. You know, like there, there are people out there that will talk shit on broadcast, you know, they might be a bit few and far between in Europe, but I guarantee you put me, you put Gator, Gator's, Gator's, Gator's team's are doing well. Like you could get him on broadcast all the time. You could get Gumbo on broadcast all the time. You give these people a do microphone you, and a camera, they're going to give you a funny moment. You know, did you like, win by the way? What, what year did you, was that that you were on, you won broadcast? What in year 22, was that? we won kickoff clash and mid season. Yeah. So I think if you were a shit team, people would have people would have clowned you. But because you were a good team, because here's the other thing with the QME, people are like, oh, if, like he can shit talk because he's winning. Yeah, but I mean, a, a component of shit talk is that you can back it up with performances. You know, if you're just perma shit talking while you're getting shit on all the time, I mean, you're just a, you're just a psycho, no? <laughs> like, probably, like yeah. Hydron. Probably, yeah. If, if you do it like Hydron, then you know, it's like that's so the reality. Probably why right? people, that's probably why the community is, hasn't really liked Hydron because, yeah. like. You know, he hasn't been but, winning. Yeah, um, you need to be capable of substantiating it. Other guys are just like a big ego dickhead, you know? But if you're a big ego dickhead that wins, it's like, ah, oh, you know, funny. Also, is it a point of shit talk? Is that some people get pissed off, right? Like, it should annoy mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. People, if you, if or someone, fans or the opposite. Exactly. If, if someone on the enemy team or like a non, say, I support London or SSG and someone on Enter's Gumba's talking shit, and then I should be annoyed that, oh, that's fucking Gumba. Who does he think he is? Have, my team's better than his team. What's he fucking on about? That is what's meant to happen. So, like, if you do make a big claim and you don't back it up, you should get shit on. Well, but you I, know what? I, I, I think for, this would be good for the upcoming, you know, group stage playoffs games. But, like, I would like the broadcast and just, like, mm -hmm. the everything around OC, OWCS in general to promote more of the Ants Twisted Minds rivalry because that's, like, becoming quite public. And maybe the two teams actually don't like each other very much, which just adds to the, adds to the rivalry more. But I enjoyed the London Atlanta rivalry with the shit talking that we had back in the day. I personally thought it was really good. Um, I don't know how the players felt about it. I thought it was pretty good from a viewer's standpoint. To actually answer Chris's question like 10 minutes later, though, like I don't think the broadcast necessarily like supports stuff like that. I don't think you're going to see a situation where like casters will be like allowed to swear. Like no one ever got fined for swearing, as far as I know. But I, I don't think. The, I don't think the broadcast yeah. will ever be like, I oh, just go and swear now if you if you feel like it. I also think like if broadcasts do that, it is a bit crass. Like it has to be used in a very deliberate way and never overused. Like even in Counter Strike, if some guy just started cursing left and right, I'd be like, what is this guy doing? Like this it sounds so crass and unprofessional. Like you still need to like, you know, dial it into like a certain stage where like, okay, this is fine, and then after that, you're just being a dickhead. Pick your so, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Actually, um, yeah. I think now that we say it, I think that there's two separate things, right? There was like the broadcast being edgy and then there was like the, the players being edgy. And I actually think now that you say it, I think there was like a really good medium somewhere where like the broadcast doesn't necessarily get edgy and swear, but it actually encourages the teams to do it a little bit more and it allows like the rivalries. Because we'll, we can maybe talk a bit about like the TM and the end stuff, but I think that is like super fucking good, you know? Like there was, I, I think to Avril's point, like on that Reddit thread, there was a lot of people who like, it, it fucking got people riled up. There was like talking, like people back and forth. I think that like, my feeling is actually that there is a genuine fucking, at least like, like I don't think those teams are friends to the point where they just like, they're just like, haha, like classic, you be calling me a dog. Like I think <laughs> that these guys genuinely do not like each other. Oh, there's hatred. I there. think that's so fucking good. Like, yeah, that's good for the need. show. That's good for the show. Yeah, like, fuck it. Like, this isn't something that we should stamp out. We should encourage this. Like, we, obviously, like, I think especially when, like, TM get involved, like, there's been a lot of, like, historical situation where, like, the Saudi Arabian fans, if, like, TM doesn't like someone, they get in your Twitter DMs and they tell you to fucking die and stuff. And I feel like that is, like, maybe, like, a step too far. Although, on, uh, on Uncoachable, we have encouraged death threats before. So if you do want to send them... Jesus we Christ. Are, yeah, you have our Twitter. <laughs> um, but, like, I think you're right. Like, I think that, like, this, this, like, shit talk. One thing that, like, Donald does, like, I like Gumba, but he's also kind of a fucking pussy because he always types after they win. Like, Gumba, yeah, okay, here's a funny story about Gumba, okay? Gumba loves to talk shit after a team wins, but Gumba is a fucking pussy if you shit talk him. We've had two scrims this year, okay, where one of our players could not join the lobby and we're like, oh, is it a bug? Is it whatever? It's because Gumba blocked them. We had one this week. Psycho could not get into lobby and we were, oh, he needs to restart his game. He needs to do this. The reason was Psycho had been shit talking Gumba in chat. Gumba just fucking blocked him. And if you're blocked, you can't join the Overwatch lobby. So <laughs> Gumba always like after against, like after his team that he shit the bed against Pepsi, he like typed in chat, the French free as fuck as usual. Fucking type <laughs> it during, mate. That's it. Just fucking like type it before, type it during. Way easier after the screen goes victory to say, but the overall situation is, I think we should lean into this, especially in Europe, because we can get like, I don't want to, I think 
patriotism is what I'm going to use, not naturalism. But I think that we have like some some teams who are like Finnish, Saudi Arabian, French, whatever it is. I think we should fucking play into that a little bit more. And I think fuck it, I would love it if the broadcast gave us like more opportunities to do that. But I actually think that we just like as a again like the, the working man, we need to fucking build up for ourselves. We just need to fucking like be a little bit more content with like shit talking each other. Because I remember when the like there was a game, Sauna's team versus Ab Heaks game. Okay, it was hardly like a fucking banger in Europe. You guys probably didn't even watch it. But after the game, these teams are fucking talking mad shit to each other. Oh, shouldn't have kicked me. Oh, Sauna on dive, lol. Great fucking well done, Ab Heek. Respect to that. Sauna on dive, lol. Um, but all of this type of shit, you know, like fucking love it. Like this is exactly what it is. The same reason why fucking Captology is doing great for the community by being a fucking client. Because we can shit talk this guy. And then if we ever get an SSG timeless at LAN, if, if we just somehow manage to qualify, fuck it, it'll be a bit of fun. It'll be the clash of the coaches, Chris Tieffer versus the alpha, the fucking Don't have to wait for LAN. Overwatch coaching. Do it this group stage. Do it playoffs now, like this stage. <laughs> do it immediately. It's really hard for us to play timeless in group stages. But <laughs> or just, or sorry, in play, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? This stage, this stage of competition, if you... If you, uh, sorry, you guys don't even know the same oh, region. Any, who, who, who the fuck? Max. So Max, is, Max is in his region. In the Max is in the region. Okay. I've, sorry. N A E M E H. It's one thing to me. Max, you're yeah. in his region. You can shit all capitology. You're good at that. You're, you're a toxic <laughs> guy. You can do that. But that's it. Like it, <laughs> next time, fucking some like Timus versus SSG or Ends versus TM or like Ab Peak versus Sauna's game. No one's going to fucking watch that. But actually, I'm super fucking invested in that when they, because they're in the same group. So they're going to play again, you yeah. know? Adds a whole fucking new level. It's like the, the UFC is unironically fucking built on shit talking. Like UFC is fucking sick to watch. I love UFC. But n the reason it got so big is because Conor McGregor was just like the fucking greatest shit talker in human history. And he like fucking 10 x like the viewership and interest in that sport, you know? Um, and what we need is shit talk after the game. Do it a little bit before the game too. Donald, if you listen, I know you're fucking listening, mate. Fucking do it a little bit before. <laughs> Let's fucking get it going, you know? Like, fucking people like Kev. I love Kev because he always talks shit in fucking, like, team chat. I mean, like I said before, like, Kev, I think he needs to do it a little bit more face-to-face. -face. He needs to fucking... Are you saying Kevster is a good shit talker? In scrims, he is. He's a massive shit talker. Oh, yeah, dude. In dead silence, bro. Put that guy in front of literally anyone and tell me that he's that's actually I mean. going to do it, bro. He's a, you can't, you can't use him as an example of someone that's good yeah, at it if he's literally more, never yeah. done it in the history of his career, bro. What you say in private is completely different to what you're willing to say yeah. in public. The vast majority okay. of people are willing to shit talk about everyone, but nobody's willing to do it in public. You know, No one will get on the podcast and say, Capitology, you are a fucking client of the highest order. You know, like Most people are too afraid to say that because they're scared about what people are going to think of them on the internet but the reality is you're a fucking client you know and if you're scared to say that you too are a client you know like that's the, that's the reality and, and kevster is unfortunately a client too because yeah, kev, kev are, is yeah. better than everyone mm. kev is so fucking good at overwatch that he has the most justifiable ego ever and he's only willing to let it out in private bro do you know how funny kevster would be if he was just shit talking everyone that he wins a tracer duel versed like Come on. Yeah, it's true. It's true, actually. I take it back. Kev, you're a fucking pussy. Say it on a tweet That's or better. on Thank broadcast. You. And then I'll fucking respect you. But yeah, yeah. No, I think I think this is it. Like, I think... And if, maybe if there's more, like, back and forths on, like, fucking Twitter or in interviews or whatever, then then maybe we need it's, to do like, uncoachable. We have, like, a 1v1. We, like, do a match preview and we get them on in these fucking shit It's It's weird know? with players. I, I have a funny feeling that if Kev actually did that in an official broadcast, official, like, actual match... The, the fans were like, oh my god, Kevis is really toxic. And they just start like, man, what? Because here's the thing, it's like, cares, though? Like, <laughs> but it's for it's, it's fun. fun. Okay. The it's, it's for reaction. As the Goomba, because the Goomba UB1 is like probably about as charged as it can be because of a Saudi Arabia element, as like by putting this on Reddit. But was the reaction on Reddit actually that bad to it? Like, I no, think no, actually, I, if you look at like the up, the comments that have been upvoted, right? Because obviously some people are always going to say fucking shit, but then the upvotes are going to like swing it. But I feel like the reaction wasn't that bad in terms of like, people were like, no, nah, this is fun as fuck. Now I want to see this go on. Yeah. I want to see more of this. Well, I think, I think both sides interact in terms of like both the, the TM side and the, I was going to say end side is mainly, you know, Gumba, but like both sides, it's an actual interaction with two parties. And they both have haters on both ends. So there's an investment from everyone to like, you know, pick your side, whatever. I think if Kev did shit talk, he would need the other person to respond. And then it'll be fine, probably. I think a part of the problem though. Yeah, but if you antagonize them, maybe with this right, example you know? though, this was like this is like Hitler versus Gaddafi or something, you know? It's like <laughs> one of the most hated coaches ever versus a Saudi Arabian team. So it's like a it's a really difficult comparison. It's like imagine 
if one party was Hitler and the other was Rack Attack, you know, like it's a really nice guy. Like a better example would be like <laughs> when um when 2019. I love bringing it back to 2019 Atlanta. There's always a reference. It should be a new thing in the comments. When did Anta talk about that? But um <laughs> when when in 20 uh 2021 Atlanta when we did the no cap on Kings Road versus London Spitfire. I know someone here Classic. would remember that moment. Classic. <laughs> that was probably pretty poorly received because, you know, it was a little bit toxic to go up against the like, oh, and fucking 15 team or something and then just disrespect them so violently that you refuse to cap the objective and just keep killing them over and over again. But it's like, that's probably a better example. You look at the public I reception to that and think like, that's what you might see if people are actually toxic and punching down, you know? Because you, you, if, if it's Hitler and Gaddafi, it's, it's a bit more neutral. The best part about that was, I think it was the year after, and I think London beat beat Atlanta. Might, I don't know what what year it was. London finally what? beats Atlanta. Someone got to talk Hardy, to Master. Then, it's not coming home. Yeah. Yes, and the Hardy yeah. says, Master, Master, it is. It actually is coming but, home. What's not? Whatever he said something. That's the thing, then, right? But that's that, fun. That, that's fun. It's, it's a good, good it's, moment. It's, it's, cash line, that's good. Rivalry. It's good because Hardy got to cash it in. No, but it's it's yeah. good generally because that drummed up a bunch of it drummed up like news the, articles about London it thing. happening. You know, it creates a rivalry. It creates interest. People hate. It is, it's good. I agree. You know? I agree. Like it is good. everything about that. That's why people watch sports. They want a bad guy and a good guy. They want something to root for. Nobody wants to root for rack attack v rack attack. You know, because you know what <laughs> rack attack is <laughs> fucking boring. You know, nobody wants a nice guy. Everyone wants a villain. Poor son. Yeah, genuinely. Like you don't want people on the fence. You want someone fun and a villain. You want fucking clients versus cool people, something like that. You know, you just, you can't have two boring parties just nicing each other to death. That's why you need card where everyone's, everyone's yeah, just, I every agree. single party is yeah. evil and just bad. It's just fucking shit yeah. on each other. There you go. It, once yep. it gets normalized as well, like once more people do it and see like, oh, the reaction isn't like maybe what they'd be worried about from like Overwatch League or Blizzard finding them or whatever, then it opens the door for everyone to do it more as well. Like I think there's like a, What's the word? Like a leap of yeah. faith type thing. And I think hopefully but like definitely... some of the ones we've seen this weekend, the reaction's really not been that bad. I don't think anyone should be worried about from um, any of it really. On the broadcast side though, I don't I don't think they'll encourage it. I don't know. Maybe they'll maybe maybe on the desk or somewhere where they'll say, like, yeah, well, it was really interesting. The Swiss, you know, twisted minds and ants. They had a bit of a bank for this, you know, we'll see how they go when they eventually meet up. So that'd be nice for the broadcast. Um did you guys, was there anything else we, we should talk about on the broadcast side? I mean, there's there's a couple of things just like to go back a little bit, just because, you know, while I'm here, we were like sort of still on topic. Like, if you do compare the broadcast to the esports, I sort of get Gumba's other points as well. Like, he brought up VCT, which is like, I think VCT has improved a lot. Like, early Valorant casting, and I would know I, I was fucking there, so I saw some of the other people there. You know, it was a it was a slugfest, man. There was, there was, Few very good casters and a lot of people that shouldn't have been on the broadcast, in my opinion. Um, you talk about like I can't remember who brought this up, meritocracy and this type of thing as well. Like this, this is maybe depending on who hears this, they'll either like really fucking agree with me or think I'm an asshole for saying this. But I don't think there's a lot of meritocracy in in esports in general. Um, like you can you can extrapolate that to the team side, where there's going to be a lot of there's just a lot of nepotism in the world, generally speaking. And it's, it's, you know, again, not from a place of malice. I think people just want to take the path of least resistance. But you have to consider the broadcast. There's very few spots, even when, like, you know, when the when the broadcast is big, there's still very few slots to actually get on the broadcast as a broadcast member. Um, and people will just go with what they know. And there's, there's a real issue with um, how the degree to which you know, it's sustainable for the people working in it. Like, where's this level of safety here? Where's the safety net? Because casting is, you know, I probably wouldn't recommend, as someone that's been through the journey, like to actually quote unquote make it, it's such an insane journey to try and get there. And then when you do get there, you can just get rug pulled so fucking easily. And you got like, realistically, nowhere else to, to go. Um, you can jump ship to another game if you want to, but that's, you know, you got to go through that process all over again. If you have enough clout, to, to make it there because you're you know if you're a, a extremely good and you're extremely well known then maybe you can just go straight onto the Valorant broadcast um and someone like uber who's extremely talented i think you know he's actually desired in that sort of way but you know i live in australia and compared to him i'm you know way more of a nobody and i've already been through the right thing and that was you know a whole experience on its own but like you know it's it's a limited number of positions to get on and it will usually go to the people that have already been there um you know i was being 
potentially courted to get on Overwatch League as early as season three. Like, you know, I was talking to Monty and Dale behind the scenes, like season two, and they were trying to pitch me into the Overwatch League um, season two offseason to try and get me on for season three. And it didn't end up going through. And then the whole COVID thing happened anyway. But like, there's just no space, man. Like, people need to leave. People need to like quit their job or get fired or like a broadcast space just open up where they expand their broadcast for new people to even get on. So I didn't even get on to Overwatch League till season four when Wolf ended up, um, you know, he he ended up starting, he started LCK and Blizzard weren't particularly, you know, keen on that. So his position became available. Then I ended up coming in um, to essentially take his spot, so to speak. And so, you know, and if that didn't happen, who knows? I don't know if I would have made the broadcast. I don't know what would have, what would have happened. I might have just had to leave esports or keep doing contenders for low pay. Who knows? Um and then you get the question of like, well, who gets to make the decisions and how do they make the decisions? And this is even even specific to Overwatch, because to be fair with you, I think I've had a pretty good run with Blizzard and they treated me well. But across my time in esports on the broadcast side, like 10 years now, basically, most of it professional and paid. Some of it was quite amateur. But some of the people in charge over esports in general, in terms of their decision making for how they acquire talent, who they think is good. It's just shocking. It's like really fucking shocking. Um, some of these people are not, they have no clue how to select for talent. They, and this is like, I think the pe I think that my colleagues at talent will actually mostly agree with this. There's been very few good talent managers I've worked with and many, many talent managers I've worked with who are just fucking garbage. Um, even in Overwatch League, there was a transitionary period where someone who was the t main talent manager who like did all the negotiations and managed talent for a while ended up being like, uh, I think promoted to another position or got offered another position which they took and then there was a transitionary period where they had to replace this person um i don't know if it, it must have been difficult to find a replacement because the person they ended up getting didn't even want the job they just kind of got thrown into the role because they needed someone urgently and this person probably just reluctantly accepted it clearly had no interest in doing the job had no idea what they were doing because they had zero experience in the background to be fair most of the talent job managers have no experience in the background either, but this person just like no experience, didn't care, didn't know what they were doing, were there for like a few months, and then finally they left to go to wherever else they actually wanted to go, and then we got a good manager in. So the last manager we did have in Overwatch League was pretty good, but the transitionary person in between like our last guy and the you know the the one before that, the one in the middle was fucking shocking because they just didn't even want the job. Like and that it just happens. Like that's just esports. You just get someone in there who ends up in a, in a decision-making position who has no fucking clue what they're doing. They don't even want to be there, and they don't, you know, they they don't want anything to do with it. And they are, they they are the decision makers. And to make it or break into esports, especially on the talent side, you end up just having to like impress one person. And if they don't like you for whatever reason, you just don't you just can't work in that esport from now on. And because it's like all esports is monopolized, it's not like you can just go work on a rival broadcast doing Overwatch. It's like, no, it's here's your one professional Overwatch broadcast. You can't get on this. You just can't do this game ever. And that apply that now to every single game that exists. If the v, if the Valorant people don't like you, you you just, we would just simply never get on Valorant. You're done. That's it. So it's yeah. pretty fucking shocking out there. That's how talent decision ends up getting made. Sometimes they get it right. Or sometimes they get it really fucking wrong. And most of the time, the person who makes the decision has no clue. I mean, look at look at WDG in Asia, right? Like the um. The broadcast you know they're covering heaps like from a production standpoint it's really good right like they have a studio they have like lots of different games that they're covering all the time but like look at their talent selection for the english broadcast you know like if you're telling me that that's the best they could come up with then it's like like where are you in that broadcast not to like just wank you off in front of everyone right now but you know like what what are you doing co-streaming the games when i have a controversial you... opinion on that all right well let's hear it then you know i don't they even did, need to shit on hex they did get the best people they could get Within the within the constraints which they put out for themselves, which were their own constraints, and the constraints they put out was be in Korea, physically live in Korea, and have have legally be able to work in Korea, and then after that, ideally fit within our budget, which is not a very large budget. So is Hex in Korea? Uh, Hex is not in Korea. No. So you guys have you guys have caught on to the the most important part about this, which is like, well, hang on, Hex isn't even in Korea. So what the fuck happened there? And um, yeah, I mean, my my whole situation was like. I think I was one of the first people. I, I I got I got I was in the know about 2024 pretty early on. Like, you know, I I had a good idea of what the 2024 system was going to look like as early as like playoffs last year. You know, a, a fairly good idea of what was happening the, the following year. And I thought I was all going to be all good because I was already being approached. Um, 
you know, I was already like going to be in a position where I was going to get hired. Things were all good. I wasn't too worried. And then as time went on, like what was going to happen in 2024 and what the offer was going to be just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse to the point where like, oh, you know, this is just, this is extremely difficult now. And I'm now negotiating for a fill-in role only. So the the hex role, we'll call it, the, the reason it even exists is because multiple people on the Asia broadcast have other commitments and um, there's seven broadcasts a week and they just obviously can't make all the games. So that's why there's a shit ton of casters on, on the Asia broadcast because there's seven broadcasts a week. Um, and even with all the talent they could get in Korea, there's not enough talent in Korea to fill all the positions. So they had to then get another person online just to fill the gaps. So that was what I was aiming for, which is not a very good position, to be honest with you. Even if I got it, I don't know that it would have been very satisfying. I would have covered as many games as Hex has covered so far this this year, which is not a lot. Um, and I would have been done. I would have been doing it with my green screen, which is better than Hex's. But like you know, the it's, it's still a fucking green screen at the end of the I day. I was I'm just not, about to say people. your green screen is so much better than his, dude. Like honestly, like it's if lighting. Green the trick screen, is lighting. Lighting. If you're in a, good a green camera. screen measuring competition, I feel like you blow him out of the fucking water. But as established broadcast talent for you know, I want to say like five plus years, I feel like he should also be able to set up his green screen to the point that it doesn't clip through half of his haircut. But you know, um, I'm also on the better time zone, which helps as well. And I like I I imagine I actually had the better relationship, although that didn't end up counting for much at the end of the day. Um, I don't know. To to me, I thought we were continuing the conversation in terms of the negotiation, but they kind of like left me cold after a little bit. And then later on, I just find out through the talent announcement that Hex got. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I got outbid for the position. Um, I don't. The reason I don't feel that bad about it because the position is not that. I mean, I mean, if you look at the amount of games that Hex is getting, it's not a lot to begin with. And the the you would you, especially scraps, man, like. Um, and he knows this is not even like a thing against Hex and Hex, Hex will be listening to this anyway. And th this is just me being objective about the facts here is the position that he ended up getting is to cast very few games to cover for other people for unfortunately, like, you know, there's not a lot of budget. So the rate's not amazing. And um, they already didn't want to take the rate, which I was offering, which was already below what I really want. Like it was a pretty, pretty low rate in my opinion, but I was trying to negotiate for other things. Like maybe they could bring me to land, maybe the X, X or Y or Z or other things. Then finding out like they're not even going to pay for like Australian players to go to land in terms of the entire cost. It's like okay, well, obviously they're not going to fucking pay it for me to go to land if they're not going to even do that for players. So, um, yeah, I guess I just they just they went for an option that was going to be more friendly to their budget. Let's say. Do you think the future then for the WDG broadcast is that inevitably people like Hex or you know Hex specifically is going to wind up out of a job because they're going to find basically like another person like G Clef, you know, someone that is like you know bilingual. Um, or, you know, like, yeah, well, someone that's bilingual that can actually go to the studio. Do you think that, like, the online position will just get deleted in favor of someone that can actually be there? Because you said be that, like, he's a filler, but, you know, it'd be better if the filler could be there too, right? It'll it'll be deleted if they can get the current people there to work more of the days. Um, but, like, if, you, if you're saying, oh, could they get another person in Korea physically to replace Hex? My answer would be no, and that the reason for that is because of price reason. The guy in Korea will probably ask for more. Oh, or maybe yeah, he won't. I, I maybe, guess. maybe, maybe, maybe they'll throw Krusty on next split, and he'll he'll fucking do. I it just mean, it's like you know, you know, fried fried Wien has been in Korea for you know the past year. You know, he could just tap into the broadcast and do a better job than anyone else. But like, there. But, like, but we are we are cheapening the we are cheapening like both rates and and broadcast quality a lot now. Like, I do agree to the sense that like for a tier one broadcast, so this is what like this is what tier one of watch looks like now, fellas. It's not the most ideal. Like WDG have nailed a bunch of things, and I have to give them credit for nailing a bunch of things, especially on a limited budget. We discussed those. Yeah. But um, it's is it is it ideal that nine K and G Clef? Okay, they're bilingual, but like G Clef has got better English than nine K with with Queer Clay. But nine K is his biggest weakness is that his English is just poor. And some people will cope and be like, oh no, it's fine. It's like, okay, there's a difference between fine and like broadcast standard. If if you if you were to really, and I'm not like I I I know nine K. We've talked and like. You know, I'd like to think we're friendly. I don't, I don't know what he thinks of me or anything like that. I'm not like trying to even shit talk him. This is where I have to be put out the disclaimer that like this, this is not me having any personal issue with anybody. But like, if we're just going to be objective about it in an ideal scenario, you'd get someone who is fluent. Like, if you're bilingual, you shouldn't be like, you should be, you should be like, um, actually fluent in both languages, not like conversationally in one. And G Clef is like, while better than 9K, is still not in an ideal position. In terms of like 
actual English mastery. Like I, I pride myself. Like, and I think every cast. If you look at the Ubers, or if you actually want to look at what like the best talent are, um, you know, having a mastery over the English language for an English broadcast would be ideal. It's like the situation's like I'm not gonna do. I, I can speak Chinese Mandarin above conversationally, uh, but below below fluent, and I would not be confident to jump on a Mandarin Chinese broadcast for commentary. And at one point, they even they being like. The Billy Billy broadcast offered to like you know do you want to do a guest spot? I'd be like oh man, my Chinese is like probably not quite up to speed. I feel like my I wouldn't be doing you know the just service to the product in terms of like the quality I'd bring. I feel like the quality I'd bring was pretty be, be like below par, subpar. But you know we have worse than that now on WDG's broadcast, unfortunately, in terms of like actual language ability. So they've had to really look for alternative options, and they targeted prioritized people that lived in korea and this is this is uh this is where we are so you know i don't have right. anything against the specific people but it's probably not the the best possible no but it's surely just a massively limiting factor right right because the reason they've had to go to like wolf and achilleos is because obviously they are probably the best people for the job but they're probably the only people in that position who live in korea Right, like also by, by fluent saying English you want, and no Overwatch. Well, exactly. You want fluent English people who live in Korea, and I mean to be fair, there is like history of this, right? I think Monte Cristo and Doa obviously lived in Korea, right, for long periods of time when they casted League. Monty lives there now, we, actually. Monty could do it oh, right okay. now. He actually lives in Korea today. But like, um, same with like Tasteless and Artosis, both went to live in Korea when they covered all the GSL mm -hmm. stuff. I don't know if they still live that, but still, like, so there is a precedent. But I feel like it's just so limiting in terms of your options. All of a sudden, if you're just going to say you have to live in Korea. But also, it's going to be poor money. So, who is really uprooting their life and moving to Korea for that opportunity? I mean, I, I, I would uproot my life and move to Korea, but I can't. It's not up to me. This is the thing that people don't understand: is that people, people who have never tried to immigrate, don't know about this thing called immigration, where like to legally uproot yourself and move to another country to work there legally, you have to, you have to get the right visa. You have to probably be sponsored by a company. You have to already have a fucking job. You can't just go there and be like, hey, can I have a job? No, you're on, you're a tourist. You're on a to fucking tourist visa. No, you can't have a job. Legally, you cannot be hired. And for a place like Korea, I don't I don't know if this is true for the US, but in a place like Korea, it's not even about getting a working visa. You have to have the correct category of visa because guess what? If you want to go there and be an English teacher, you can't just decide to be a caster the next day because your visa says you can only be an English teacher. Right, you have to get a different visa if you want to do entertainment works called, called an entertainment visa. So you, it's, it's the, the process is so limiting that literally I could not choose to do this if I wanted to. If I decide tomorrow I want to throw all my money in, I could not choose to do this. I would have to be sponsored for a visa, and they would have to help me, and they would have to put up some level of cost to invest in me to get me over there. So it's like this is this is. The same would be true if I was to go to America. This is part of the reason why I didn't get to do any of the NA based, like well, the US based lands. I didn't do playoffs twenty twenty two. Um, I didn't get to do any any sort of event that would have been a land in the US because I didn't have a US visa and Blizzard had no interest in giving me a US visa. To be fair, I was the APAC guy anyway, so it was like, well, what are you really bringing me over for? For playoffs, it would have been nice, but I don't think they were interested in giving a visa just to come over for playoffs. So whatever, and that's why. The one time they got all the talent together was in Canada. Why? Because it was easier visa wise. From a visa perspective, immigration is way easier in Canada. That's also why M80 are getting their NA play their Korean players to go over there and say so this is why Toronto Defiant can get Korean players over to Toronto in like three days instead of fucking three months. Because the immigration process in Canada Canada is just that much easier. So I wonder um, I wonder if ex Oblivioni are listening to this with the Koreans they were hoping to <laughs> stuff into somebody's basement. Yeah. <laughs> um but this is the thing. I was like, I'm, I, me, and every other Australian caster is literally limited by geography. Like, B, I was to be fair, I grew up in New Zealand, but like, grow up in the wrong country, live in the wrong country. Your parents decide to bring you up in the wrong country. GG, you just get un unlucky in life, I guess, and you can't, you know, work in other countries because of visa situations. Even if it wasn't visas, flight costs as well. I mean, I got, I got region locked by Riot out of Valorant. That's why I got killed in Valorant because they region locked me out. Because they just didn't want to have to deal with someone who lived in Australia when they could just get domestic people who lived in NA or whatever. Even though Riot then turned around and changed those rules and, you know, rolled out the red car for, for an Australian person right after I, I got booted anyway. But, you know, that's just inconsistencies in, in uh, how talent managers and exterior broadcasts do things. So that's just the life of uh, esports right there. But um, yeah, super limiting logistics. 
Yeah, I mean, what you really should have done is you should have moved to the US as quickly as possible and found yourself someone to marry so that you get yourself a green card and actually work as quickly as possible. Because I, I think the a lot first of these step are- is impossible. The first step is the part that I couldn't do, Max. Go, so. go, on, a, go on a tourist visa and marry on that, mate. Come on, you can figure it out. That's true. If I went on a tourist visa and just like went into a Vegas chapel, go to Vegas, a Vegas chapel and just get it done overnight. Yeah, no, genuinely, you, you could have figured it out. <laughs> so yeah. it's just a question of how committed you were and you, you didn't have it in you. Yeah, I actually was. I actually paid my own way to go to 22, 22 playoffs to just have fun there, and I didn't get married in, in the in the one week that I was there. So that's a little ah. disappointing. And I that's why you were not on the twenty three VCT broadcast. But I'll tell you, you what, too like, scared to put a ring on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, being physically on the location matters a lot. So you know, this is why, like, I think last week, uh, not last week, just two episodes ago, when X, you said you actually put in a resume to potentially cast it. That actually surprised me. I didn't know um, you were. Are you actually trying to go down that pathway? Or was you just kind of curious? You were just like kind of dipping a toe in. Oh, literally, take work for money. Um, but castings, <laughs> castings, castings, always something I've enjoyed. Like before, I was a coach. I cast in TF2. Some of my best memories were casting TF2 lands. Uh, best experiences in esports. So I'm like really, really, really happy to go down it. Um, so I sent over all my work examples, all my old casts, some of the ones I've done more recently. Um, I was really keen to, because I figured most of the broadcast would be like remote anyway. Um, and I know they have people in the studio, but obviously like Mr. X and stuff, like yeah, I was going to, I was going to say phones are in, but there's a, there's a joke in there somewhere. Um, but <laughs> pe- people call yeah. him remotely. Right. So I was yeah. like, I can do yeah. that. I can get whatever stuff needed to make it look like and get some green screen tips from some people and get it set up. But I, I literally just never heard back. Yeah. I think like, your position from being outside of NA, despite we, yeah, I think you guys actually brought this up. There's no, there's no European people working on that uh, broadcast, despite it being Europe. So first of all, they're going to favor the people in NA. There might be something there in terms of like a US based company paying people in the US. I don't know if that's a factor at all, but you have that. You have on top of they, they want to do studio, so they're going to probably favor people in studio. And for that reason, I was actually surprised they didn't go straight for Custer, given that he lives in LA and can go to the studio. Uh, but beyond that. I mean, there are. This is where you get to talk about established. There are established talent that already work that, and some of which have already missed out. I mean, you've even you got even guys like Leg Day who, like, he lives in the UK as well, worked on Owl, and he is not going to get hired for that broadcast either. Um, when there's so few limited positions for that broadcast, it's just like it's going to be extremely hard to go down that pathway. But it's tough, man. Like, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't recommend going unless like you actually just they just pick you up for some reason but someone to actually grind especially out of nowhere to try and be casting like now right now in 2024 is like the worst time ever to be a new caster an unestablished caster trying to break in it's just fucking it's it's really fucking difficult and i i have very little interest in doing that again in, in, in a different game I don't, I don't think that this is something that's exclusive to casters though to be honest i mean i i want you to think back to like the origins of like Overwatch League and Overwatch esports. Like, do you remember like that Crusher 99 commercial, you know? Like they yeah. were really, they were really trying to like, seriously, they were really trying to legitimize the idea that you could play this game and make it a career, you know? Like you can start up and your aspiration can be, I'm going to be that guy on the big stage, you know? The big stage simply doesn't exist anymore. You know, you skip five, six years into the future and you look at the state of this game specifically, but esports as a whole. It's an anemic yep. industry, right? It's something where you said yourself, Riot, and every esports, you know, every publisher that has like esports as a focus, they're losing money, right? They're setting money on fire. Five, six years ago, that's not what people viewed esports to be. People thought five years down the line, it would be bigger, that there would be more money than what there is before, that it was going to be a short term loss for a long term gain. But what it's turned out to be is a short term loss into a further short-term loss, into a further short-term loss. And never have we reached the point of profitability. And you'll see different publishers and stuff come out with different blog posts about how they're shifting their focus, how they're changing this, that, and the other. But nobody has cracked it yet, right? Like there is no profitability. So I think that like you can talk about how I wouldn't recommend getting into casting, right? I wouldn't recommend getting into broadcast talent because it's a really anemic industry or whatever. Like there's a reduction in the number of people that can work. There's all these conditions. But the reality is that like any of us, even someone like you, like th- that you can continue to derive income from this game in any way. It's honestly a privileged position, you know, like one of the lucky few us, like yep. everyone in this call is in like a relatively privileged position that we can sit around and do something video game adjacent that isn't making a video game and we can still make some money because at the end of the day, this is an industry that's just doing nothing but losing money. So I think we're actually all quite lucky to be earning anything. 
Admittedly, it's a lot worse than what I it think was before, some, but yeah. I, I think some esports lose less money than others, and I think some esports also lose money in smart ways that they can recoup in other ways. So if you're Counter Strike or your League of Legends, or whatever, you can sell skins, and you know this is this is where you get to look at the the, the sticker sales for a major in Counter Strike. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're making a hundred million dollars off sticker sales or whatever. That's boosted by the fact that you can gamble with this shit and, and you can sell this stuff for actual money. So the MTX oh, sure. is sure. actually valuable. But then you know I don't know, Riot then are somehow making some amount of money back through MTX. They wouldn't be setting money on fight. They wouldn't be setting the money on fire for esports if they weren't making it back in some way through marketing. Um, through through marketing for for the MTX or for their general games, so yeah, you know, no. companies also aren't stupid I, I, in that way. I I read an article the other day that said I don't know how fucking true it is, but it looked like it was from like a non like a serious source. And it said something like forty percent of people who got into League of Legends in the last five years got into it because they saw the esport, like they saw the stadiums, they saw this, and they thought it looked really fucking cool. So if that's true, then that's just like an unbelievable win for their like esports division, right? If thanks. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is like um, you, you need this like big cool factor that the big daddy Riot or Blizzard or Ubisoft or whoever has to come in and make that happen. Like you know, and yeah. DreamHack better be fucking cool. Or I I have my doubts, but it better be fucking cool. Otherwise, you know, we, we're not going to have that either. You need that cool factor. Because unfortunately, it's all every bit of an optic space world. It's just how does it look? You know, no one cares how much money you spend. Does it look good or not? Is it cool or not? Do I want to be part of this or not? Is it a cultural thing that I want to be part of? You know, and that's what people want to get behind. Um. That's that's esports is is Ryder using it for marketing and it's effective for them currently. Yeah, I, I don't mean to defend how Blizzard is approaching esports because I think everyone knows that it's been like an absolute fucking disaster from almost every aspect. And the way that you know companies like Riot consistently seem to do it better, involve teams, make it profitable for more people. Um, like obviously that's better. It, the problem is that you need leadership that really believes in the product. You know, you need leadership mm -hmm. that believes that if they put money into it, they're going to get something out of it. But the way that Blizzard went about it, it was like you know. If we scam people into putting money into it, then my friends can make some money. You know, it was like the Bobby Kotick, like scamming people into investing in Overwatch League. That was the whole product for so long. And now we've been kicked along the road to Microsoft, a company that historically does not believe in esports whatsoever and doesn't really care about this sort of stuff, you know? So I think that the direction that we're in right now, it's a result of what, what did Kamala Harris say, you know, it's, it's the context of what came before us, you know? Um, <laughs> all all <laughs> esports is something, something about a coconut. Something about a coconut, you know. Oh. Um, but, but yeah, like overall, we're in this position because the esport has been fucked for six years previously, and now the people that control us are someone that historically doesn't give a fuck about it. But, I, just I mean, that's true. Generally that, speaking, because Microsoft do invest. Microsoft do invest a bit in Halo, right? They provide skins for the teams, and they provide like two majors a year. I'm not saying it's like the fucking holy grail. But it's something, right? You, you guys, like a, I think you guys are. I think you guys right. are overestimating. You guys are overestimating Sorry. like Microsoft's input here. I think Microsoft are a pretty hands-off company that will let Blizzard and Activision do their thing. And you know, it's not coming out of Microsoft's budget for esports. It's still Blizzard's budget. At the Microsoft end of the day. is the reason everyone got fired at Blizzard that manages esports. Uh, is it? I I don't know that to be a one hundred percent fact, but I know like you know certain people will get fired for like if we just talk about layoffs in general. Um, you don't. You're gonna have two accounting teams. Blizzard don't need their own accounting team. When like Blizzard, when Microsoft have their own, and then you have you know dead projects for like whatever the survival game is. You're gonna lose all your developers from that. Blizzard are no longer interested in doing PV. You're not gonna hold on to developers for PV for no reason. So yeah, people got fired for all sorts of reasons. I don't know about esports. I think Blizzard want to be pretty hands off with esports in general, based on the direction things are going. They want face it, WDG to handle it, and Blizzard will slowly just back themselves off. Um, so that's where that seems to be. Um, yeah, I just, I just mean decisions to outsource, like those are top-down decisions, you know, to remove entire departments and yeah, outsource them uh, to another company. That must come from. I don't think ownership. that's Microsoft. I think that look that to me comes from Blizzard. To me, I, I don't think that's Microsoft. That's that's like, you know, not even Overwatch. It's like Blizzard, Blizzard leadership, their executive team, not Microsoft. Um, they just kind of want to exit esports, but um, industry like a wide, you know, I think I'll just say like I don't know if we want to move on from casting or not. I feel like that was like part of the reason I was on to just like kind of talk about it, but I'll just say this so maybe we can like talk about something else because I feel like we are it's like slowly trying to drift away from casting a little bit here. But I think one of the other things that was mentioned about casting on that episode was something along the lines of like, you know, um, I guess we kind of, you guys kind of brought this up when I skirt around. It's like, it is, do we have people on the, should, okay, should, should the broadcast try and improve? And I think the broad answer is yes, right? I think everyone should agree 
that the broadcast should always seek to improve where it can. I think that should be a pretty easy yes from like just about anyone, viewers included, people that work on the broadcast included. Um, we have a bit of a hard time like defining what better is, and and beyond that as well. I, me personally, I think the broadcast is better when people have a better understanding of the game and can like you know be more able to be more able to vocalize ideally complex topics or like not even that complex but like what the teams are actually doing at a competitive level to be able to disseminate that to viewers and i think that's generally what at least the vocal viewers in any esport like and when i look at games like league of legends one of the big names that went through that system was Cadrill, and he was like an ex-pro you guys might know him. he's now like a, a co-streamer for the games he quit casting the co-streamer because he gets so much viewership he's like a Tarek for league of legends right he went through the entire like league of legends system and was super liked by basically all the fans and everything because he was just a super knowledgeable guy and so i think there definitely is um a want for that and i overwatch over the years has been pretty weak in that kind of regard um i have a theory that just first of all overwatch is a pretty tough game it's a very tough game to both cast and analyze i don't know if any of you guys have tried other games but like i've I've dipped my toe into Valorant, and I think Overwatch is still, like, generally speaking, a more complex game, although Valorant's, like, complex in other ways. Valorant is simply, definitely easy to cast compared to Overwatch, having done both. Um, so we, it's, it's like, already hard to get good people with analytical knowledge in Overwatch, and then beyond that, the people that do have good analytical knowledge, we haven't been able to transfer that into talent in terms of, like, usually where you get good analytical minds in broadcast talent is they're ex-pros, ex-coaches, or just some nerd like me who's, like, super invested and for some reason knows the shit. Um, and maybe on the Overwatch side, like we just haven't been able to get that talent in the outside of like Jake and Custer, who are naturally pretty gifted speaking and camera wise. I feel like most players are just not, you know, they're like the Kevsters. Maybe that's an extreme example. But, like they're just not good at talking. They're just not sure. good on broadcast. Right. We, yeah. I think the broadcast tested Dante a little bit. And he's like, okay, but he's a little awkward on broadcast. Probably like would, would, would need it. This is not to shit talk Dante, but he would need a Chit lot of work Dante. on broadcast. He would need a lot of work on broadcast to, to make it work. And uh, I think that's I just the majority of Overwatch players. The majority of Overwatch players just don't seem suitable for broadcast for some reason. I don't shit Isn't that easier? My teams. <clears throat> but it, 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 surely it's easier to pick up the broadcast skills than it is to learn Overwatch. If you know what I, I mean. I think that's, um, that's wrong. That's that, so wrong. Is that incorrect? You don't, you don't learn a personality. You need res yeah. to do broadcast. It's like built in. Either you're charismatic and well spoken or you're not. You know, you can improve upon these skills, yeah. but like to some extent, like they're not just going to find some turbo autistic gamer that can't string a sentence together and has no social skills. Uh, not, not like pointing any fingers, but just like your average like video gaming pro and bang them on the broadcast and be like, yeah, we're going to teach you the ropes of how to not have crippling yeah, autism. It is. It's like, that's not, that's not yeah, what that's yeah, Of course, but I'm not saying like, extreme, you don't need, you don't need <laughs> millions, right? You don't need hundreds. You just need like two. <laughs> well then, you right? know, that's, that's like, where, that's where yeah, Jake comes right. in, you know, like you just get, you get yeah. just I mean, the right amount of it. The ideal broadcast is something like a counter, I don't know if you guys watch much Counter-Strike, but like a, a Counter-Strike, I feel like nails it pretty perfectly. You know, they got good yeah. tone. I mean, it's a pretty adult esport. And I think as an adult, I prefer an adult esport where then they, they can swear if they want to, but they're not going to be crass about it. They have like, they have bear and gambling sponsors, whatever. I'm not like pro bear and gambling, but they, they don't limit them. Gambling. They don't limit <laughs> themselves to what money is. It's, you know, it's kind of cringe yeah. when unfortunately Overwatch, OWCS has barely any money. They have zero sponsors outside of Samsung, Odyssey, and Korea, only for Korea, by the way. And then you look at the sponsor list for OWCS and it's still like, it, it bans like everything. And you, so it's like the, the sponsor list is so limiting and they have zero sponsors. Like guys, you, you guys can't like be this limiting when you have zero fucking sponsors. I'm sorry. Um, and then the talent beyond that as well. You have a lot of like ex, ex player talent in there. You, otherwise you just have like both really charismatic people and very knowledgeable people all wrapped in one. They somehow just found all of the, the best parts of like both those worlds merged together in, in their talent. Um, and so Counter Strike's kind of nailed in that way, and I think they're one of the few broadcasts that have like actually nailed talent. But maybe that's my preference as well because I, what I what I generally do to broadcast is probably my preference anyway. Because I mean, I, I'm I'm just biased for what I'm doing. I, I'm doing what I do on broadcast because that's what I like to do. Um, so that's my style, and I probably prefer that when I watch other broadcasts. So I have to check my own bias a little bit. I think I think it's not. Oh. I think it's not quite right to say that like it's not possible for Overwatch, you know? I think that if you had the right talent managers, if you had people that were trying to develop this, you would have it by now, you know? Like the fact that Baby Bay is on a broadcast, I get that he's a big streamer, 
But these personalities exist even in Overwatch, you know? I think someone like Gator would have been a really good example of someone that could have easily converted to like an, a genuinely like very, very good Overwatch personality on broadcast where they have like the, the basically they've got Possibly. it all, you know? They're, they're good looking, they have charisma, they're funny, and they understand Overwatch really, really well. Like they can actually check every box, not to fucking throw Blake's cock or anything like that. But like, you know, they, they can basically cover all bases. And if you had someone on the talent um on the talent development talent talent management side on broadcast at Blizzard that was just getting in the DMs of someone like that and being like hey you know like this could be an option for you like they go after Dante the fact that they go after Dante not to shit on Dante but that should be like a bit of an example of like how yeah. they don't really see all the people that are out there right because it's like everyone knows Dante's popular but you should also know if you watch Dante that he probably isn't going to be like the most amazing, like high energy host ever. You know what I mean? But there are people like that in the community, someone like Gator, where if you had the eye for it and if you had engagement in the community, you would know that that guy exists and that that guy could be a potential candidate for things like this. But unfortunately, yeah. nobody's there trying to develop that talent. So it never comes to fruition. You know, I don't I, even know if Gator's ever thought about it. I, I also think you- strike. Like the number of times on a Counter Strike broadcast, I will see just a coach or a player is just on the desk for a segment or makes an appearance, or maybe one team doesn't qualify for one of these major events. So immediately, the tournament organizers in the DMs of that coach, like, you ever can, you want to do some desk work for a I bit? Come on and come talk. Put them on the desk so they don't have to cast and have like the same amount of stress and like talent <sighs> talking requirement. Yeah. But, Where was that for me, dude? I could have gone to Toronto in 22 and we didn't make it. That would have been awesome. <laughs> oh. well, yeah, exactly. Like, it's like you said, it's like, Half of people on this call they got Hydron could have, could instead have of you. done it and would have done it. That's, that's what I mean. You know, why would you, get, why would you get Hydron? Well, I can see why you'd get Hydron, you know, yeah. but also <laughs> fucking idiots. So, so, so I think the difference there would be like, you have, a, you have, a, you have basically an eSport that's either ascending in terms of like money and popularity and status or, and, and whatever. And then you have an eSport that's kind of like on its last legs. It feels like it's going on the down to budgets going down every single year. You have an Overwatch, they're far less interested in discovering and, and, um, discovering and also just like supporting new talents try and train them up when you know the budget's going down every single year it feels like they're just trying to get through the year and like hope there's another year you know Overwatch is not in a space where it's like on an upwards trend unfortunately so i could see why they're not like particularly interested in trying to find new talent to develop when you know they're just trying to keep the thing floating um also there's there's this thing where because there's contenders talent that are existing they feel probably somewhat obligated to go for the contenders talent next because they've been like quote unquote waiting in line and there's a whole discussion around that whether like you know is that actually a good thing or not like on one hand it is because they, they are the actual talent they've come through your pipeline but on the other hand it's like but other people could actually be better who like a gator for example I actually agree maybe gator could have been really good if um if, if the esports was on an uptrend and we were these broadcast was seeking that kind of thing where they wanted to develop new people yeah like, I think at the end of the day, like, there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement, like, with what you said here, that it's, like, because we're on, like, a downward trend and there's, like, divestment year on year, stuff like that, it's really difficult to promote a lot of these initiatives, you know? And if no one is willing to take a risk on it and just put one of these people on the broadcast, you know, perhaps not super media trained or whatever, just throw them out there and take that risk, then inevitably you're just going to get the same people on there forever, you know, the establishment to draw it back to that. Or, you know, they'll look to those next in line people, you know, the people that have been grinding because, you know, those people to some extent feel entitled to the next opportunity and perhaps the talent managers, if they're the friends of those people, which I'm sure that they probably are at this point, you know, like the scene is so incestuous and small that the people doing the hiring are probably really well aware of those like, you know, tier two people that have been trying to work their way up. They probably feel some sense of obligation to give them the jobs as well. So what will wind up happening there is, you know, there's one or two years left of jobs before it all just collapses into nothing. And they're like, I'm going to give it to my friend rather than the guy that's better for the future of the product because there is no future for the product. You know, what's funny about what you say is like taking a risk on a new guy who's not media trained, has nothing developed. That's essentially what has happened in Asia though. But they've sort of had to do that on necessity because it's like those aren't, no those one aren't, available. Those aren't talent risks based on the fact that they could have a huge upside though. Like nobody's nobody's picking G Clef because of the huge upside in talent. Not not to shit on G Clef, you know, but like they're picking people that don't speak English because they're in Korea and they're cheap, you know, like there's a difference. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. But like but if, Yeah, they're not my biggest my biggest worry for the broadcast is that so far it's just felt pretty generic. Not necessarily in like a loads of huge problems or anything like this, but if we were in this no money, <laughs> no future situation, well, surely we might as well take risks, right? Because something, uh, something we might as well change things and play around more. Because if we just do something quite generic, that's not like a revival thing, you know? 
no, it's not like I said, they, to they're going down the path. They're going down the path of least resistance, which means taking a risk would be resistance, right? That's doing well, something exactly, different. Exactly. But my point is, yeah, yeah, but really, yeah. If the point is, you should take risks because it's fucked. If you just take the path of low least resistance, you're not changing the course. I think they would. I think. I think from their perspective, they don't think it's fucked. They probably don't think the broadcast is like an issue. And you guys, I'm not saying you guys aren't raising valid points. I'm not even saying I disagree necessarily. But from their perspective, they're being like, you know where the NA, where all the broadcasts are for OWCS, they probably don't see it as like that pressing of an issue, even though in an ideal world, everything should be striving to be the best it possibly can be. But I just get this weird feeling for OWCS and Overwatch Esports in general, where it's just like, they're just trying to get something done just so we can fucking get through the year and just like do this thing that is like, you know, let's just do this thing and just pray there's a next year kind of deal. Even though I think there will be a next, I'm pretty sure that, you know, we're going to have a couple of years of OWCS, but We'll see how it moves in the future. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of the big things like we talked about, and I'll probably feed into it, are the stuff like the player rivalries and the team rivalries. And maybe in that interest, we can we can change change gear and talk about our good friends, friends of a podcast, Ex Oblivion, and some of their failed Finally, roster Chris mania. Is. Chris has been Chris has been awaiting this one eagerly. So fill us in, Chris. What what did EXO do, and why did it why did it upset you so? <laughs> yeah, well, there's like there's obviously like there's a few angles to approach it from. I think that like I think my understanding of like the timeline is that I think we should start by saying this: there's a lot of clients involved in this situation. The Catalyst client, the CC, is the very first EFG admin that told Twisted Mind supposedly that they were allowed to sign players for. Um, from Korea who got knocked out of the, the stage one. That's like clearly where it all started. From what I understand from EXO, and the, the problem EXO I've got is okay. So after I got into my heated debate on Twitter, I, I also got into a two hour debate with their owner on Discord. We went fucking back and forth nonstop for two hours arguing. The problem is when I was talking to him, he I think is under the impression that his players are unbelievably lip sealed about everything that happens within the organization and they don't talk to other players who don't talk to other players who don't talk to me so they think that they have this like tight ship in exo and i'm just like guessing so some of this stuff i'm guessing but i'm guessing if you know what i mean um my understanding is they heard from tm one way or another that they were allowed to sign players they had obviously lost chase torch to gumba's revolution um they then contacted either spectra and or mag and said do you guys want to to come play for us my understanding is that within 12 hours, I heard even less from some of my reputable sources, within 12 hours of talking to said players, they did not check with admins. They read the rules, and we'll talk a lot about the rules in a second. They booked the flight, and then they, they, they tried to get them over. Who knows the legality of what they were doing, but that's not really my forte. And um, the reason that I was so fucking mad about this was this statement that they released was just unbelievably fucking like horse cock, you know? It was needlessly fucking emotional. I actually watched Plat Chat. I can't believe I'm admitting that to you guys on this podcast. I'm, I'm sorry, but I watched it. You make even, me sick. Even the establishment were all saying, yeah, Chris is probably right here. They were like unbelievably on the fence about it. They were like, oh, it's probably a little unprofessional. I think we were... Because that's I, fucking I fucking back. backed you, mate. What do you come on? Give me some credit. I, no, I saw everyone agreed me, but everyone was like, oh yeah, no one was ready to fucking go out and kill Exo the way that I am. Um, <laughs> but I feel like this was such an unprofessional statement, you know. Like we had these like situations where it was like, oh, they like did like a monologue for the first page of the statement about how great a guy Kev H is. I mean, I've spoken to Kev H, he's a great guy, but like a one-page monologue about it. And like, you know, one thing that the thing that really triggers me was they kept on saying that, oh, like these guys deserve a chance. Like Mag deserves a chance. Like someone should give him a chance. Like this guy hasn't had chances for four years. Like this guy didn't have a chance to fucking like play in Korea. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, and I think like the, the way they worded this was in a way, in my opinion, to fully manipulate the like the audience. Um, I want. I actually, I'm going to go out on a limb, and you guys can no comment your way through that section. But I also want to talk about some of the decisions that were made before this too, with like the with the World Cup and stuff. But my my feeling was this: that this was an org that had a lot of public support behind them, that in numerous times in their statement are attempting to tell Blizzard that they're happy to change the rule if Blizzard make it fair so their players can compete. But I fucking hated. I really, really fucking hated the disin disingenuity. That's a word for sure. Of like. 
the reason they were giving Mag and Spectre was to give them a chance, as opposed to this was just that they just wanted to fucking build the rest, best roster possible. If you want to give people a chance, give fucking Europeans a chance. You're in Europe. If Spectre came along, presumably this means that Cloud was yeah. getting shot in the back of the fucking head. So to give these guys a chance, they were also going to fucking kill one of their players that they fucking qualified. It's the big free, like the tournament before. Like it, all of this was like this, like fucking like virtuous like side of like we effectively didn't fully understand the rules we heard without content the i admins this thing we fucked up so did efg but we are morally in the right we are just trying to do the right thing by giving korean players a fucking chance to play in europe and kick cutting our own players and the rules should be changed and i'm looking at that thinking a the rule makes perfect fucking sense of course korean players who were able to qualify for this tournament career shouldn't be able to fucking take a spot from NOAU, and I just fucking hated the like the wording and like the emotion of it. So that's why, and it was fucking working too. You know, everyone on Reddit was like, "Oh, classic Blizzard killing their own game." Oh, when they will, when will they learn to do shit like this? So, like, if I didn't come in there and like attempt to give like a different perspective, then I think that they fucking get away with this shit and just everyone like keeps on Blizzard and shits on Blizzard. When in my opinion, the, the face at admin, okay, fucked up for sure, telling TM because they also didn't read yeah. the rules. But this is like a massive oversight from a, I guess, like a, a slightly professional organization here. I think, I think one of the fundamental problems is, is EXO's aim is to become a professional organization, right? To keep growing and going up until they can hopefully maybe establish themselves as, I guess, what you call like a real org. But this sort of statement, this sort of like emotional language just really works against that massively. So I think it's like a massive shot in the foot. I guess maybe like a good place to start is should we just start with the rule itself? Because a yeah. lot of EXO's complaints, if you take everything else away, the complaint was the rule's not fair. And these players, these poor Korean players are going to be left stranded with no tournament until August. So do we feel the rule is actually unfair as EXO claimed or is it just a reasonable rule? I think it's pretty reasonable, to be honest. Like it's basically the same as what happened in Overwatch League in the past where it's like, you know, I remember Decay got knocked out and then got traded over to Washington immediately and became their like keystone player and carried the tournament and got them through like way deeper than Washington otherwise would have gotten. And there should be some sort of roster continuity between tournaments. And there's a bit of a gray area in the sense that the APAC tournament cycle and the NA slash EU tournament cycle is a little bit different, you know? Like uh, Asia has one long tournament, Europe has a couple of shorter ones. But at the end of the day, it's like the Europe tournament and the NA tournament, like they overlap a lot. And if you get knocked out in like groups or something in, EU or NA, or if you get Swiss, which is basically the equivalent of what has happened to these players if they were to get knocked out really early, you'd be in the same position in NA or That's EU. All right. You would yeah. have nothing to play in. So I think the the notion that they're giving these like these poor guys have nothing to play in for a while, it's like, yeah, they have nothing to play in because they were dog shit and they got knocked out early in their tournament. That's how it works, you know? If you lose, That's you don't play as nice. much. Yeah. That's my guess played more like actual like best of five overwatches than any of the EU and MA. Like this, that he was playing like two or three games a week, right? So he's had plenty of opportunities to prove himself to earn it. Yeah. Also, also really, just the just the play that they're talking the about as if they're these like these guys in particular are these like little yeah. hidden gems that need special treatment. Like Mag being one of. Did we talk about this last episode or was it just in private? Like might have been Q and A in private. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, Mag yeah, yeah. is genuinely yeah, yeah. one of the most terminally overrated dog shit overpaid players in the history of the Overwatch League. Like seriously, a hard Winston one trick that has year on year on year been mega overpaid, treated as this massive asset to his teams, and every every single year underperformed massively to treat that guy as this poor underprivileged dude that needs a shot playing in European contenders is just such a fucking insult to the viewer's intelligence, you know, to anyone who can see the depth of Mag's career and anyone who's an insider that knows how much that fucking dog shit player has been getting paid year on year on year. It's insane, right? Because Mag, he's genuinely like, he's been paid tier one salaries for the entire duration of his career, overhyped the whole time. And to act like now that he's losing in Korea because he sucks and he always loses, he's this underprivileged dude that needs a shot on EXO is such a fucking joke. Well, he was on Runaway as well, which is one of the better better positions to be in of the Korean teams, right? Like start start off a thing. If you said you got the Runaway spot, You'd probably be happy with that as one of the Korean players, you know, if you weren't like in the like the big dog, the Falcon style roster or the black one. Yeah. When I was talking to like the guy in DMs, I don't want to dox like the DMs because I think that's like a little bit disrespectful. But I said to him at some point, I said to him, listen, can you at least just fucking like cut the shit and just tell me that you only wanted to sign these guys 
like because like they were the like the best players. And even then he says to me, he says, bro, Mag is a good fucking kid. And I'm like, what the fuck are you saying to me, man? Like, what the fuck are you like? You guys are fucking deluded. Like, you're not f- you're killing clouds because Spectra's a good kid. Oh, fucking cloud a bit. Ah, oh, fair enough. Like these guys deserve like fucking. He's a good kid to be fair. <laughs> they, they fucking deserve <laughs> this. Is just, I'm gonna uh... fucking take take this you know and so the thing is mag is a good kid cloud is a piece of shit you know yeah that's, that's how it is <laughs> i mean we we hate virtue signaling here on uncoachable even <laughs> fucking I, hate. I mean i know chrissy you know he's our alt-right representative but i too <laughs> fucking despise virtue signaling and that whole exo <clears throat> announcement after they made a massive fucking critical error of just not checking with the admins and not doing their due diligence to make oh, really diligence rude. to make sure that they'll be okay in this situation, that they, the way that they try to weasel out of it afterwards by just aggressively virtue signaling to insinuate that they're giving an underprivileged group a shot at something that they otherwise wouldn't have is such a wank. Because players like Mag and Vigilante, is the other one Vigilante? Spectra. Ah, Spectra. Spectra. Spectra is another one who's actually had a pretty good shot on Toronto. But play, a player like Mag especially, not an underprivileged member of the community by any stretch. I will, I will say like the, the thing that I've seen that makes the most sense is there was there was like leaked DMs between um I think it might have been the X ex, XO CEO and the one of the main face it admins, not not the fucking intern that didn't know what he was talking about, that like basically just told Twisted Mind the wrong information. And in the in the leaked DMs, which has now been deleted, um the final message was something along the lines of like, you know, part of the reason why this rule exists is to prevent guys like Mag take an opportunity where other players who did better than Mag are basically punished because Mag essentially would have had a second opportunity to play in OWCS to make the major for Dallas compared to like, you know, for example, a dude on WAC or Yeti, Yeti where right? let's say they go into yeah, playoffs to get exactly. knocked out, they don't come top two and they can't go to Dallas. Well, well, they didn't get a chance to fucking just jump on to an EME or NA team last minute to try and get a second shot. So Mag actually gets rewarded for being eliminated early for, I guess, sucking. He gets rewarded for that, and he gets a second shot at making Dallas, which I don't think is fair at all. So that you know that was also a really like interesting and I think valid angle that I saw come through. Um, yeah, you just you don't you don't want another decay situ- situation, but you also then just don't want like plays being rewarded for being knocked out early in in, in Korea, who then gets a second shot elsewhere. You know, you don't want that. I think like this what he this whole statement was like trying to like nitpick the rules, right? Like that was like the idea was like it wasn't like they never attempted to take any of the rules in good faith or like clearly like just like like the, the rule that they harped on was this one where it's a team instead of player, right? And it's like if you read that rule, of course it doesn't mean team because teams are regional. Like Runaway couldn't just leave and join EU. Well, that's like well, left right good night. That. Left no right good night. The example of this rule actually being put into practice, where left right good night originally wanted to play in America because they were all based in America, and they said you cannot do that because you are all Europeans by right. the region locking rules. So therefore, you can't just compete in LA, LA or NA. Yeah. And then, like, what was, like, super disingenuous uh, on top of everything about the statement is, like, the rule that they're arguing is, like, this this team versus player rule, which I guess if you want to be a lawyer and you want to, like, interpret it how you want, okay, fair enough. But there is another rule, which I, like, tweeted, like, the 2.61 and 2.62, because, or whatever, I fucking love the rules. <laughs> like, these are so fucking concrete. And I think, A, that the ESL face admin should have just, if you just screenshot this, yeah. there's no argument, because this is a fucking kill shot. This rule, there is just, like, there was no way you can read this. And then there was like another tweet from someone. I put it in the in the chat from um like from one of their like social media, uh, Alex Yoshi. And they were basically like saying, oh, like it's insane that um like, there was this really ironic tweet like in this thread, and it says, like, it's insane that this roster lock that people are citing, people being me, 2.6 is some sort of justification when it's okay. When you look up the roster lock, you can't see it in the rules. Yiska did another tweet and he said it's in the fucking <laughs> rules like it's there you just need to look at it so there is this person who's like again like going through this like fine tooth comb through the rules and even then they just miss it it's in the rules you know and it's like okay it sucks that you heard from mm-hmm. from someone that an admin said this was okay but this is clearly in the rules in like if you'd read it, which I, they didn't, like, I, I'm so confident they just didn't fucking read the rules fully, you know? Like, I think what's happened is they thought this was okay, they went for it, and then, you know, the, in the thing it says, Kevich, out of courtesy, reached out to the admins. Oh, thank you, Mitch. Yes, I've just broken a rule, but out of courtesy, I'm going to let you know about it. Like, what the fuck is the wording on this? Um, and yeah, I know, I just, like, this whole thing was, like, so, they even did an apology yesterday, you know? And it's like, 
the most hard heart half hearted the player. Taking the responsibility. Like, yeah, we shouldn't have done we should have done better with the statement, but it was all fucking their fault as well, you know? And it's just, yeah, this whole thing was just like, TM's statement was so much more reasonable, you know? Like, okay, these are only the facts. This is what the admin told us, and this is why we're a bit pissed off, you know? No calls to change the rules and all of this shit. Um, so, yeah, that's why, like, that's why I felt like I had to tweet it, and I felt like they were, like, they were being super disingenuous with the statement and, and like, super, like, unprofessional and unfair with, with how they like, explain this, this situation. But I think as well, like, because XO obviously knew about these signings or their potential signings beforehand. And the XO guys were pretty excited. But at no point when any of the XO people spoke to me, was there any wording like, I can't wait to give these guys a shot. I can't wait for Spectre to get his shot. All of the wording was, we're, we're going to be top win. two. Top That's two it. for sure. Top two for sure. I was like, what? Because you're giving these players who deserve a shot a shot? No, we're just going to be top two because they're really good. You won't believe it. If it was Which fucking Gumba, Gumba would just say, yeah, I'm getting these because they're the fucking best players and I don't give a fuck. And I, I would be like, sound. That's it. Because I have Landon on my team. I could have given it to a European player. I took Landon because Landon's played the fucking best player for the position, right? Like, Crimzo is on... Like, everyone is, like, just doing that. But I will never pretend that I'm doing something for, like, the fucking European scene in this sense, you know? I'm doing it because I want to win. And I think if EXO had come out, like, fucking chest out and said, yeah, we're trying to win, we feel like these two players give us, like, the best roster possible, then what am I to say? I say, yeah, me too. I would have done the same thing. But it's the fucking virtue thing. It's the bullshit, which is what, like, fucking triggers the... The whole thing the stems meaning. of, like... No. <laughs> stems of not reading the rules then trying to correct it afterwards because I was on yeah. one of maybe it was the NA stage one finals I was doing the co-stream Goomba came on and we were talking about the rules and this situation comes up because we were exp obviously Goomba's always trying to figure out like could I kill someone and get someone better in could I kill multiple people and get multiple people better in and was trying to figure out well what are the roster lock rules for like could I poach a Korean for LAN or something now that could be cool right if I could get a, a Korean superstar in for LAN or something if they get eliminated like like just uh, raid for third place team for good players and then it was mm. like oh no we found oh the answer is no it's roster locked I go oh okay and that happened before Exa did any of, thing, any of this so the fact was the rules were quite plainly there to be seen and the only and the only reason they're in this big detailed argument of the wording and all of this, it's all just hindsight. They didn't read the fucking rules. They didn't check with anyone proper. Like, I, I do understand the frustration that you speak to you speak to the, the admin and he tells you, "Yeah, go for it, mate." So I can understand twisted minds a bit more, but also there's like a difference here between the type of thing they're trying to do and who they should speak to. Like, this is the sort of conversation you don't just want to speak to Billy Intern or whatever his name was. You want to speak to someone who actually has, like, someone who works for Blizzard, someone who works in the administration for OWCS, because this is, like, uh, a bigger thing you're trying to do. I will say that it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit difficult to get information out of these people sometimes when it comes to the tournament organizers, because, like, for instance, um, in my case, I'm, a, I, I'm like, also trying to, you, you know, try my luck with these rules, basically, because there's rules about players being locked, right? But I'm not a player. I'm a coach. I wanted to have a roster for OS Face It League and also for North American Face It League because I work for Luminosity. So I'm probably going to compete in North American Face It League. But at the same time, I also want to coach a team in OS Face It League because I can, right? And the rules don't say anything about coaches. So I asked someone at Face It about that and they said, absolutely fine. Put yourself on the roster. There's a coach slot. So it's totally fine. And they said, absolutely fine. Then there was all this exo drama. So I thought, geez, you know, one person from Face It has told me this is totally okay. Mm -hmm. So I should probably double check this with someone else. Then I went on to ask someone else and that person said, oh, probably not, but I'm going to have to escalate it, you know, because we need a proper ruling on this. So the first guy, he was happy to dish out an immediate, yes, totally fine. Second guy, much more hesitant. And in fact, he was leaning towards it's not possible. Um, so it's, it puts you in this really weird situation when you can you have like pretty easy access to people that are related to the tournament administration and they give you mixed responses. So I'm at least 1% sympathetic to that with the way that EXO, you know, might have been clowned a little bit by that. Genuinely, the, it, can, it can happen. 100%. At the same time, you know, you should also do your own due diligence before making signings, buying flights, stuff like that, you know, before committing to a decision like that. So you should definitely, you know, do your due diligence and ask as many people as possible to get, you know, the right, uh, the right Especially answer. Especially when there is clauses in the rules which directly, like, contradict what I'm saying, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like if the rule says, 
it imports a sound and then you ask an admin and they say imports a sound then fuck it that's like your due diligence but when there is like a like a, a clear r- rules against it and then you hear from one admin like there is like an element of experience here in terms of dealing with tournament admins where not every single tournament admin has read the fucking like handbook you know um and sometimes like i mean how many times have you done it you fucking call up some company because they've fucking your car's been stolen or something. I don't know. And you just get the feeling on the phone, you're talking yeah. to them like, okay, this person probably actually doesn't have like the knowledge or the authority to make this correct yeah. decision. I'll, I'll try to escalate like a second like in my, opinion. Um, in my instance, you know, the rule that, you know, kind of says that I can or can't do this, it says resident players. And my question is basically, am I a resident player in the situation of being a coach? And I think the conflict comes about where it's like, if they say, no, I can't do this, I'm probably going to like answer back saying I probably should be able to, right? Because I'm not counting to my team's roster lock or to my regional right. import things. Yeah. So in this ruling, why are you considering me a resident player if I'm not a player and I'm not consider- uh, contributing to the lock, right? So that that's going to be my argument if they say no. And that's probably why the first guy said yes. But I think the the area can get a little bit gray at times. In in this circumstance with EXO, it's so black and white if you just read the rule book, you know? I'm not a resident player because I'm a fucking coach. I spectate, right? Spectre and Mag, they're not that whatsoever. They are, without a doubt, resident players or non-resident players, you know? It's not even even hidden as well, right? Because the first thing to consider when you want to add a player to your roster is the roster lock. Is the period in which I can sign players open or closed? That's like the first thing to consider. And the answer to that question was no. <laughs> so yeah. it's really fallen yeah. down at the first hurdle, but they've not even checked the first hurdle. And then I've got, it, it really just stinks of like, they got, they they pieced together the options. They had no one to replace Chase with. They were like, wait, what about this? And then they got really excited that this was possible. They thought they were mm-hmm. going to be top two. Are we going to become one of the big three? It's going to be SSG, Ents, Twisted, and... Well, a beats team, so I guess big five. Big, it'll become a big five. But they got really excited, did it. They're fucking hooking the flight. They're telling Mag, give me your passport details, mate. We are getting you over here. You're going to sleep in the fucking basement and you're going to win us, OWCS. And they just pull the trigger. They pull the trigger. They rush. And unfortunately, these are all symptoms. And it, the statement as well was a symptom of like, not a professional organization. Right. It comes across amateur. It comes across, they rush into the decision, especially when like, I do have sympathy for like, fuck, we don't have a load of money. We spent thousands of pounds. It's like, well, that is your fault for spending thousands of pounds when you don't have any money and you're not sure. Like, but this it, is it like just one of stinks the, of amateur. Like, yeah, one of the inexperience. Yeah, one of the problems I have is it's like, well, they, they, they don't pay their players, right? So they're an organization that doesn't pay their players. But sometimes I look at their decisions and I think that, like, I really wonder if they have, like, if like, if you're an unsponsored org, the only people you should care about fundamentally are your players, you know? Like, they are your org. Like, if EXO don't finish top three, no one knows who EXO is, you know what I mean? And I look at it, like, when they, like, announced that they were, like, boycotting the World Cup, I was like, I don't really want to get into, like, the nitty-gritty of, like, why they did that. Like, I understand, like, why they did it, you know, and I understand it's a complex reason. Like, I think there's an element of, like, performative because I think the way the World Cup's going to work is even if, like, EXO did a Kalios rebrand and they just, like, put their flag to, like, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, that the words EXO are never appearing on broadcast because that roster, if they come, if they, if they... Uh, qualified they will be so like it's like it's like me saying yeah well i'm actually boycotting the nba draft this year guys like i'm just not gonna fucking do it and it's like well okay like (laughs) fair enough bro but then there was also like this element somewhere of like that from what i heard again they didn't like the management didn't consult the players on this decision and i actually think that's really really fucked up you know because this absolutely affects the players like i know they said they can go play for other teams but like a what i faced it said okay well fuck it if you don't want to win the prize that we're doing then just you can't play in the tournament and then the team just gets like banned for it like Players then feel like this like social pressure where if they can't say, well, listen, I want to play in the World Cup, then like, what do I do? What EXO should have done is like saying, yes, we feel morally strongly against this, which there is like, there is like, you could, if you want to get like what about ism with some of this stuff, like why are you competing in Overwatch if you're like totally against this? Because everything is now run by Saudi Arabia. But it's like, if you're in a situation where you don't want to like to, to play in the World Cup, what you should say is to the players, listen, this is the decision we've made as an organization. You guys can now go on and do your thing with a different brand. It's not like we're fucking paying you. If SSG says some shit, well, it's like, okay, well, I'll keep taking my salary. Say whatever the fuck you want. Like, it, you're, But if I don't pay you, 
for me to then make decisions like this and go over your head as players that puts them in a seat that you're in, I think it's kind of fucked up, you know? And I think the same with this cloud situation. There is an organization which isn't paying the players that I, I don't, I, I struggle to see is XO's like management really looking out for their interests of players, you know? It's the same with this charity thing, right? I'm not here to fucking shit talk charity necessarily because that's like one of my more edgy, like, opinions but if i have the money to fly out these fucking mag and spectra and i have money to donate my like winnings to charity should i not pay my players does that not solve the problem of being able to give this money to chase so that each day if i went to my local coffee shop and they said oh we're do donating all profit profit to charity i'm like oh, fuck that's good if they say oh yeah but we're also not paying our staff like also i'm saying i will maybe let's fucking pay them first and then donate the profits you know and it feels like there is like this like what the, what the exo want to be? Do they want to be a professional org? If you want to be a professional org, first thing you do is fucking pay the players. Like, that's what the org's the job win. is. And, like, if you, th that's how you keep the best players. That's how you get the best players. But if, like, I feel like there's an element of, like, they're so, like, the management got so high on their own supply of the optics of how great what they are doing is that they thought they were generally untouchable with this rule stuff. And that's what led, like, this narcissism that they could just post this ridiculous statement and get away with it all. So that's what I feel. I think as well, and I think as well, like the ultimate thing is, if you want fans for your esports team, which teams are the most popular in any sport? The teams that win the most. Like, take suddenly, Yeti's fan base has really increased over the last two weeks, right? Because they started, they beat whack, they started winning games people didn't expect them to win. So this was a huge win for them. Then all of a sudden, they get jerseys because some of their fans have made them jerseys. The fans weren't making jerseys where they were fucking looking awful in the first group stage, but now they're winning. Now everyone's got behind them, underdog story, all of this. Fans are getting invested. Fans are making them jerseys even. Everyone's invested. Like, I think if you actually want to become a successful esports organization, you have to win tournaments and do well. The reason EXO had a bit of clout coming into this is probably in, in reasonable part, not just because they've been around so long, but because they beat SSG. So I think... Like if this hadn't been winning, like if this was sheer cold making this statement, no one gives a fuck, you know, no offense to sheer cold, but it's like, it's just because this is the most successful unsponsored team. And I feel like they're like, I, I, the way I look at it is I feel like their management has to make a decision. Are we, are we actually like, do we care about our players at the fundamental level? Are we trying to build a competitive roster or do we just become a feeder team where we just like, we get the best European talent, we do well, and then we give them to the, so they can actually get paid, which is what they deserve because we can't do that. But it feels like they're very much like, we want to compete but we don't want to like ever consider paying you or like helping you in some sort of financial way. So that's, that's like, that's where some of my, uh, my, my, my feelings come from. I think as well, the other, I guess the other side of this, um, is obviously twisted minds who have actually gone on to sign the players anyway, and we'll be looking to use them later in the year and Kellen and vigilante. Um, but I don't know if that's like, it feels like twisted minds is a less dramatic version of the situation, right? Like, they obviously got the information directly wrong from the admin. They were a bit annoyed. They let everyone know they were annoyed. Signed the players anyway, and they'll just use them from here on. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of questions about whether this roster will work. But on paper, they're all good signings, right? They're all upgrades. They're all good players. On paper, on like yeah. the very surface level, it's just... Can I add one comment about XR real quick before we move course, into yeah. TN? Is, is basically that like in comparison to this, the one thing I'll say about XO in terms of the emotive response is that given that Twisted Minds and XO are probably very far away in terms of like backing and actual budget, XO probably feel like way more hard done by this situation than Twisted Minds do, which is probably why they were as uh, emotional as they were in the response. At the end of the day, I think everyone agrees and now the community largely, I think almost unanimously agrees that XO probably just did fuck up. XO actually, even now after releasing their most recent statement, actually just kind of agree as well. Um, so yeah, I just think EXO probably lose way more money trying to do what they do. And not to rehash anything else that's already been said by you guys because it's been covered like pretty extensively at this point. But um, yeah, you just you can't trust what a player heard through another guy and what another team got told by an intern. It's like you just can't do that. But yeah, Twisted Minds could at least afford to lose some money here, even though no team actually wants to lose money. Twisted Minds probably don't feel the sting of it as badly as EXO do. 
Yeah, well, like TM is effectively just like rolling through. Like the two players that they signed last night are the two that they wanted. It seems like they're not going to be able to play in OWCS or Dallas, but will be able to play in the face at league, which is obviously what qualifies them for the World Cup. Um, I think it's an interesting one because I think on paper, Callan and Vigi are really fucking good. And I think it actually like like hits two target areas of their team. I think it's going to be super fucking interesting to see how this team does. Because actually on paper, if you said the lineup of like UB Quartz, Callan, Vigi plus Admiral, you say, fuck, that's actually sure. like a solid roster. One thing I should say is TM, fuck, you guys should have been smarter. You should have been smarter. Instead of signing Admiral, I love Ollie, good player. If you just fucking sign Crispy, you fucking kill the competition for World Cup immediately. That's what Gumbo would have done. He would have, you could have fucking taken Exo's legs out again. We could have like fucking double got them. <laughs> take off a head, um, take off a legs. <laughs> if, if you went for Crispy, okay, even if you think Admiral's a better fit or a better player, which I fucking love Admiral, but I think there was like a real like tactical decision. You guys could have went for the jugular, but okay, maybe TM have got more respect than that. Um, but I always have this feeling, I guess, Unter, maybe you know more than me, but it's like, I, you know how London always had this problem where we couldn't integrate players because we had a fucking system? I feel like somewhere, like, the TM system is even harder to integrate than ours, you know? Like, th th their culture, like, their shot calling, everything. It feels so, like, on paper, their roster is amazing. I think it's so interesting to see, like, how good they are, or if it's one of those where, like, like the mixing of, like, the Korean and, like, the Saudi Arabian cultures with the shot calling and the no coaching, like, how it all fucking works. It's it's really hard as well, right? Because they have to change comp to a comp for established players don't have experience in. Yeah. Like to get Kellen and Vigi in, that's like, I mean, maybe Vigi's just going to play every map, right? But maybe like Kellen only comes in for the dive maps, which means they change the entire system or they have to play a, a comp they've not got a lot of experience on and they have to get Kellen in. I think Twisted will have a really hard time adjusting their system because it's definitely like the nightmare mode team to face those sorts of adjustments, you know? Like even in um in like the December, like November, December Saudi E-Leagues when Hardy had joined the roster, you could see that like they were so used to having this like UB leads everything approach. When Hardy comes in and Hardy has like a really strong understanding of how to play comps, but Hardy is used to leading and so is UB, you have all of this conflict all of the time. And 100% you're going to have those sorts of conflicts again when you introduce someone like Keller and like Vigi, because it's like, these are players that are really experienced that have leadership capabilities and they're going to load in and they're going to want to do things their way. And, you know, the rest of the core is going to want to do things the old way, you know, or the way that they used to, like Yubi's going to want to call things. And it's just going to be really difficult to integrate those two things. The fact that the new pickups are Korean as well, that's like a double difficulty multiplier, right? Like there's going to be language barrier issues. It's going to be really tough for Twisted, I think. Like the, these players, like they, they look really good on paper, but you also need to be able to think like, does this actually mesh well with the team, with the pre-existing core? And I think that Twisted is in like a, not an impossible position because I definitely think this could work out in their favor, but it's just like a really challenging position for them to be in because even if they can pick up the players with the skill required to fill those gaps, they still need to make them fit into the system. And that team, with, that is without a doubt, a team with like a really established system. I think if you compare it to Ents' pickup, like is anyone worried that Chase won't sooner or later just fit in the Ents system? But you um, compare that to this, yeah. there's so many questions. Like if this was Football Manager and you'd look at that, oh yes, add Kellen and Vigilante, no problem. But in like the actual real world, how it all gelled together, that's a huge question, really. Are they keeping um, like, the other plays as well for for Face It League, or is it like two completely separate rosters now? Because basically, what I'm trying to ask is like, if it doesn't work out, they might have to just you know rely on the old players. Yeah, I don't know. I think I, I don't know. Because they also have to scrim for two competitions at the same time, right? No, because Face of League doesn't start until after the Dallas LAN is over, mm. right? So my suspicion would be that these players aren't going to get integrated until right before Face of League starts. So what's mm. going to happen is you're going to have them completely competing in an attempt to win for Dallas. And then as soon as Dallas is over, then they're going to try and have that rapid shift to their new roster, which is going to be even more difficult for them because they're going to have less time to get accustomed to those players. But that being said, what's going to happen, my fan theory here, is that they will because they're almost guaranteed to be top three EU no matter what, you know, even without stealing Crispy from EXO, I think that EXO has had too much of, too many limbs have been sliced off, you know, like they're just going to struggle no matter what. <laughs> they're like that, um, like the Black Knight and Monty Python, you know, like they're on the floor saying, give me one more, give me one more, like <laughs> take another limb. Um, so it's like, I think Twisted is always just going to be able to, if their dive roster fails, if they can't integrate those Koreans, they're just going to go back to their normal core yeah. of five and shit on everyone else, you know, because they're, they're so good. Like the Twisted is a fucking insanely good team, no matter what, you know? And even mm. if KSA's hero pool is a little bit limited, maybe their style is like, you know, a little bit, not one tricky, but you know what I mean? Like 
they're always going to have something that they can rely on that can get them into top three in Europe. So I think that they don't have much to worry about, to be honest. Yeah, I saw, like, don't think, have these guys, I mean, they played on a mixed roster before the, the Saudi players, but they haven't played the Koreans yet, right? As far as I'm aware. So that's going to be a huge change up for them now. Yeah, also, presumably I mean, the Koreans are going to have to come live in Saudi Arabia, right? Like, I can't imagine they're yeah. going to get them a team house anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they said, I think they, when we were talking about it, they were saying they've already gone, part of the reason they were annoyed at Face It was they'd already paid for visas and stuff. So the plan is oh, very yeah. much to get them out there. One team who have run into substantial issues, though, is Rock Esports. I feel like the easy joke here is some kind of rock bottom that they've hit, but they've <laughs> they've they killed their roster essentially. Right, that was step one was kill the roster. So all the Saudis were they were not they were only going to play in Saudi League, right? For Saudi teams, so TVNT, Rojo, and Oi. And then they were going to try and sign a new set of players. And this, we talked a little bit about on the Goomba episode. I guess we let Goomba know his team were trying to get poached. But Rock went around with a bag of money, tried to sign a bunch of players. I think Telex was on the list of players they wanted to sign. Crispy was on the list. Yeah. Shockwave was on the list. Festler was on the I list. Think, I think originally their plan was to take like, um, it was like they were trying to like kill someone. Like, like they wanted to take like, it was like Kelex. Kai and Hattie or something like that was their idea was to take someone from each of the other teams to like cripple them and and then over time one thing that Rock were trying to do is they were offering a lot of money but they were also like telling players in DMs they were saying like you know just tell your team you're leaving you know like we're not really interested in doing any of like the legal contractual stuff but we will pay you if you leave you know so once the organizations got wins and obviously players are like I'm probably under contract I probably can't do this and I think what ended up happening was Rock willing to pay a lot for salaries but didn't want to like deal with the orgs and pay the buyouts to the point where it just looked really impossible for them to get the players they wanted and any version of the roster which they built which probably also ironically included yeah. taking exo players because fucking why not you might as well just kill exo while we're all got the chance and um, it feels like they didn't feel that roster was actually going to qualify for top three which is the world cup which is what they want so the rumors are that they they've kind of left europe and then they're they're sailing across the ocean and maybe considering a different team. I think Ooh. The, um, the <laughs> final, ver the version that almost went through was Vessler, Crispy, Shockwave. But yeah. because they hit a barrier when Ent said, you can have Vessler if you want, let's negotiate a buyout or something along those lines. Yeah. Really reasonable esports contracts situation that happen when you have a player under contract. And then that put Rock off. And then because Vessler fell through, and suddenly nobody wanted to be on that team like without like nap piece i think the whole sort of house of cards fell down and rock were left with well i guess just checkmate and Izzyaki just hanging out selling lemonade selling in <laughs> they, so they still have checkmate Izzyaki, right like they those guys have not been released or anything they're like still not heard any like contracts. i guess but they don't they're not in owcs they have no roster but they might still be under contract so, right like there's no reason their contracts ended yeah because like Chris, but I don't I know if you, I don't know if you're like if you're hinting at them moving overseas. What do you think they'll go, like build full Korean or something and around Checkmate Yaku, or maybe drop those two and just pick up Yeti or some shit? Like, I think that like if if I'm thinking of how they get to the World Cup, if they feel like they can't get in from Europe, I feel like the only unsponsored teams left. I guess now that WAC is sponsored, it has to be a Korean team, right? Like, I'd, like unless they sign Timeless, but I really don't see Rock Timeless. Like, it doesn't. I mean, maybe Captology, they've started to see like the power of the coaching on this team and they can really like see, they can see. But I don't know, my, my feeling is it has to be Korea mm -hmm. or the, maybe they're picking up as like O's team, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just to come 16th at EWC. Just to come 16th. That might not be, yeah, we'll, we'll see. That would actually be like pretty huge for the, the O's players. They just wouldn't be expecting that at all. They're like, what the fuck? <laughs> all right, well, sure, we'll take it. <laughs> There's already um, two. There's already two Koreans on that O's team, anyways. It's like oh, so you'd have to kill the Koreans to get Checkmate and Izayaki in. I'm sure it could be arranged for the right price. I wouldn't mind <laughs> killing Lastro one more time. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've got like a, I've got like a sickness, you know, where it's like I keep coming back to these people. You know, it's like I keep running into fucking Lastro. I keep running into Dante. You know, like I'm going to kill them all over and over again. It feels so good. <sighs> <laughs> so speaking of Korea, can we talk about the Korean uncoachable? 
Did sure. they steal your brand or did you guys give it to like what how did yeah, you guys nine, do that? No, we, we listed nine K nine K reached out, asked if he could have it. I said, Absolutely. <laughs> we got him blank copies, he got it booted up, and then Aid, 9K, and Rush became the Korean trio. Uh, and then I felt like what did you who did you think you Who's were who? on the broadcast? I yeah. I felt. I'm not sure. I wasn't sure. Who's, I think X has to be who's, well, who's the most all right person I broadcast? That'll be Chris. So, yeah, I guess I don't. Know, am I nine k or am I? I reckon eight? eight is low key, like a right, like a little alt right winger, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm eight. <laughs> I thought I was eight. Like good vibe. He was always kind of eight like is like the host. Like, so I think I think X I might think be eight. Eight is the host. Yeah. I think our job think, yeah, roles overlap the most. Maybe I'm Rush because Rush had some outrageously hot takes, like. Egregiously hot takes. And I thought, oh fuck that! Like maybe he's me, you know. Also a fellow coach of the year winner, so we've got like, a brotherhood there. It's just uh, insulting to nine k to say that I'm nine k, you know. Like it's so insulting. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's like they, they need like Kalios or something on the show, you know, because then it can be obvious, you know. It's like who's like the dumb the dumb guy that they've just got there for like comedic relief, you know. But like not none of those guys are that, you know. It's like three guys that are like famous for their strategic success, so it's like this doesn't work. Do we, do we want to hit some of? Because I feel like I feel like to be fair to them. I only read for translation. Obviously, I don't speak Korean at all, so I couldn't really... I watched a bit of it live, but I didn't understand any of it. But I read for translation on Reddit, um, and it felt like they actually maybe... They encaptured some of the spirit of Uncoachable. It felt like, yeah. it felt like a, fitting, no, a fitting first franchise. I think... I think Rush did the best what? because what? of all of his like because yeah. of all of his piping hot takes. I think it's really funny that these guys do one episode oh i can shit talk ripple too nice um yeah they do one episode with some like outrageously hot takes and like goofy like region competition stuff in it and someone like ripple takes so much offense at it that they need to do like a 10 dot point <laughs> black and white tweet like it's a response to allegations like unpacking the arguments of korean uncoachable and like shitting on rush being like you know this guy's players didn't even want to stay with him and this is such a ridiculous take and this is such a ridiculous take it's like bro it's a shit post podcast it's not that deep like, this is a 40-year-old man saying he's a better Winston than Hanbin. It's like, do you really think he believes that? It's like, Hanbin is so good at Overwatch. And this guy, Rush is like plat in game. I have Rush on my friends list. And I see him playing quick play. I look at his profile. He plays comp. The guy has like 100 games a season. He's plat. That guy does not think he's better than Hanbin at Winston, you know? Like, it's so unserious. But you read like a translation of a foreign fucking podcast and you think, this guy's coming after me. He said sugar free shit. Shit! It's like, bro, come on. We all we do is fucking shit talk the Koreans, you know? Like, it's just fucking what it is. It's good. One one take Rush had, which I thought was so fucking funny, is he says, "Oh, I never had a problem with beating proper." Did you see that one? He was like, <laughs> "Oh, we, like, proper was never a problem." I'm like, bro, I think you fucking missed up history. You know? That that fucking grand finals proper was causing your team a problem. <laughs> you got over the line. He's like, I always beat proper. Like, it was never a problem. Like, I know how to counter proper. I'm like, do you? I, yeah, yeah, that's fucking why. Have Devin four Bats. better players in every other role than proper, and then maybe that's how you fucking beat the guy. It's like, he's technically right, but he's taking way too much credit for that. Like, I don't know. He's just, he's saying it way too nonchalantly. Maybe he is just shit talking, but man. <laughs> yeah, I think because a, a lot. Comment. A lot of the stuff comes because sometimes the translation, it felt like it came, it like brought across more of like the vibe, I guess. Like there was bits where he was saying like, oh, Dong Hak, Yeti would smash Hadi's team. There's also like, a, there's a subtext there that it's Hadi's team and not like Chris's team or the London team or something, but it's Hadi's team. Yeah. Doesn't know. Doesn't know. <laughs> but it was like, Dong Hak will smash Hadi's team. It's like, well, yeah, he's just talking in like the same way, I guess we all talk in a lot of these situations. Like yeah. it is, I think he, he did it well. I guess like the other big one was the region, the region ranking, right? This is maybe one of the things that rustled RuPaul's feathers is that he said, Korea is great in an EU, but then NA is just a bit shit compared to everywhere. Wait, I just realized we thought Captology was talking about us. Captology was flaming Rush. He thinks that Rush was being dis Rush was disrespectful. <laughs> Rush it was, doesn't know. It was the Korean and Rush doesn't know. <laughs> uh. 
So I don't know. I thought it was fucking funny. I hope they keep doing it. I really hope they keep using our branding too. I think that's the only thing I request is keep calling it fucking uncoachable. Don't do your own thing. Can, you know? can they write like a, a crappy little like KR or just have like some random hangles somewhere on the screen? Yeah. Like to, Dude, we can make it for yeah, them. Make it for let's, them. Be make real. It. let's be real. They, as long as they don't do a quiz, they can't be uncoachable. So, you know, it's fake product. No, they, did, they, they, they did, did a poorly translated I concept so of a quiz. <laughs> People went into the chat and kept asking for a quiz because, you know, everyone's a quiz head. And 9K just interpreted it as, well, yeah, ask any questions you want and we'll answer them. So there's a bit of a translation between, between Q&A and quiz, which I guess a Q&A is kind of a quiz. Them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw Aid was streaming the other day, and I saw people kept going at this chat asking for a quiz, and he was typing "no quiz, sorry" like with like an unhappy face, like the guys just getting fucking spammed by quiz heads. <laughs> Did you see this take sorry. on Reddit, by the way, about the RuPaul shit talk? I put it in the production, like, like this idea that like the reason that like uh, Rush didn't get signed to Falcons, and one of these like some of these fucking takes is just like, oh, I assumed Rush didn't want to work because they with proper because he was a booster. Like this fucking idea that Rush is turning down the payday of his life to coach the best team in the He'd rather be unemployed, yeah. Out of principle. <laughs> yeah, no, I, he's a booster. I, I'll just, I'll take welfare. You know, you guys go ahead with that. Like, I mean, he kind of like, did that with the so World Cup team. Like, you know, like he, he put Spock okay, on the World this Cup is, this team difference. instead this of proper. Difference. World Cup, World Cup is like, I think I, the way I've been told about World Cup is there's a fan expectation or there's like a ton of fan pressure where like you can't put boosters on the World Cup team for some reason. And it wasn't even just for like other coaches as well. Like they they don't want to do that. I don't know if maybe I can't remember what Krusty's team was. I'm pretty sure Krusty's team, the one year he did a watch World Cup, he didn't put any boosters on that team either. I could be wrong. Um, but yeah. They, they never do. The World Cup team, they always like dodge the boosters. Yeah. But it's also but like I a full-time like, job yeah. or like you know, it's tied I, to your I, income I, in the same way. Yeah, I think like if Rush had a job and he had like security and he just, he could he could pick who he wanted, maybe he just, okay, well, we don't need proper, fine. But he's not picking unemployment over proper. Like that's that's the point, right? And that's the crazy thing. Like fans think that Rush would rather be unemployed than work with proper is insane. Like, yeah, you know, Rush just got so much honor, you know, that he would just prefer to fucking do nothing for him and his wife than to fucking take this, like, insane payday to win every Overwatch tournament. Yeah. I'm Imagine sure. trying to explain, sure. like, I don't know how you would do this, Chris, but if you had to explain to your wife what boosting was, and then that was the reason you weren't taking a full-time salary, uh, I'd, it wouldn't it wouldn't fucking fly, I think. No, I think it would be a tough sound. <laughs> no, you see, they weren't meant to be at that rank, but so they paid to get to that rank, you see, and that's why... We're gonna have to sell the house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, and so, oh, and, and and the player did it like he did it last year, right? No, no, he did this like when he was twelve years old. Sorry, so that was like six years ago. But you know, we we got to hold it against them for six years. No worries. <laughs> yeah. So these people, I feel like sometimes it's like the delusion of like Koreans, you know, where it's like they just like they imagine it. Rush, he's not, he's the type of guy like I, he doesn't speak any English. I've never spoken to. Him. I don't know anything about, him, but he's just the type of guy. He's a stand-up guy that stands against boosting, and it gets upvotes too. Of Probably not like. I don't know that the orgs would care now, but orgs during Overwatch League did somewhat care. Like I know um, Rush on Dallas and, you know, I, I'm pretty sure Fusion and Soul Dynasty also had the same policy where they couldn't take any boosters in. Um, and when, when Fusion moved to Korea, they kind of like took like a more anti-boosting stance, you know? Um, but when they were Philly in, in the good old days, I think... Oh, you guys had fucking Sato yeah. on the team. Clearly, you didn't give a shit. The oh, yeah. guy's the CEO <laughs> yeah, of Boost. I mean, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> once, you, once you actually got to Korea, I, I've, I've been told, like, teams that are in Korea that, like, feel like they're representing Korea um, don't want to touch that kind of stuff. So there's a bunch of players that, like, you can go with, like, so one of the re rumors in the offseason that's been said already, I can't remember where it got said, but it's been already mentioned that Shu was potentially linked to Infernal last year, but obviously... It, probably fell through shoe got a better deal in houston anyway and then oh, you know it, it probably, infernal's it, a fucking budget team bro that guy yeah, was never I, going it, to it was a, it was a budget team but also like you can't you couldn't you can't like finalize the deal anyway because he's a booster right so the there's all of those things end up being an issue so it's, some of it's just also missing like the obvious thing as well right is that they just like junk buck was already on falcons before any of this so then like the junk buck to crusty connection seems a way more obvious connection i feel like than uh Junk Buck. Yeah. Who was first? What, what was the order operator? Who, who got there first Junk and got Buck. the others? Junk, Junk Buck was first. Junk Buck was going to coach the European Falcons when that was like that super team was getting made. Um, and then when they went Korean, they took Junk Buck and Majed with them. Oh, okay.
<laughs> Class. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure if nine. I heard nine K was linked to that team at one point as well. But maybe maybe he took. Uh, I think he does it. like bits and bobs. He's like friends with them, so I'm sure he like helps them with stuff. But I guess like an unof unofficial like consultant. Coaching, coaching. No, because I yeah, I heard early like on that, that they they were going to have three coaches because it was, was going to be Krusty Junkluck and nine K. Three headed dragon. Yeah, was they want to do the shock three headed yeah. dragon again. But yeah. Well, even without 9k though, it did actually work out for the boys at Falcons in what it ended up being a surprise, I think, even though ultimately the final was Falcons versus Wack, and then Falcons won the final, as I guess maybe everyone would have said several months ago. But going into this match, I think everyone had Wack as the favourites after beating them twice, looking the real deal in all of these. But then Falcons actually make a pretty convincing win for the most part, right? Like it was three, three maps up they went, Wack had to like, Clutch a couple, mm. got maybe a little bit of a assist from Majid there in map five as well. Um, and then eventually Falcons come out on top. And is this just like maybe a bad sign for the rest of the world that Falcons have like maybe a different gear when the when it actually gets to the lights at their brightest? I also think, by the way, maybe hot take, but I think Falcons were capable of four zero in their series. I looked at fourth map, I think it was like Sarvasa, right? It was it could, they could have taken that map as well. Like it was a very close map. So there's a world with Falcons actually four zero that series. Um, I don't know, like it's it's a weird situation. Like, did, I guess they did improve between the last time they played the scene and qualified to then. Um, there's an interesting angle you could talk about where like the first two times Wack and Falcons played, it actually didn't mean too much. First game was literally a pure scene game that is zero bearing at all, like it, literally zero bearing on any result. So winning or losing that game. Like, you don't really give a shit. I, I think you don't want to lose in front of your fans, but still, like, you don't really care if you lose. Second time the loss was in a seeding qualifying match, so another seeding game, but this time it seeds you into something for real. Um, and so, like, it kind of mattered more, but at the end of the day, I think it wouldn't have mattered too much where Whack were seeded as long as they were on the opposite side of the bracket too. Uh, rather, yeah, either... They, as long as they were on the opposite sides of the bracket to each other, that's all that really mattered. So, you could argue the one time that it really did count was actually the grand final because the other two matches were like seeding with one of them being slightly worth more. And this one is actually the grand final where you get money, even though this was still like kind of just qualifying into another land, which is the qualified to Dallas. But yeah, there's an interesting angle to think about. Maybe it's cope. I don't know. Yeah. So do you know, Avril, do you know who Pep Guardiola is? Say again. <laughs> Pep Guardiola. He's a football soccer coach no okay so he's probably the best in the world arguably the best of all time and whenever he does like pre-match like a post-match interviews whenever his team loses he always just says yeah like they're a good team like this type of stuff happens and i always used to think this guy was just a fucking like just doesn't want to talk about like um the result and what i think people like on the outside always think about in sports they think it's like binary either you win because you were better or you lost because you were worse and if you replayed that every single time the same outcome would happen what I think Pep thinks to a certain degree is like, there's a variance, right? We have a 70% chance to win this game based on the fact we're better, the fact that we have like the better strategies. But actually what happens sometimes is like, how many times have Man City lost again? This probably goes over some people's heads, but how many times have they lost? where well, they were clearly the better team. There was just like one or, few, one or two moments. And I wonder if there is like this thing happens in Overwatch too, because I felt it sometimes too, where we lose a close game and it's like, oh, well, you know, like London just choked this or just like this. And I'm like, ah, fuck it. Like it was just close. Like if that one team fight goes differently, and I wonder if there was like something here where like actually like every time these teams play, it's so close, like 50-50, it could literally just go like either way. And it's not necessarily like this mystic force of like Falcons massively improved or did something different. And it's just like, this is just like kind of how it goes. And now it's just like, when I was watching it, I was like, there isn't anything like I was looking at Falcons, which like struck me as completely different, like comps wise, like maybe they played Smith a few no, more no, maps, they, like they played, the maps. They played Lucio Curry more. And then the last time they played, they played um, Brigana more. I, did, mm -hmm. I checked the balls. But even map but yeah, one, it was Anna the whole time. Well, they, they, won, they, won, they won all the maps. Those first three maps, they essentially, Falcons won a Winston map, which they'd always historically lost against um, Wack. Then they won like a Bat Brig map in map three. And then they won like, I guess like yeah. the Arissa Mirror type one as well. Um, but even though they did like Falcons were swapping to Winston a lot, so I think it was just like they just seemed to win everything, even though historically that's not been the case. But honestly, mm. like, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of maybe like lends itself to Chris's point. But the Esperanza, Wack had to actually hard throw in that situation. Like, that last fight, those last two fights, Wack should win that like nine times out of ten. 
if they don't just make like a series of horrific decisions, then lose the clutch. So yeah. even even though we got to Frio, it could have not been Frio. And I think like Avril said as well, like the Suravasa really could have been any either way as well. So it could just be I think not that deep. Both teams are good. <laughs> I think too, like this series when I watched it, like this like epitomized like some of my criticisms of like the Korean region. Because I looked at this and I feel like it's like both teams handshake down Ilios, it's Anna Brig Winston on um map two. I think both teams are like Arissa Lucio Kiri, right? On this map here. Both teams like hand shook like back break just the entire time. You know, like Falcons played it with like the Arissa and Wack played it with the Sigma. And I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, like, fuck, like, how do you have all of these different comps, but you don't have the ability to swap in a map to a different one, you know? Like I was looking at Wax comp where they were playing like this back break sigma. I'm thinking, this is really not like if you swap to Lucio here, this is just miles better against Arissa Bat Brig. I know Midtown is a Bat Brig map, but like you know how to play the fucking Arissa. Lucio comp because you just played it in like maybe you can play like Lucio Sigma and I just I was watching it and I was like it's like almost like these teams have done like a like a behind the scenes like hero ban where it's like this map is like designed as the fucking Arisa Kiri is best on this map this map is Winston like map four was like Winston uh, Lucio Kiri two and um, and I, I don't know like th this was me I was like fuck like it's not even like they're making subs you know like to be fair to Falcons I think on map on Rialto they put in Magic so they did something different there and. Um, and map six, they had their little, uh, like their Torb Diva comp, which I think is like is quite unique to them. But I, I remember the Midtown, especially, I'm watching it. I'm like, I don't understand how you can play these other comps and other maps, but you think that like hybrid is so fundamentally different that you can't bring out a fucking Winston here. Or like once you get to third point, just swap to Lucio Kiri, like fucking Arissa or whatever it is. I felt, yeah, I don't know. I just felt no comment. That was, like it would look, it would look different in Europe, you know? Like there would be like more. Swap sector you know, during the I map thought, or something. I thought you know Gumba was saying maybe he said it in my DMs, maybe he said it on this podcast, you know. But if you played one of these Korean comps, like the Bat Brig Sigma defenses, like you would just immediately get a team counter swapping Ram Lucio and running it up your ass, you know. Like it's yeah. just it, it wouldn't take much for like a, an EU pilled team to just go like a full counter swap comp and go for that. But you know, maybe that's also a testament to like the strength of the um the European, you know. Like they like to play Lucio Ram stuff like that, whereas you know the Korea the Korean yeah. Korea actually, plays zero Ram by the way. They play no Ram at all. Zero yeah, not, Ram. not a Ram pilled region. Yeah, nobody really buys into the Ram into Sigma matchup there in uh, over in Korea, and maybe that's a part of the problem. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to play them, but I'm convinced if on this patch of a team plays fucking Sigma Bat Brig, I think you can just fucking run that shit over with counter swaps, and I'm 100 percent these teams are confident to do it. It just, I don't know, it just feels like there's just like this constant, like, Esperanca is fucking Winston Kiri, but what was map two? Was Esperanza map was two? map no. two. Was map yeah. two Esperanca? Yeah. But there was, yeah, there was like, I don't I can't remember what it was. Like, there was one where it was like, oh, we play the same comp with, both teams play with Arissa here, and then on Suravasa, both teams play with Winston, and there was like this, like, everyone, like, it was like, they both teams were fundamentally aware that, like, this series, Bob, like, fucking Rialto was going to go down to, like, the same five heroes, and then just who played it better. Maybe both teams felt like they could win it because WAC have got history of winning it and Falcons maybe just had confidence. I mean, I was watching the actual level and I was like, okay, like these players are fucking unbelievable. Like some of the fights where like prop is just running in and it's just headshot after headshot. I'm like, okay, yeah, these guys are fucking incredible. But I also looked at it, I think that like there had to have been like better like options on certain maps. Like I just don't believe that Overwatch Midtown is so fundamentally different to fucking Esperanca that every hero in the game needs to be different to be played. You know, like I, that's just not what I believe. Was, yeah, it's, it just feels weird now, especially like, especially for whack. I mean, I guess I can maybe understand it because it's like, it feels like they don't swap throughout the series. But I guess if each map is its own archetype, you're just like, well, we lost dive, but it's okay. It's the Orissa map. Oh, we lost that map, but it's okay. It's the Bat Brig map. And then it's not until they get to like, all right, we've now lost for three versions of the matchup. We need to do something different. But even then, they didn't really do anything different either. They just clutched up. Yeah. Like there was no sort of like forcing a different type of matchup because <clears throat> I've, they just they won this the, the sixty forty like percentage matchup like they it just things went now went that went their way you know I felt the same thing a lot when like watching Yeti in these games where it was just like they literally won everyone's hearts they've got some poor volunteers love them so much they've made them jerseys they've literally made them all I think it was the EXO <laughs> players <babe. laughs> but and then we see so little dive in the final thing it felt like they just lost faith in like they didn't they forgot how they got here you mm -hmm. know. They'd lost track of their roots. It's like, just fucking go dive and just live or die by that sword. It's really okay, you know? 
Like, what would London I do wonder... in this situation? We just lose to be Rissa one more time. Just die on your sword, you know? I wonder if they felt like they were starting to get countered or something like that. I, there's also, also another situation where um, their win rate on Doom is just so much higher than on Winston. Like, when they play Winston, I feel like Dong X just gets fucked. Like, they, they're... I think we're also in a situation where Korea wants to try and run um, Anna Brig, and it's just not producing wins. Like you're getting way more wins playing Lucio Kiri comps. Yeah, but um, they. I also don't know if you can just one trick the Doom though. The problem is Dong X still is basically a Winston Doom two trick. Like this is the Hangzhou Spark. I made, I put out a tweet that Yeti is currently just Hangzhou Spark. If you think about it, they can just two trick the same comp. They're very good at one comp. And anything else off that comp, they just look like way worse. Like they're not a good Arista team. Um, and all they, even if you only just change the Doom to the Arista, like the whole pace of the game is different. Like, you know, how you're buying space, how you're enabling Vipers, and all that kind of stuff is totally different. Um, it's just, you know, if they can't win on Doom, I feel like this team can't win. And that's a fundamental issue with uh, Yeti at the moment. Cause like they kind of have to play Doom, but also Doom is pretty fucking counterable. I, yeah, I think that's the problem. Is I think Doom is like was very strong for a time, but I think there was way too many hard counters. Like any team ever plays like Cass, I think you like have an insane win rate. The Zarya plus Cass makes it like basically unlosable. I think even Arissa plus Cass. I think actually Doom is very strong in certain situations, but there are certain heroes that it's genuinely like mathematically impossible. Is it a credit? Too. They did make for Ryan work as well in a couple of situations. It was it was more just the fact that if I look at these series that like, yes he lost, it's like they just lost playing fucking Arissa Kiri Lucio. And it's like, do we really go out of do you really go out of a tournament and you don't just at one point like even Houston did it in the grand final was right, like, oh fuck it. We can't win on the meta, press the fucking dive button and let's see what happens. That was like the disappointing I, I, part for me. That they, they there was no like press for press the emergency dive button. Yeah, they, they prepped a lot of the stuff. Like, you mentioned the Rhine as well. I don't believe in it at all. Like, I think they just don't look practice on the Rhine. Obviously, they'll play the Rhine for spawn holding on Havana, but then they also play the Rhine in other areas as well. Uh, maybe Fate on the team was just cooking a little too hard. Um, I, I don't know. They didn't look comfortable. I had no faith in it either. Um, it looked like they just, like, yeah, maybe they didn't. It's probably a bad look that they can only win on dive, but maybe they should have leaned on harder. But it, it was clear <coughs> that the team wanted to shift their identity away from being a dive one trick team but maybe that's just what they're doing what, maybe that's the only thing they're good at maybe a big part of the problem is also just like tank flexibility to an extent you know like a lot of the top teams in korea it's like they have off tank players or they have like specialist tank players you know it's like it's a little bit more difficult to make these adaptations in the series if like almost every tank in the server almost they basically have no ram experience like across the vast majority of the people in the server and then it gets worse when it's like you know there's a specialist tank on the side of um Whack and Falcons, right? Like I'm not, I'm not calling Juman inflexible by any means, but you know, like he's also just not the guy that's like perma playing Ram and stuff like that. Um, then people like Bernard, like that's an off tank player that missed the release of Ramatra, stuff like that. Like a, maybe our opinion on I Korea mean, not swapping is a little bit skewed by the fact that there's like a lot of kind of more specialized players on those top teams. Is that true? Because I don't know. I can't say for sure whether it's there's just a lack of experience in the RAM, or they truly don't think it works. They, or it could be both, like, maybe they suck at the RAM and so it loses in scrims. So yeah, they don't exactly. Playing you, it. You, you see but solutions like, on heroes you're good at. You don't see them on ones that you suck at. You like, think the heroes you're bad at are bad regardless. But I'm also, like, willing to give benefit of the doubt to Korea, maybe just because it's Korea, and it's just like, maybe maybe they've tried the RAM, and they are actually good on RAM, and they just don't think it's very good. Yeah. But there is that world of possibilities. Well, I, I genuinely don't know. The two, the two best Korean RAMs are probably someone and Fearless, right? Someone of us obviously playing in North America and Phyllis is obviously not playing. But I feel like those are the only Korean tanks we've seen actually play Ram and go, oh, these guys seem pretty, like, these these guys seem all right. These guys can play Ram. Are they the only, like, real Ram players last year? Yeah, like, from the no Korean played it. Jim, Jimin played it a bit. Jim, Jimin and Max kind of alternated it. I think Jimin played it a decent amount, though. They just never got any results on it. Like, shock at like, the first Don, half Don of the when he was playing Ram. was just getting shit on. Well, Donghak has played it in OWCS and just done really badly on it as well. So I think it's just like really not in their strength at all. Yeah, the, the last big news, I don't think there's really too much to say here, I guess, just other than it's good news. Now, Whack, unfortunately, they probably would have liked to win the final to lead into this oh, announcement. Goodness, but they, they <laughs> lost the final into a huge announcement that they are actually the Crazy Raccoon Team, a Japanese organization, which I think is fair to say a massive from the impressions in terms of like their social Look media the following and yeah what are like 9.1 million views on the tweet which is 11.5 currently right now 11.5 but yeah more than yeah. probably any overwatch yeah. tweet in 
recent history. <laughs> um, so good news, good news for the raccoons, and I guess good news for Overwatch overall. That a big org, even if it is going to be, I guess, a bit disconnected because it's the Japanese scene, but the Japanese scene is the only scene actively growing in terms of like a it's true. viewership and Married by Japan input. I am Japan pilled. So uh, but, big news, guys! This new Crazy Raccoon Ross will be playing RWC's Japan. I've just totally made that up. Yeah. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> it's just they, like they've naturalized their I entire roster. <laughs> I mean, they've all got Japanese that's a hot take. Lives, that's a hot that's take. a yeah. hot take, bro. I don't think I don't think KSG loses to Shu. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see, won't we? At Asia Land, Varel will get their shot. Get their shot. Does, does Japan have the Korean imports that we thought they would? I haven't even looked at the Japanese rosters. No, the imports are like um, Hofak and stuff. You, I don't know if you guys know like, Hofak. Yeah, no, it's like actual Kappa like, players. Like Pressure, Hofak and Pressure yeah. and like yeah. Karu and Blink and stuff on the support line. Karu, like X, You're just, you're just making Oscar. up names. These aren't even real players, dude. Like, like, yeah, this... not, not like super. These are the kind of players that I've seen like pop in an AU a couple of times. You know what I'm saying? Like they've These are guys that are journeymen that have been through a lot of different regions Jer- of rosters. Journeymen. Like they they touch the tip of top five hundred a couple of times a season. Korean like, journeyman. Yeah, no, genuinely. Like they're the, they're the There's no like there's no like there's like there's no like oh shit, this Korean player is on the team. Like, you know, yeah. there's no like actual big name on any Japanese team. I would expect there to be like a random hidden gem in there at some point, you know, like someone that didn't get a shot that's actually quite good. Well but, um, it's hard like because like you could you could you could say yeah, hidden sh- gem. You could say you could say like, oh, I don't know, maybe Dukes or Hofak are actually pretty good, but the problem is they're playing against Japanese. All you see is them dumping on Japanese teams and then yeah. losing to Varel. So it's like you don't get much info out of that. Well, that's that's what I mean. It's like I was I was talking to a player today, like a Korean player that's um you know like they like young inexperienced type where it's like they're not going to get a shot on like the main OWCS rosters, but they're probably like you know they're a bit of a rocket analog um in that they're next up I would say. But it's really difficult, like as an inexperienced Korean player, to get put into one of these main rosters, especially if you haven't been on like a good team previously. You know. So you might see players like that um, basically go the same route as people like someone and someone and Spectra did, where it's like they have very little credibility in like the main Korean scene. They haven't played on like major Korean rosters. So instead they wind up playing in like the minor regions, like the OS or in this case, the Japanese region. And like you'll see them hard pop off in this region. People will dismiss them as shit, but eventually they will get a chance in the main stage because of it. So I think like you will see players I mean, you- that are actually good. Among the ho facts and whatnot, because you know, you know, someone and Spectra both came Mag. from like Team CC, and Spectra was playing in O's contenders before that. Like, yeah, really Spectra, really- Spectra, Opener, Top Dragon, they've all like dabbled around OC and stuff like that in the past. They're reasonable yeah. players, and like with, um, with someone leading into um the twenty two of Watch League season, it's like you know, someone was one of those players that it's like a lot of a lot of Western people they'd seen someone because he was a leaderboard player, you know, like Perma Rank One. But if you talked to Korean players, the Korean, like the establishment perspective of some of someone was like, he's a dumb ranked one trick, you know, like he's just a stupid player, like only good in ranked stuff like that. But it's like the reality couldn't be further from the truth, you know, like guys really, really flexible and not a moron, <laughs> but um, the establishment perspectives can really go, oh, I like mean, they, they travel with you. I, I cast as someone when he was on team CC and I didn't think he was that flexible. Like he didn't really come into his own. I, I feel like he, he made Al and like needed to be molded into a player or at least get, be given the opportunity to show that he has that flexibility. I think Overwatch 2 probably helped as well because it forced him to expand his hero pool. But like, I had no idea when I, fu- I finally got told by like Gumba or whoever on, on Mayhem's like, yo, this guy's like really flexible. I don't think we need Adam anymore, et cetera. I'm like, wait, what the fuck? I haven't seen someone play any of these off tanks. Well, I've never seen him play like half these hero pools before. So yeah. Just the most, just the most egregious cap I've ever heard in my entire fucking life from Avril about how someone wasn't a flexible player leading into Overwatch League. So I had to, I had to fucking had to run for it. You know? like, why are you going to get so many props in this episode? First yeah, that's my, that's my bad. I just, I just, you know, he's got one. The fact no that he has one. Yeah, no. Take the cap off because you're the one. You're the one who's fucking. 
<laughs> Unbelievable. Why are you saying, Thanks. hang on, why are you saying I'm capping when that was like, he never showed any flexibility. On Bro, that guy was so flexible. That guy was playing. For, uh, even maybe if he's competitive. Scrims, maybe like, maybe behind the scenes he was, but like publicly that did not show I at just, all. It's like that guy, that guy was streaming his ranked and it was like, this was the only Korean player that was playing Ryan in ranked. Like the only one. He was like rank one wrecking ball, rank one Reinhardt, rank one Winston. It's like the guy had insane flexibility and the fact that he could pick Ryan as well as the dive tanks was like the eye-opening thing. Is picking like, Ryan, why is picking Ryan f- flexibility? Because Koreans are fucking dog shit at Ryan. Like, mm-hmm. nobody can do that. It's like, I don't know what you expect. You want everyone to watch someone's stream. This is like, a compl- at the time, in a completely unknown play. We're all supposed to just watch But he wasn't unknown stream. to the Koreans. They were all just like, ah, oh, dog shit ranked, pl- ranked player, you know? But the reality couldn't have been further from the truth. It couldn't have been further from the truth. You're yeah, like, oh, he needed to be molded. That's, it's that's, like, that's that's great 2020 hindsight, but like publicly speaking, from what I could see, he didn't show them. Because I'm sorry, I didn't dive into someone's fucking Twitch TV in 2019. I'm sorry, he was a completely unknown player. I didn't give a fuck about who this guy was pre Overwatch League. I wasn't going to watch his random. I'm, I'm not Korean saying stream you should know. See his I'm, not, I'm not saying you should know. I'm saying all the people that were actively dismissing him, that were dealing with him all the time, you know, the people that Q Korean ranked and lose to him every single day for like an entire year of him camping rank one. They should know better, but instead the establishment Probably. opinions are like, oh, dumb ranked player, you know, but like how many I, of these I never, rank one I never thought out to be dogs. I never Yo. thought he was a dumb rank one player. So I'm just saying, I'm just defending myself from you saying cap because like from my perspective, <laughs> based on what I saw publicly, he wasn't flexible. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, if you, Avril, if you turn it round, it means no cap. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Backwards. <laughs> That is no Unbelievable. Cap. That's crazy that you have the Atlanta Rain cap just on hand as Look, well. Okay. This, got sent, this got sent to me. I have a Gator jersey. This got sent to me by Atlanta Rain. It's the only team that offered to ship internationally to give me gear. It's a it's guys, a match worn it's a match worn Gator jersey too. So yeah. Whoa, wow. Geez, that, that, yeah. That Scott Musk. Yeah. Oh, yes. they, no, no, no. They, <laughs> they 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 washed it against my wishes. I told no. them not to. So that's kind of yeah, crazy. Well, that's no. I told I asked Gator to run two miles in at first, and they didn't want to do that. So yeah. No. Anyway. Oh. Then maybe the last big topic to hit is maybe the face it signups. Obviously, we know Unter is going to get one of these the uh, esports World Cup qualification spots. But outside of that, for this esports, uh, the face it Masters thing, there's been pretty limited signups across the board. It's very unfortunate. I mean, considering how many, how many? I think it's like. It's definitely less than three figures, I think, globally right now. Something like that, which is very globally. Uh, I mean, we have to double check. That was what I just got like, kind of told. But if we go to like, face it, league, liquid, it probably won't show in Liquipedia, will it? Because it doesn't show the signups. I think you need to go to the actual face it client to see the signups. Am I wrong? I think you have um, to go to actual yeah, face it. Yeah, and that unfortunately that website's kind of hard to navigate. Sometimes it's kind of annoying. Um, Let's just say it's not a lot. It's it's like compared to OWC, it's extremely fucking low. Uh, now, given that it is a paid subscription fee, that probably is a barrier to entry. But like, I I also just think like a lot of people don't know what it is. A lot of people don't know like, is it like a tournament thing? Is it a replacement for ranked? Like a lot of people like, is it FPL? Uh, maybe it's been poorly <laughs> explained. Maybe some people like don't even know that it goes to EWC. Do people even know what EWC is? It's just like a, and obviously like people that are like us who are really involved, we know these things, but yeah, maybe people just don't have any clue outside of the, the professional sphere about mm. basic league. And so maybe it's not appealing to the casuals at all, even if they didn't know about it. I think it's like, it's multifaceted here because I know that face it reached out to content creators ages ago and did lots of like little demos with content creators and stuff like that, giving them the slide deck, basically being like, here's the system that we're trying to put out. And it's really important that you promote this system because this system, you'll be able to compete in it. People will watch it, but it requires people in it in order to work. You know, it's a pay to participate uh, system. So like, if you get people to participate in it, you too will win, you know, like we will all win together if it, if it actually kicks off. And I thought that the, the slide deck overall, like the pitch that they gave first to content creators and then later to every single OWCS team, like we got to sit down one-on-one and talk to one of the face of people about this. I think what they pitched was really good. But at the end of the day, when it came to the actual product launch, they gave people like nothing to go on, you know, like the day that they announced the product, I didn't even know that they'd done it, you know, like they could have been pinging every person that they gave that pitch to being like, here's the announcement. This is what you should be gassing, you know, because if you get more people involved in this today, 
then you're going to be the beneficiary, right? This is going to contribute to your prize pools. It's going to get bigger over time if you do it. Like they, they really could have sold it in a way that got everyone trying to promote it in order to benefit themselves. But instead, they gave us this little like pitch and the slide deck and they gave us all the information that we wanted. And then when it came the day of release and to actually get people mobilized into the tournaments, they didn't tell us anything. You know, it's like they forgot the most important step. So I think that that was a big issue, but that's not the only problem because I think that it's also just not a very compelling product for, um, for people in Overwatch. Um, like every level or just like casual level? Uh, it, every, every level to an extent. I think for pros, it's appealing, right? Playing another tournament. We need those, you know? So that's fine. But I think this whole like multi-tiered system where you can compete three different brackets, while it sounds good at face value, it doesn't match up with Overwatch very well because Overwatch ranked is really, really good. Like we were talking about this a little bit in the pre-show, but games where Face It is really successful. Like if I think Face It, I immediately think Counter-Strike, yeah? yeah? Because it's like CS, anyone who has a fucking clue is playing Face It, not Ranked. But the problem with Ranked in CS is that everyone is a hacker, you know? Games that have good Ranked systems don't require Face It. Because at the end of the day, if you want to play and practice, you can just queue up for Ranked instead. But the thing with Overwatch is that our Ranked system is good enough that you can just play. You, you can just queue and actually play the game and get reasonable practice. Whereas in CS, if you queue, you just get shit on by some hacker and you're free to play title. So you need a system like Face It. And if you're already using a system like Face It, you're naturally going to get pushed into the tournaments that they plug and stuff like that because you're loading the website every day. They're going to bombard you with advertisements for the product and you're naturally going to fall into it. But for Overwatch, I launched the Overwatch client. I don't see anything about the new Face It League. I just click play ranked. Yeah, I and yeah, we did again. We talked about this um, before the recording started, and my response to that was like, it's it's not a ranked replacement. It's actually a tournament system. So like, I think um, some people out there probably don't even know what it is. They think maybe it is ranked replacement. They think it is a tournament. Where we agree is like, because Overwatch players and the community in general is not used to using a Facebook platform because they've never had to in the past um, for anything. It's like a completely new thing, and it's like not been integrated into the competitive sphere of Overwatch at all. So like very few people are aware of i think face it in general but like you would you would imagine that a tournament system should be pretty welcome because it seems like and maybe this is just again the vocal people because the vast majority <coughs> of people just don't say anything but the vocal people are like where's the tournament system where where's the in-game tournaments valorant's got in-game tournaments now where's our in-game tournaments right and to me this actually is replaces in-game tournaments if this this is supposed to exist such that in-game tournaments maybe don't need to exist but i also think basically can't take off without some serious push from you know at minimum OWCS but beyond that because ideally they would get similar numbers to OWCS and they're not even getting there on the, in the impressions if you look at impression wise the announcement for the face it league something like 30,000 impressions and the tweet for OWCS stage 2 signups in AEMEA is like 120,000 like at 4x um so it's just pure eyeball wise, it's not even reaching the same number of eyeballs, and it's not even it, you, this before you even touch on the subscription fee or anything like that. So, it's I I think if Blizzard actually did an in-game tournament system, it would actually be pretty popular. But the difference is, it's in-game and it's Blizzard; they've done it. It's just there, and everyone can just do it. It's probably going to be free. There's just no one knows about this, and people are very confused about Face It. That'd be my take. Yeah, I really think that the content creators have failed. To be honest, though, like content creators got the brief. Even pro teams have failed. Like I, I myself have failed. Um, in the sense that we all got this brief about what it was going to be and how we should promote it, but then nobody promoted it, really. And I think ultimately, yeah, I mean, ultimately that falls to face it to I some did. extent because I feel like it's been pretty poorly communicated to everybody. Like they could have just been, they got us all in the Discord, you know, and they were like, yeah, we're going to give you free entry to the tournament too. Okay, if, it's like they should have if, bothered us. If, if, if it's up to the players and the community to solve this, I don't think it's enough. This is another one of the situations where unless Blizzard makes a move like, hey, go here to play tournaments, I just don't think it's enough. Like you could there's not enough they need unless you get like massacre there, unless you can get like flats and emong to fucking promote this, like you and I and the players, there's what is what is what are our popular players right now? Like we don't have hugely popular players, unfortunately. Like none of our other players at OWCS have giant followings, unfortunately. Like we don't have XUC, no super spaces like He's ringing in scrims. We're not really competing. Um, is Dante the biggest community guy we have? Is that it? So like, it's pretty limited. I I, I think it's, there's not much we can do as a community to to promote this because we just not we're not big enough. Uh, I mean, I think they're not big enough to promote it, but they're also not promoting it, right? Like, it, the little community that they have, like, they're still not 
mobilizing them to sign up for these tournaments. Yeah. My feeling is still enjoy it. You know, if people play it, I really, really think that the idea is like sound, that like casual players will really enjoy the experience. And I think the like the repeat custom might be more significant, but it feels like if it doesn't ever reach that big number at the start, then the business model itself will fall flat and then it's just gonna die within six months. That will happen as well. But people who did sign up that first time will also have probably a worse experience because it's just a smaller number of teams as well. So you end up being yeah. like, now well, your chance to get repeat signups has actually decreased because you've sort of blown the first one as well. What you need is like, oh, there's like two angles. I was going to say like you you need, despite the signups for the first event to look really good to present. Well, here's the other problem. There's no broadcast, by the way, and which by the way, does cost money. I understand why there's no broadcast because you they don't have to fucking pay for it. And so it's this already feels like a thing that only exists because they're already supplying a price when they need subscriptions to keep it going. Otherwise it might die. Um, it needs to look cool and, and be appealing uh, and for people to have more eyeballs on it. So the first season needs to be really fucking good. And then maybe everyone who missed out be like, oh, I missed out on this thing. I should get into it. Um, I bet most people don't know there's like a LAN for, there's like a LAN event for every single season. There's three seasons this year. First LAN event is EWC. The next two are not going to be as big as EWC, obviously, but they're still going to be big for people that make it through. But then there's the other thing where, you know, like Chris was saying, there's a multiple tiers which should appeal and should be good for lower rank players or lower tier players who are not going to be fighting for the ewc slots um and you know part of the open system for owcs is like this is especially a problem in korea even though korea is not going to be part of this face it system because they're under wdg but they have don't have a lot of silence for owcs in korea because they know there's no point because they're not good enough to compete with the actual good korean players and teams so they just don't have a lot of signups the whole open thing in korea is not like not a huge uh draw and I think casual players, even even in NAEMEA, I don't know, you're basically going through open div versus a bunch of like super good teams that are probably going to be better than you. And basically it's supposed to solve the problem where you get matched against similar skilled teams in your own skilled tier, which should be a good thing, but you know, they need to sign up. And they're not signing up. Yeah. Maybe it all comes back to what Gumba said, where I think it was Gumba, wait, it just feels like the the Overwatch player base is just like fundamentally a casual one and the difference between the culture of overwatch and the culture of cs is that cs everybody loves the idea of competing because playing that game casually is so fucking horrendous um whereas no matter how hard we try the overwatch community is always going to be kind of like quick play like certain heroes love the law behind the heroes and they don't necessarily see the game like as like competitively appealing um and then there might just be a situation where unless there's like a real way to shift that then no matter well, what we do we're kind of we're kind of well i would the only argument i would have for that is like if they did hypothetically put an in-game tournament system in how popular would it be and if that still fails yeah, that would be, then yeah. then you're 100 percent correct but i have a funny feeling that people would give it a go i don't know if they'd latch on but it, i mean it would be free so there is that. Maybe I don't know. To me, most people just don't know about it. I don't think it's been pushed enough to the casuals yet to like defend it. You're probably right, but I am saying like we haven't like actually experimented on that yet. So we could arrive at your conclusion that you made, and it would just take a bit more time. But at least we like know for sure, and at least we'd have tried properly. But this just feels like it hasn't even reached enough eyeballs yet. Mm-hmm. I'm really curious about like because there's data for all of the OWCS signups, right, for each of the regions. I'm really curious as to how that compares to just just open div signups from like previous years historically, you know? Because open div's been around for the longest of times and anyone can compete in that for free, you know? Like I think many people in the competitive scene have competed in open div at some point, unless they're like really old and they predated that system. And I, I am wondering like, how is OWCS right now with like all of its open opportunity and whatnot? How's that competing with like old open div? Because yeah, well, the, the signups yeah. between stage one and stage two, we lost like over 25% of the people that signed up for like OWCS stage one. I think it was only like 259 stage two. Because the thing thing about this new system and the fact that, you know, the best teams are all in it, it just takes away any belief that you can ever win as someone that isn't the best in the entire world, you know? Like there's no tiered rewards. by By merging like three different tiers of competition into one, you actually take away all opportunity for tiers two and three to even exist, you know? Like, Face it, league is filling that gap in a big way. But if the only way to be tier two and three is to play in a pay-to-play league that is being like very poorly promoted, like under-promoted, 
I mean, it's it's actually really difficult to drive up that engagement, you know, because Open Div was like Blizzard sanctioned, you know, like they could promote it in lots of different ways. They could promote it through the game. They would promote it through blog posts, you know, they would talk about it really openly. But face it is not Blizzard, right? So they're probably going to promote stuff like this less than how Blizzard would have promoted their own product. Yeah. So I think I think it's kind of, I don't want to say doomed to fail. I don't want to just be the perma doomer all the time. But I do think that like, with something like this, like there's many factors that are going to make it less popular than something like Open Div. Um, I don't think Open Div was pushed that hard, by the way. I, I don't remember there being that much like marketing or or Blizzard sort of push behind I, it. I like, just you, think you, it's, you, it's, it's it's all just in relative terms, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, sure, sure. I, I don't disagree with you generally, but like I, 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 the other thing is like is winning like the most important thing for like the casual team. So because part of what it's supposed to get into is like maybe an open system is just to allow people to play in something. Um, and then face it's probably a better version of that. Face it league is a better version of that where you get better matches instead of just you know you don't want to be little Timmy's fighting up up against SSG and the Swiss. You know that's a bit rough. But um, at face it league where you get different skill tiers. Like what it's supposed to do is be like a club sport thing where you know it's pretty normal if you play baseball, pickleball. I don't know, but some sport, some actual traditional sport, and you want to join a club for it. You're probably going to have to pay money. You get weekly games. It's just a thing that you play in and compete in, and that's supposed to emulate. That's for yeah. Overwatch. So, yeah. When I played in the football club thing, I didn't fucking care about winning it. It was just like having like good games, which were relatively close, you know? And then every now and then you get like a rival, like one of the teams that you don't like for whatever reason. And that was it. Like, there was never, like, that was purely satisfying enough to keep me going back every four times a week or whatever I ended up being. Um, and for me, yeah, that's. That's why. That's why I really think. I think if players got into that, I think that's actually quite a satisfying product. Playing with a team, having close games, whatever, trying to do better than last. But, season, t- but tears help that, right? Because if you say no WCS, like, 100%. oh well, we're never going to win. In SSG, are probably going to win, right? Probably not us. Just five guys from Ramba Ramba Bend. But if we can fight for promotion or fight for top three, you know, like to be fair, when I when I speak to people in private coaching who are like teams who are like competing in OWCS but are never getting to like even the top cut or something there. What they often talk about is like, Oh, we went five. We went like four and six last time or four and five last time. Can we get out to five and four or six and six and three or whatever it is, you know, they're just fighting for like that. But I can also see how like they're really having to try to like <laughs> apply a we're improving type thing to like, okay, is the score getting better or something? Whereas something which is a lot more tiered in divisions and promotion relegation, I think probably feels like way more engaging, way more exciting for, for the people interested in the actual numbers as well, conveniently, while we're recording this, the deadline for Qualifier 2 is today. So Facet have just added everyone in the Discord. So the numbers for EMEA right now, 21 teams. And the numbers for Oof. North America, obviously, they've got a little... The deadline is today, but obviously a little bit later because of time zones. But they're only on 13 teams. One for a 13? Yeah. And this has got direct... I don't think you're going to get four divisions out of 15. This is the right qualification to EWC and you're not getting signups. Like, I don't know. It, it feels like there should be more players or maybe the EWC thing is like every every top 500 players like, well, if I'm not Toronto Defiant, I should <laughs> probably shouldn't even bother. Bro, how many but, teams are supposed to be in the in the tier one? In the Masters division or whatever it's called? It's 16. Yeah, no, 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 no. they have filled because eight of them are directly invited. There's direct invites. Yeah, we oh, yeah, true. Yeah. So we don't, we don't I need hope, top I hope eight we're not included because we haven't registered yet. But uh, so the, your, the your one tier one division is going to be five eight teams. Eight or <laughs> top eight or six teams invited. But like, you guys are aware, like, there's, there's this console gaming league and BPL. There's all these like community amateur leagues out there that are doing a similar thing in discords, right? They've just existed for so long. Like, in an ideal world, all of those guys, they don't have to leave the BPL the communities or whatever. But I, in an ideal world, they play in Face It League alongside BPL or maybe instead of BPL. Um, I don't know if they don't know about it, or I don't know if like the the six dollar, seven dollar entry fee is just that too too high of a bar. Um, or maybe people just used to what they've already got. The, people are used to their Discord leagues already, so they can't be bothered going to something else. But like, I, I think the base interest does exist somewhere for free. Obviously, um, it's just about transferring those guys over. And, and by the way, console gamingly, they also support PC, so it's not a console only thing. But for those guys in their own little organized Discord groups. Which might actually be pretty sized. I think BPL actually get a reasonable number of teams. You know, those guys could be playing face it instead or alongside. I guess the problem is as well, and there's like an availability. Once you get to like this level of team, obviously everyone is like a hobbyist essentially. Like they're doing it in their spare time, after work, after school, or whatever. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's not like when you maybe you talk to like a team peps or something and they're like, oh, we're actually just, we're locking in like we're full time, even though no one's getting paid. So then a lot more, if you say, oh, we've not got just got one match official for BPL. We've then got another, we got a weekend of officials. We've got all of this. Like, oh, have they, have these, does the average person in the situation actually have four or five nights free a week to lock True. in for an official? Like multiple leagues become like a big problem. Yeah. I, I yeah, I also think uh there's like actually the the actual number of face it for face it league season one has in the year past 69 registered. The one you're referencing is like the qualifier for masters division. So actually, like they're two different things. Um I think that. This one, the one that only has 19 teams, to be fair, this is only going to be won by people who think that they can get into like EWC. Whereas like the actual face at league season one, which is what all of the like gold players and stuff would do, has it still has 20 more days and already has 69 teams. Okay. So I guess that's like slightly better, but presumably it's still nowhere near the number that they would be hoping to reach. Yeah, I guess because yeah. The interpretation of the wording when they announced this was that the prize pool might only be for this first tournament. So if this is like... And then from here on, it will just be self-sustaining, you know what I mean? However many people sign up will dictate the size of a prize pool, etc. But then if this is like the big one with the most money available to encourage everyone, it still doesn't feel like the big one. At like 70 teams or something, you know? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's 170 k per season split across four regions. So they're doing it that 170k times three this year. And then obviously when you go to EWC, there's an even bigger price pool there. So I mean that's a that's a that's a good price pool. I mean, price pool alone should be pretty attractive. Like I don't know. It's to me, it just comes down to a marketing issue. I just don't think they've got it into in front of enough people's faces. Yeah, I think with all of these things, like there is like a barrier for entry in terms of you need to know five people, you need to have like be willing to pay the subscription fee and all of this. So you just need to try and hit as many people as possible. Like, um, if you can get 200 signups in EMEA for OWCS, can you not get, like, you know, half of that, 30% of that for Face It League? Like, is is the price barrier that is what's holding people back, or do they just not know about I it? Guess you know it, I mean? it must be. Yeah, you would hope that the way this would actually, like, encourage more casual players and take them away from OWCS, but... Yeah, the other thing is, is like, you know, once you've played o- o- OWCS and you get eliminated, you play through your Open, you play through your Swiss, whatever, you're done... Are you really waiting till next stage to play again? Like, yeah, exactly. This one of those guys few games a week. Wouldn't this one of those guys want to play more? Like, I don't know. I it's just true. think it's so yeah. weird that an o- OWC you get two hundred plus signups and then face it, you get twenty signups. Like the numbers don't make any fucking sense. So either the six dollar, seven dollar barrier is that fucking much that you know only a tenth of people actually want to go there, or they just don't fucking know. Like, how many of those two hundred plus teams know there's a face at league that is this genuine question? Right? It's hard to yeah. know. Yeah. Well, I do always get the impression sometimes, especially like um, like when I read the competitive Overwatch subreddit, I'm always surprised by just the numerous questions that are just like, what's going on with this? Where is this? What is this? And it just feels like there's like still seemingly a disconnect. Like I can't read some of those posts and think, oh, these guys are surely just fucking clients. Just go on Liquipedia. But Most even of them Liquipedia, don't know Liquipedia. Yeah, that's what I mean. There seems to be, there does seem to actually be this divide of like, even and because even to get to the competitive Overwatch subreddit, you've already had to go through like a series of barriers to entry to get to that point, right? Correct. Um, past the just the general subreddit. So the fact that even presumably the more informed people who have made it to the competitive Overwatch Reddit are more informed about this sort of thing, don't even know either or don't even still struggling with OWCS. It just seems like the whole thing's just not really I mean not really pushed. I asked my Twitch chat, and I, I would imagine anyone that comes to watch me and probably you by extension X is like, they're probably of the more hardcore variety. Like, I don't know, most casual players are probably not interested in anything I do, especially because I'm just doing like OWCS stuff. And there's a number of people in my chat that just either didn't know what basically was or like had a lot of like uninformed knowledge about it. Like they didn't really understand it, even if they knew it existed. They're just like, what is this thing? Like, I don't really know what it does, even though I've heard of it. Um. Yeah, that's it's just insane. Like, I, I, I just, I still believe it's a marketing problem for now. Like, I just think if they if they got it in front of way more people, you'd definitely get a lot more signups minimum, and then you could start talking about like, okay, is the subscription fee the real barrier or not? You wouldn't want this to fail. Like it, it like Chris said, that it would really suck if this for failed sure. Sure. because this is a really good initiative that to me is like 
almost like I think this is basically one hundred percent EF face at EFG, right? This is like zero percent Blizzard, basically, as far as I can tell. And so, if this venture fails for face it, then I don't know that they're gonna commit to this again. Like, and that that would be really fucking bad for the community because we just lose out on an event that otherwise could have been super good. Like, you know, another another tournament, another LAN event, regular games, qualification to EWC. Like, maybe maybe we'll still get qualification to EWC in the future for through other ways, but. Um, you know, more opportunities the better for different things to compete in. And if if this year doesn't go off well for Face It League, then who knows what will happen? And that'll be really bad for the for the scene. Yeah, they'll either just cut it completely, or it will just be a your prize pool is just X percentage of whatever people signed up. So if twenty fifty teams are signing up, then it's only going to be like nothing essentially. You're competing for nothing. Um. So I don't know. She'll basically be dead. I mean, that'll just basically be dead as yeah. well. So it'll be dead or dead, really. Is the answer, <laughs> I think. We can have two good options. <laughs> but yeah, so I guess the conclusion of this, go sign up for Face It League. Please. Please. Um, are you saying there's no broadcast for it at all? Like, it just exists in this world. Not that I'm aware of. I'm not that I'm aware of. I don't. I'm pretty sure there is zero broadcast until. I heard that they might do it for playoffs, but like the regular group stages, there's definitely no. Like they encourage everyone to stream it, kind of like the Swiss system, you know. I would have to double check that. Based on what I heard, there's no broadcast at all. But I, I yeah. I'm not 100 percent on that, and maybe I could be wrong. But that's just what yeah, I, same, I'm aware of. Same. Um, but so even with the broadcast, um, yeah, the broadcast is what comes later. And there's not enough signups yet. And I don't think the lack of a broadcast, I don't think the lack of a broadcast is what is preventing the signups. I don't think anyone's looking at this being like, oh, there's no broadcast. I'm not signing up. So. Fuck it. I'm not (laughs) playing in the gold league. But to be fair, like some of the BPO is all these games are streamed, right? And they are casted. So there is an element of like, I'm not, I'm not saying people are signing up because they get to be on fucking TV, but it promotes itself, right? If you are streaming it and there is a, something to go and watch people will then yeah. see that and then it it ends up promoting itself right so in theory you do want some form of broadcast on at least part of this tournament to promote it for well, well for the thing is it's tournaments and future easy with bpl because they can they're all just no one's going to pay they're all volunteering to do it for themselves but no one no one's going to volunteer i you don't you don't think they would no one i can imagine no one would want to just volunteer and do free broadcasts for Face it, league. Unless they were super fucking bored and they just like they they really wanted to do something because they were very interested and they just wanted to donate their time. Um, yep. But even the BPL broadcast, they're not getting huge views. Like we're talking like two figures worth of views for BPL, right? Um, but maybe the draw is like you get to play in this thing that seems well run. The broadcast is slick, and even though there's not a lot of people watching, you get to be on this broadcast even for like you know fifty people. Maybe that's still appealing enough. So, yeah. I think there's a market for people to play and organize games in like these ranked leagues, but they just they're already in them in these different Discord communities. And either they know about Face League and they don't want to play it in it, or they don't know about Face League at all. One thing that never has problems with interest or signups is actually the quiz. So if we could if we could somehow com- I'm actually not very interested. I might leave at the moment. I'm not interested. <laughs> Blasphemy. Oh, if we could convert at least like two percent of the quiz head base into face it league signups i think we'd we'd save it all right this week's quiz we're gonna do it different we're gonna try to name every single caster from seasons one to three of the broadcast okay so i was originally gonna do all six seasons but that was like i was gonna take forever and um, I'm not allowing hosts and I'm not allowing interviewers and I'm not allowing analysts. So that means Golden Boy, Puckett, Malik, Stevie. Did you remember someone called Stevie? I remember Stevie. Stevie. She hosted Stevie. for... Oh, CB? Oh, CB? No, no, Stevie, what you were saying. Stevie, the, the um, British girl who does Counter-Strike? No, she was a stage host. I think it's female. Oh, so, sure. she, there's a, so in 2020, I believe... Zoe had to leave for Switzerland for a little bit, and so they got a, a replacement host in to cover for Zoe, and that was Stevie. No, it's D S T E E B Y. This was season one of Orging. This is not part of the quiz, so it doesn't really oh, okay. matter. Um, so we're not, we're not allowed Zoe. We're not allowed crumbs. We're not allowed reinforced. Sorry, I did see reinforced on Twitter. They've taken my quiz idea and <laughs> posting it on Twitter. So 
careful reinforce. I'm, I'm looking at you, the establishment trying to take the quiz from me. It's all I've got. Oh, I've got a quiz. Um, oh, no, well, I don't know Danny who this is. Erin like Stevie. Oh, okay. Like... No, I, I forgot about Erin Stevie. Though we Stevie. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, no hosts, no analysts, only people who actively, actively commented at one point. Between or season one and on six? Seasons one through three. One through three. One and three. three. So, only the first three. You are on this list, Avril. I, I did do a game. I did do a couple games of season three, cool. correct? So we'll get that out of the way fast. Yeah, Someone can. Okay. That's, so a, that's goes a fucking first, free answer. I just pick myself. That's fine. Uh, we'll just get it out of the way, shall we? Yeah. All right. X. We can probably go the first few rounds. We can go quickly until we get stuck. Uh, my mate Sideshow. Yeah. You're super muted. No, still. Monty. Yeah. <laughs> Easy, okay. Avril? So, uh... Yeah. Here we go, me next. Um, Anta's favourite man, 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 man of the world, Hex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he actually did make it. Um, Mr. X. Oh, oh hang on. Oh, no, no, yeah, no, I'm correct. So what did you say, Anta? Mr. X. Similar. No comment. Uber shouts. Yeah. Jeez, we're running out already. No way. We have like fucking 20 to no, go. No, I mean like we're running out in my head. I'm, I have like a <laughs> oh my god, I, Mine's scared. looking kind of slim actually, honestly. No fucking yeah. way. Oh my god. It was Monty, Doa, Sim. Was it was similar and Hex together? Like who, who the fuck? They were together. Yeah, they were together. Yeah. And then team. you said side chairs. So I guess we got Bren. Like Bren must have yeah. been in there somewhere. Bren was in there. Achilles. Yeah. That's that. Oh, Jesus. oh uh, Wolf then. Yeah. yeah. The duo, the duo, like. The duo is, is like, if someone gets so the first strong. of the duo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, as soon as you say Wolf is like a, a freebie. So um, I think we're actually, yeah, we've actually say, nailed seasons one and two. We're already through. Did you say how many have seasons have? are we That's going up hit. to? Season three, three only now? Yeah. Season three. So that was like an online so season. Have... So maybe like, I don't think Leg Day had made it yet then, but maybe he got an appearance. Lemon kiwi no made it before day. leg day. Lemon kiwi, yeah. No lemon kiwi. Really? Does that mean, does that mean Max is eliminated or is he still gone? No, he's, he's, no, he's, he's getting just gets no points. Just, he's, he's this high. guy hasn't oh, okay. watched the quiz once. Fucking unbelievable. Fucking what? what? The establishment never watches mm. the quiz. They I just watch. I just don't remember. The, I don't remember all the rules. I, who, who remembers all the quiz rules? You're not really watching if you're not remembering the you rules. You should run an esports <laughs> organization. <laughs> you should give competitive rulings. Yeah, I'll tell you which Korean plays are allowed. <laughs> so, so it's me, so it's me next. It's me next, Jules. Yeah, yeah good chance. Um, so it's got to be like. I think we have is, three is it, left. I want to say, Kustaven. Uh, Too soon, so maybe. He was an analyst, so he never casted in seasons one through three. So can I name all three? Read the rules. You knew that wasn't allowed. Can I name all three? Sweep it instantly. Well, I, I've got, I, one more. Keep, I've got one let's more. Let's keep going. Let's, let's just keep going then. Um, ZP. Yeah. Fuck. Okay. Uh, that I was, was free, that one. dude. Fendi. Oh, jeez. That was this really was free. Is it Jake? Yes. Jake was on there season three. He casted with ZP, I think. They, they were, were duo. Yeah. It's the duo power. Okay. I have the last one. This, the last one one's left. nuclear. But Max, give it a go anyway. Just walk all over me, bro. Like, take it. <laughs> it's yours. Well, you know that I cast it, so who the fuck did I cast with? Pixie. Oh my god, yeah. Pixie oh. was on the fucking Pixie went on the broadcast was, with you, didn't he? It was Jeez, it was it was it yeah. was there. I mean, dude, I, I was the first person <laughs> named. No one guessed who I cast it with. I forgot it was the I, thought, I legit <laughs> forgot yeah. I forgot it was you and him. And I just, he had I just to did it alone. I just did it solo. <laughs> he had to say that stuff about gypsies on Reddit and just <laughs> throw it all away. <laughs> like <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, so I think Avril was one of the most dominant quiz performances we've ever seen in the history. Got of a quiz show. head here, like a real. Yeah, Should have done all six seasons for fun. Yeah, I thought it would take oh, okay. too long, but that maybe like your definition of fun. Right, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> now, after the absolute disaster we had last week, trying to guess European teams that were winning while we were all in Overwatch League, like, not watching <laughs> Europe, was like. Before I forget, actually, we should also mention Chris actually forgot one of the teams last week. Who do you forget? Nah. Um, hold on, let me get my DMs. It was Magic Magic you Maple. Know, magic Maple right. informed me. Um, maple. Let's see. 
Who you forgot Munich Esports. Esports. Come on, Chris. Nah, I was on Lickopedia. So, so they're they're online. Online. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the quiz is never fully accurate. I mean, people know that. Like, that's just what you that's what you sign up for. All right. Anyone got any clients? Um, it's got to be Capitology, bro. Come on. What? That tweet, Wait, that what, is what about absolute uh, nuclear client of the week behavior. What about X Oblivion? Yeah, I was actually thinking of, uh, I had a few. There was one, so there was one of the owners or something of X Oblivion's wife was on like an unbelievable warpath on Twitter, leaking DMs and retweeting everything possible with some like crazy tweets about how it was like a conspiracy, really adding to like the pr professional vibe of Ex Oblivion. Uh, like everything that was like, this is like a propaganda, blah, 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 blah tweeting it like some like insane memes if you scroll down, like I'll post some of the, like the memes like this she was posting i thought this was like this was a class a class meme um and there was loads of them just like at and everybody it was like real like brilliant like unhinged, unhinged behavior like just like every 30 minutes a different meme about the situation it was like oh it was like i was really really enjoying it um so i thought yeah this person could be kind of the week i got one um technology. go on the uh the face it intern who just lied to tm that, that, which started, yeah, I mean, it, which started everything. <laughs> it's, it's, I remember I had a question about CoStream, so I opened a support ticket with Blizzard. I get the same the same uh, admin fella who's in question here. He answers my question, and I had, you know what Chris was talking about, you know, he can just tell somebody, doesn't actually really comprehend what you're saying. So I immediately went, cheers, pal, no worries. Opened another support ticket, got a different person, got my man Trev, and Trev sorted it out for me. But yeah. But I, I have one more client of the week that I wanted to to mention if you if you if you're ready for it. Locked in. So I think Commander X deserves client of the week again. <laughs> what did he this time? So if you go to the Gumba episode, okay. Oh, there, right. there was yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. a significant. <laughs> that's fair, deal. actually. That's really fair. But I'm not giving him client of the week for it. I want to show what he put in the description of the video. Had some audio issues with my mic. Might still be noticeable <laughs> in some places. Like this wasn't fucking the most noticeable thing in human history. So I thought this was like an ex oblivion way of uh, <laughs> dancing around the issue. Well, no, I had to power I had through to, that episode, to be honest with you. I hadn't watched was, it. Uh... <laughs> I just got sent a couple of clips from Alpha and I was like, oh, this doesn't seem that bad. But maybe I didn't watch the whole thing. It would still be noticeable. <laughs> I think it was fucking noticeable. <laughs> But I'm happy to give it to Capitology. I think he's really been trying to earn it. And I think that if he keeps it up, he's got a chan chance to become the two-time, the three-time, whatever he wants, you know? So No complaints but, you know. for me? All good. Yeah, it was a pretty competitive right. one this week, actually. There was a lot of strong entries. It was. There was quite a few clients. Yeah, a lot of client in. Is it good or bad that there's an increase in, in, in clients? Just, I think... What just, is it? It's like the weather, you know, it like oh, it varies. Depends how long it between just between the season. Episodes. Just the season. given enough time, they're just gonna. They're gonna I think it's like up. an indication of the people willing to stick around in Overwatch. You know, like that's that's what we've got. Here, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> if you're like lacking critical thinking ability, like overall perspective, it's like here you are in Overwatch. You know, that's that's what's going on here. All right, then. All right. Time to rank for guests. Let's give a leaderboard up. Nobody so... won playing of the week, right? Like it's just a bunch of people, like. I think Capitology, Capitology won. Capitology won it. Oh, okay. Brilliant. You wouldn't understand, Hunter, but Capitology won. I don't get it. Yeah. I don't know. I was looking at like the top down and everything was like so zoomed out. I just thought everyone was on top of one another <laughs> in the rankings. But it turns out Capitology was actually like swinging wide and had like a god tear angle to win the, <laughs> win the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I think this episode is way too fucking long actually i think we've actually gone this is our longest episode by far right like this new trend we've got of like the four hour episodes we need to stop this i need to cut this shit out dude i'm not getting paid enough for this uh, how long was the episode over almost four hours right producer Perfect. you have permission to speak <laughs> <laughs> 357 if we're quick we can keep it under four hours fucking hell. So, I, don't know, I think it started at this point you gotta you gotta hit four if you're if you're this close to four we're not this close to four there was like at least 20 minutes of wanking off without the recording button being hit you know that timer is not the recorded time 
So we're not even close. We're not hitting four hours, bro. It's over. Like release us. <laughs> Rank him. <laughs> I think um, I go below Jake. That's what I think. Top t- fucking now, top now I'm gonna leave really angry. That's unfortunate. I don't put him. I don't, wouldn't put him below Jake, dude. I think he above yeah. Jake. I think he, we, yeah, absolutely. We, we put him to, above Billy. Really. I would put if him above saw, multiple people here. Yeah, I think I was thinking like maybe above Hydron between Hydron yeah. and Nine K. I think he but came with in, he, he came with lots of insights about the broadcast. He wasn't a fucking pussy about it. We covered a lot of topics. You know, it might have had you know a bunch of racist remarks thinly veiled like gumba tends to come in with you know we didn't we didn't get top <laughs> three engagement up. bait but we got quality you know and oh, quantity okay. clearly but painful amounts <laughs> of quality <laughs> we, yeah, we said at the start it's, it's either quality good. or quantity what if we did both what if we yeah, did both yeah. I'd, I'd put him at a comfortable seven okay fuck jake that. fuck jake it's insulting that you put him adjacent to jake chris just hates me now this is insane I thought the Jake episode was pretty good. I, I, when I look back, yeah, we, we put Jake <laughs> in the middle because he was always on the fence. But, you yeah. know, I'm a man of democracy, you know, so I'm happy where we are. Speaking of clickbait, is, is Korean Uncoachables 2 going to be why, why Americans are in the Overwatch League? I thought that comment on Reddit was really good. I fucking hope so. <laughs> but I feel like they don't have the balls to really go all the way. With why it, the white know? people ruined Overwatch League? Yeah, that should be their it. episode. Let's get into it. And then we'll do like a... <laughs> A debate at some point with the translate. We'll get Danny Lim on to translate for us all. We, <laughs> because it was their fault the Overwatch League died. <laughs> all right, then. Have we done right. it? We did it. We're done. Easy. Thank you very much, Avril. Thank you. Thanks okay. for having me on. Good night, Good gentlemen. Time. Good time. Don't have, you know, <sighs> don't have a cap up already, unfortunately. Dude, this is actually such a prop heavy episode. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Can't you didn't believe even you like do the Swiss gag. Like you didn't even oh, show better. your Swiss shit. No, it's better. Like just like this, you know. Like because did you sip from the mug at any point? Yeah, I would give you a few okay. cheers. It was a few cheers right, throughout good. the episode. Good. good. All right. All right. What's with right. the cheers thing in Europe, man? Like, why is everyone saying this now? We're bringing it back. But it's like they're saying cheers like it's a meme. Like cheers isn't a meme. <laughs> it is it's, a meme. it's just a thing people it say. <laughs> It's like these people are so <laughs> fucking autistic <laughs> and have never been outside before that they, they think yeah. saying cheers think is a meme. So like, go, to, go to a pub, bro. No, I'm cheers, bro. Share a beer with your friend. You will say cheers. Like, cheers to that. <laughs> cheers to that, boys. All right. Fucking. Cheers for having me on.